Welcome to Let's Play Space Quest 6, The Spinal Frontier. This is the final game in the Space Quest saga, and unfortunately not the best. Part of its problems can be blamed on problems during its development. The game's original designer, Josh Mandel, left Sierra near the end of its development due to management issues, and Scott Murphy took over. Due to a lack of communication between the two, a number of things were left out of the game, including several hints making some of the puzzles needlessly difficult. Scott even went so far as to say that the game really should have been cancelled after Josh left. It's still not a bad game, however. It has some of the funniest moments of the entire series, and we've got Gary Owens back as a narrator, which is never a bad thing. Like its predecessor, Space Quest VI has a soundtrack written for General Midi and not the Roland MT-32, so I'll once again be using my Roland Sound Canvas SC-88 to record the music. And this sound uh, soundtrack definitely needs all the help it can get, as it's easily the least memorable of the series. Okay. Let's start the game. One thing you might immediately notice is the fact that um, this game is in Super VGA 640 by 480 in uh, 256 colors. So that's four times the resolution of the previous games. More than four times even. So let us begin from, well, the beginning, I suppose, would be a good place to start. The Star Confederation has reached its decision. Roger Wilco, please step forward. Roger Wilco, you have been judged guilty of the following crimes. Abandoning your post. Deviating from mission parameters. Misuse of Starcon property. Disintegrating a fellow officer. Perpetrating a sequel without authorization. And consorting with a female of higher rank. Do you have anything to say for yourself before we pronounce sentence? Uh... Can't you guys take a joke? Do you have anything intelligent to say for yourself before we pronounce sentence? Uh... Nope. Doesn't he have a lawyer? Very well. It is the opinion of this tribunal that as punishment for your crimes against the Star Confederation, you are to be decommissioned. You are hereby stripped of the rank of captain. Hey, we worked hard for that. Well, cheated. You are no longer an officer of the Star Confederation. Your enrollment at Starcon Academy is hereby terminated. Roger, surprisingly However, buff. Oh. Due to your successful return of the SCS Eureka, your rescue of the Goliath's crew... That's not true. ...and the fact that nobody gets rid of stubborn mildew stains and black heel marks as well as you do... We are returning you to your former post with Starcon Fleet. You are hereby ordered to resume your duties immediately as janitor second class on board the SCS Deep Ship 86.
2001 reference with the uh, crossfade there. Why does the ship look like a suspender, by the way? Attention all hands. This is your commander speaking. I'd like to thank each and every one of you for your fine performance during our recent episode, A Stitch in Time Saves Gamma 9. So, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, 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 thank you. Thank you, 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 thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. As a gesture of appreciation, we're putting in for shore leave on polysorbate 60. Enjoy yourselves and don't do anything I wouldn't do. Kilbasa out. Meanwhile, in a deserted warehouse just outside the galaxy. Because where else would you put a deserted warehouse? I don't care how you do it, gentlemen, so long as his body is intact. Do you understand? Yes, we've got it. Yes, right. We've got it. Yes, right. Good. Now, I believe you'll find him here on Polysorbate 60 on a shore. Hmm. That's where we are. I wonder if that's in any way relevant. Probably not. Okay, I'm ready. Energize! Roger and transporters just don't get along, do they? As we join our hero, Roger Wilco, he has just been transported to the surface of Polysorbate 60 to enjoy a little shore leave. Apparently, there was a minor glitch in the process. Well, at least you got here with all your important parts. Your hands, your mouth, and your stomach. Oh, great. Real wonderful. Nice beam job, you metallic piece of scrap. Jeez, this is snug. Real snug. Hmm. You know, it actually makes me feel kind of good. I, I remember when I used to wear my mom's... Uh, well, never mind. Uh, no time for nostalgia. I've got a serious extraction problem to work out first. Man, I'm glad he didn't finish that anecdote. Hmm. Man, this place is a dump. Makes you wonder why uh, all the other people on the deep ship were so happy about going on shore leave here. And Roger is soundly stuck in the street, which we're obviously going to have to solve. Uh, but a couple of other things first. First of all, the graphic style. I personally... Uh, like it. I think the jump to the more cartoony style works fine for Space Quest. It didn't work for King's Quest with King's Quest 7, but for uh, Space Quest it's pretty... Uh, it's okay. It works with the, the, the humor and everything. Um, also, the quality of the drawings and the animations are actually pretty good. Way better than King's Quest 7, which is sort of ironic considering that King's Quest 7 is the game that was supposed to have Disney quality animations anyway. What I don't like is the fact that this introduction is nothing more than an excuse to undo everything that happened in Space Quest V. 
Roger is no longer a captain and is back to being a janitor. And unfortunately, his former crew members, Drool, Flo, and Cliffy, or WD-40 even, do not make any appearances in this game. Even Beatrice doesn't show up. So really, there is uh, It's just a big reset button. Did Brennan Braga write this script? Anyway. That is sort of a shame, I think. It would have been nice to see uh, what could have happened if uh, Roger had maybe been given more responsibilities as a result of his uh, heroism in the previous game. And then, of course, would have turned out to be unable to deal with it. But, unfortunately, they did not go that route. Instead, they just pretend that Space Quest 5 didn't happen, basically. Also interesting that they said that we returned the SES Re Eureka, while in fact we blew it up. They did not mention the fact that we blew up a space station, which is one of the few things they could have genuinely uh, arrested us on, I guess. And I have to take issue with the fact that they said that we were consorting with an officer of higher rank, because Beatrice is an ambassador, a civilian, not an officer. Okay, well, uh... Roger's stuck, and we'll see if we can get him out of the street in the next video. Welcome back. We have transported to the surface of Polysorbate 60, and Roger's gotten stuck in the pavement. Wow, he has a, a perfect opportunity to lick the street from here, considering that's one of his hobbies. But, uh, I don't think you can actually do that. The mouth icon here is strictly for talking. I th although there, I think there actually are a few occasions where you get a, a funny message if you try to use it on a surface or an object. You drool in that direction, but no one notices. The street, however, is not one of them. It's nice, by the way, that Sierra finally learned that people like subtitles in games sometimes. And what I don't understand uh, is why it's necessary to give up one third of the screen to uh, the UI like this. We got our basically uh, basically the same kind of uh, actions as in the previous game, except this time they're not uh, icons; they're just verbs or nouns, even. Um, <coughs> this, they're still icons if you select them. But anyway. The score is displayed here, but unfortunately we have no idea what the maximum score is. It doesn't say here either. Alright, I do want to turn scrolling on, which we'll uh, see later. Um, I don't remember what a good speed is for this game, so I'm going to leave it at this to see if it's okay, and if not, then I'll change it. Let's see if we can get out of here. Investigate our surroundings. Let's look at ourselves first. You're back in your comfy, reassuring janitorial duds. Well, at least it's not red anymore, right, Drool? Seldom have you had the good fortune to get to know a street so up close and personal. You feel you have a real bond growing. Hmm. Somebody left a bicycle here. That's an interesting piece of hardware. Your normally dim power of recollection actually recalls having seen a picture of one of these in the ship library. Get this. It's called a bike. People used to actually get on these and use their own muscles to achieve locomotion. What losers. Hey. Upon closer inspection, you notice some sort of ID card hanging on the frame. I like riding bicycles. That ID card looks interesting, but not going to help with our current predicament. Can we climb out or something? Don't touch that. We don't know where you've been. There's something wrong about that. Maybe the robots can help. Or maybe that guy over there. Let's ask him. He wisely ignores you. Yeah. He seems totally unfazed by your sorry attempt at communication. Well, that wasn't very helpful. Hmm. 
Hmm. Seems like we can't pull ourselves out. There's nothing nearby to give us any good grip. But all of these robots keep passing by, so maybe one of them can help. And actually, this one can help. It's the only one that can help you. There we go! Now we can actually do stuff. And we got ten Thank points. Thank you, my good man. Yikes, I, I hope everything came out with me. For your sake, Roger, I hope so too. Hey, that one looks familiar. It lacks a bit in the stature department, though. Weird looking robot. Ooh, flaming barrels. Always a sign you're in a nice neighborhood. Fire burns inside barrels along the streets. Apparently, those using them are residents of planets a bit closer to the suns that they orbit. The temperature seems quite moderate to you, but then you do fancy yourself a studly guy. Too bad no one else shares that opinion. Hey, what about Beatrice? Doesn't she uh, share that opinion? I don't know. You'd think, if indeed you did, that a guy with the skin quality of a pachyderm wouldn't have a problem with this climate. Apparently, he does. This guy looks like a vertically challenged Darth Vader. What does a thing like that do for fun? That's a robot. Do robots have fun? I don't think so. I think they usually just work. Just, uh... Ask uh, Daft Punk. There's a cinema here, and playing is Gumby versus Mr. Bill. Rats! The cinema appears to be closed. You were really hoping to see Tango and Cash 27. You can actually hear that Gary Owens was cracking up saying the 27. I wonder how many takes he had to do on that. Actually, every time you come on the screen, there's a different uh, name on the uh, sign here. You can't actually go into the cinema, but still, fun thing. Well, we noticed an ID card on the uh, bicycle before, and ID cards are always useful in games, for whatever reason. Upon grabbing the ID card, you notice the picture on it is of a rather homely looking alien type. Yes, everyone can't be as fortunate as you. Let's take a look. At our inventory, we have uh, the security card we just got. It's the alien ID you snagged from that rusty bike. That's a fairly hideous picture of the former owner. It makes the average Department of Motor Vehicles photographer look like Ansel Adams. Ah, uh, making fun of the DMV. Always fun. We have apparently one Buckazoid. That's not an awful lot. That's your current Buckazoid collection. And a dustpan. Uh, indispensable tool for janitors on shore leave, I guess. It's your trusty whisk broom and dustpan. Well, now we know what we have with us. There's a liquor store. Boot liquor appears to be open for business. Get it? Boot liquor? Okay. Um. We're on the corner of Oak and Rush. Bearing signs indicating the names of the streets which create this intersection, a light pole illuminates the area. What a mistake that is. Like anyone would want to see more of this place. Yeah, it's, uh... kind of... a dump. Like we said before, why was the rest of the crew so happy about going on shore leave here? Maybe they went to a different part of the planet. Boot liquor appears to be... Oh, we already saw that. The street seems to reflect the same care and sense of community pride that the rest of the area enjoys. Quite so. The buildings around here have seen much better days. This must be the old part of town. If it isn't, you'd hate to see what is. Okay, well, I think we've spent enough time lounging about on this screen. Let's, uh... Move elsewhere. Hmm, let's see, we have what looks like uh, 
An inn? Called the Dew Beam Inn? Again with the puns. And they have a vacancy, which is nice if we need to stay anywhere. Also, there are some toxic waste containers here, which is less nice. You wonder if there could be any connection between this kind of waste disposal and a thriving business like implants and stuff. Wow, that's kind of deep for you. Indeed. Now there's an interesting sounding business name. You wonder what they sell. I'm going to guess they sell implants and, you know, stuff. It's the Dew Beam Inn, but I'm sure they accept pedestrians also. The door hinges aren't exactly overheated from a steady flow of eager patrons. And she's an interesting looking woman. Interesting. She appears to be waiting for someone. She might be one of those professional ladies your mom told you about. Can we talk to her? She says, scrump off, you little felchmonger. What, couldn't you find anyone who could actually voice her? Let's go into uh, the inn. After all, we might need a place to stay during our short leave here. Wow, this place is a dive. That's an interesting way of moving oneself. Well, we'll see if we can get ourselves a room here in the next video. Welcome back. We are in the Dew Beam Inn. And I guess we should see if we can get a room here. Oh, these two guys are trying really hard not to be conspicuous. Those are some interesting looking dudes. Must be a couple of real losers since they seem to be dateless. Of course, that won't be a problem for you once word gets around that you've hit the planet. Can you believe he actually thinks that? Man, Roger's delusional. Just stick to Beatrice, okay? These plans aren't looking so good. At some time in a life that might have existed eons ago, these ghosts of Flora past might have been called plants. Ah, oh, this place still has those old-style ray projection infomercial viewers. What rubes. There's some stuff peeling off nice here. Nice place, if you're a fan of dives. That's the manager of this little slice of heaven. He looks like he's an expert on energy conservation. Mainly his. Indeed. Can we talk to these two guys? You get a jump on senility by mumbling to yourself. No, I was trying to talk to this guy. Your utterances fall on uninterested oral organs. I guess he's not interested. Don't pick at it. You'll only make it worse. Oh, okay. I just wanted to see if we could do anything with the corner there. Well, let's talk to the manager. He seems to be ignoring you. But I want a room. Uh, excuse me. I'd like a room, please. Really? I mean, uh, <clears throat> really? Well, uh, I think we've got one or two for a couple of hundred buckazoids a night. In advance, you understand. I believe I have a prepaid reservation provided me by Starcon. I got no reservations from any Starcon. I got no reservations, period. I do a cash business. You want a room, cough up the buckazoids. So that's, um, 200. Well, okay. 200? Don't you listen, son? I said 300. That's 300 a night. 
And I don't include any weird pets. Them's extra. I could have sworn you said... You calling me a liar? I don't need no guff from the likes of you. This is the finest lodging on the planet, son. If you don't like the prices, you can just take your sorry pinkish carcass out of here. Well, uh, 300? Okay, uh, but give me your finest room then. The finest room? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> you got it, buckaroo. Best in the house. <laughs> Coming right up. Pay up, and we're in business. Unfortunately, we are 299 buckazoids short. So we want a room here, we're gonna have to find a way to make some money. And quick. Also, he actually said a couple hundred, not 200, so... He was not actually lying when he changed the price to 300. The desk, while mimicking some control console look, serves as not much more than a place for the desk clerk to rest his heavily bunioned hind feet. Indeed. Oh well, not much we can do here until we have the money, so let's mosey on out. Hey, that wasn't there before. It's one of those new Kodrak mobile photo booths. I heard they were beta testing those. A mobile photo booth. That's convenient, because then you'll never know where to find one. Well, uh, it'd be kind of nice to have some pictures. I guess. So let's uh, take some. Hey. This guy is talking to the... the prostitute. Hmm. Those two look like people my mom warned me about. I think I should avoid them. Probably her pimp or something. Or maybe a customer. I don't know. Talk to him? Let's not. And say we did. Works for me. Let's take some pictures. As long as it's no, not more expensive than one buckazoid? It's unmoved by your touch. Oh. Um, maybe I need to actually put money in it? Yes. You pop a coin in the slot and climb on in. All right. I'm looking pretty good. Fire away. There's got to be an optics problem with that machine. I, I look uh, partially digested. The hell? Uh. Good thing you didn't opt for that second set of prints after all. Guess that guy won't be filing any complaints with the Portable Business Association. Did it just eat that guy? That was weird. Anyway, we now have pictures of ourselves. Really serious looking ones. Or just making faces at the camera. Pretty cool looking, huh? Not really. Let's check out implants and stuff. I'm curious about the uh, stuff part. Hey, that guy looks strangely familiar. Yikes, can it be? Well, yes it is. It's Fester, Fester Blatz, former owner and proprietor of Fester's World of Wonders, a cheesy little tourist trap on the desert planetoid of Fleabot. The t-shirt looks, and unfortunately smells, like the same one he wore on Fleabot. He has the expression of someone enjoying a permanent wedgie. He has aged somewhat. Looks like he's grown a few more neck rings. These last few years have been rough on him. From what you remember of him, he used to be kind of an aqua blue. Now he looks like a used lug liner. 
or the color of a Vorillion miner's loogie. It's Faster Blads from Space Quest 3. You? And it looks like he has some interesting things on sale here. I'm not sure which I prefer, the tourist trap nonsense he sold in uh, Space Quest 3 or all this junk. Let's talk to him. Uh. <coughs> Howdy, stranger. The name's Blatz. Fester Blatz. Welcome to Implants and Stuff. Go ahead. <laughs> Have a look around at some of the most interesting replacement body components this lovely planetoid has to offer. Oh, a nice fresh sales pitch. I don't think he recognizes us. Go ahead and look around, partner. I'll be glad to answer any questions you might have about my fine line of merchandise. Yes, sir, have a look. Go else. ahead and look around, partner. Um, well, let's take a look around then. Cranial stalks. Yeah, I got them in a few months ago, uh, fresh from the harvesting facility. Genuine dumb brand cranial stalks. Perfect for when just one or two accidental nicks from those amateur scalpels can render your home built being useless as lips on a. Oh, never mind. Just rip out that old stalk and slam in one of these little beauties, and your home built being will be carrying out your bidding in no time. Guaranteed. I don't really see why we'd need that. What's this? BG. Brain dead products have been a staple of the home built being hobbyist for decades now. They make a fine line of adapter plugs which allow for cross species component swapping. Means you'll be able to pick up parts anywhere other beings exist. <laughs> nice deal, huh? I suppose. They also make a pretty fine moddy. Get tired of what kind of mood your droid, or spouse for that matter, is in? Why, you just slap in one of those babies and bingo! You can modify them into a whole new attitude. Find a wife type who won't pay some big buckazoids for that. Too bad the sale of them is illegal. About all I do is trade for them. It's one of them loopholes, guess you could say. Kinda developed a hobby of collecting the suckers. So he trades Mardis, eh? I'm sure that information won't come in useful at all. Can I heart monitor or something? Wow, an Apple 2 Plus running biorhythms! You thought IBM had rounded all those up and landfilled them decades ago, back when Apple started the push to open home computing to the public, making it fun and accessible. Right. Let's not comment on that. <laughs> this one's labeled fresh. By the looks of things around here, fresh is a very relative term. Indeed. Looks like it's a brain or something. It hurts your eyes to look at that. In fact, you feel a major headache coming on. He's not the only one. What can be said that isn't painfully obvious? I don't know. Abby Normal. Hmm, what's special about this Abby Normal guy? Good night, Mr. Feldman, wherever you are. Feldman? Does he mean Corey Feldman? I'm missing a reference here somewhere. The drawers seem to be crammed with Mahdi's plug-in modification implants and the various adapters necessary to make them work universally. Fester has quite a collection of these, which is surprising. The sale of those things was banned years ago. Yeah, sometimes when you do a lot of cranial work, you gotta replace the fluid so the old brain isn't just bouncing around in there like a BB. <laughs> But then you're probably already used to that. Hey, are you calling me stupid? Why do people always call me stupid? So this is where old Fester ended up after the total collapse of the never-thriving tourist trade on that sandy planetoid Fleeb Hut. He seems to know how to land on his feet, no matter how fungally challenged they may be. Loop piercing. 
That sounds... Well, not exactly painful, considering your brain doesn't actually have any pain sensors. Yeah, this is the only place on the planet to get a good lobe piercing, I tell ya. And even though we don't have to, we do use only Lorshan quality body part piercing products. Less chance of pus buildup and drainage that way. Uh, that stuff tends to dull the erythrium coating on the hardware. Uh, good to know, I guess. Oh, well, we'll continue in the next video. Welcome back. We are looking around the stuff that Fester has for sale here. Most of it is pretty useless. It's a marketing device for dumb. They design and manufacture a wide variety of implants, prosthetics, and conversion attachment kits. Hopefully their product is better made than their sign is. Oh, with a name like that, I doubt it. An empty tank of gen blood sits in the dust. A generic synthetic blood which was originally designed for use as a temporary blood substitute in the event of traumatic loss. It has become a favorite in the You Build a Beast Brotherhood. Sure, why not? Them syringes you can use with lidocaine if you got some. Sometimes you gotta give old Butch a jump start right at first. Sure. Now you know what happened to the infamous R2 line of droids. They've been reduced to carrying out the most trivial of tasks. Fester's using one for a gen blood blender. How sad. The R2 line of droids seemed like the hottest thing going in their day. Then they found that one little flaw in the programming. Unfortunately, the princess's personal life will never be quite the same. I get the feeling there's a story there. I also get the feeling I don't really want to know it. Oh, well, there's nothing we can do uh, here right now. We don't need any of this stuff. Although I guess Roger could use a spare brain. Or a brain to be in with. Is that a post box? This part of town is almost as glamorous as the rest. I guess we'll never find out. A very odd fixture occupies a good portion of this corner. Its purpose is irrelevant, as it seems to be the victim of a lack of maintenance and some sort of clinging mineral-like deposit, which have been laid down in several art-shaped patterns. A sensible person would be afraid to find out what this caps off. That being the case, I'll take the liberty of telling you that it's something you don't want to mess with. Sure, sure, sure. You are visually unimpressed. But there's eyes behind it. Let's head north. <coughs> Let's see. We have an arcade. Yeah, we haven't been in an arcade for two games, so I guess... Uh, it might be uh, a good idea to uh, check that out. Wow. Oh. Looks like we gotta uh, pay attention at this intersection. And there's a bar called Orion's Belt. Another Orion's Belt franchise. That's one place you have yet to be banished from. I'll bet that's the finest neon sculpture on the whole corner. Ah, an arcade. You haven't been in an arcade in at least a sequel or two. How cute. It has a really big replica of a coin slot. Hmm. Let's uh, go inside. See if there's any fun games to play. Hopefully not a sequel of Astro Chicken or something. That's something we can do without. This arcade, known to the locals as Dismembers Only, is filled with lowlifes, druggies, and juvenile delinquents from all over the galaxy. And those are just the employees. Badoomch. I felt it needed that. This arcade, and those are... What game is this? It's last year's hot arcade punch em up more dull combat 2. I think you can probably see 
the reference there. This guy looks like a mushroom, or maybe a rusty nail or something. This guy looks like a well-used railroad spike. Perhaps the rust and mushroomed head give it away. Anything that shortens this guy's lifespan probably makes the universe a safer place. Referring to the fact that he's smoking, of course. Apparently, the smoking ban has not been instituted on Polysorb 860. Then again, considering the state of the place, who would notice? An overhead screen advertises a new kitty level arcade game in which you walk around Calcutta trying to match the right body part with the leper who lost it. <laughs> it's called Mixed Up Mother Teresa. <laughs> that joke is just so bad. Reference to the Sierra game Mixed Up Mother Goose, of course. You look at it, but nothing strikes your fancy. Can't really argue with that. Help me tattoo to, to his shoulder. Oh, he does look like he needs help. This little purple being is kicking Fanny on this game. He's built up an audience. What game? This little purple. Oh, it doesn't say. Another in the wide variety of life forms you've seen on this planet. This guy just stands there, looks, and fires an occasional lunger. How did all these forms manage to come together in one place? <coughs> Normally, you'd have to travel light years to run into just a few different life forms. This place has the odds beaten big time. Yeah, it's a real multicultural hotspot, this place. Interesting head formation. He looks like one of those cranium suckers you saw in a scary movie once. Better stay away, then. Guess that means you'll be safe. He's got a point. This rough, tough cream puff is positively myrtleizing that machine. That's one hefty teenager. Must be from the Mariposa Planetoid. What kind of game is this? This humongous, expensive game is an all-time favorite. You have to duplicate famous gourmet dishes while piloting vintage combat aircraft against the Nazi menace. It's called Secret Recipes of the Luftwaffe. That's cross-genre gone mad. He looks like he wants to play it, but for some reason can't. Cool. It's a potential sucker trying to decide if it's worth it. Oh. There's a serious dweeb factor happening here. Quiet. These lava screens from Magmetheus show soothing visuals while playing hot techno-lava tunes like What's lava got to do with it? You always hurt the one you lava. And just let your lava flow. Hmm. Sounds like uh, those tunes were written by Michael Giacchino. Because he likes using puns in his track names. Now that's an interesting specimen. Is this place the backwoods of the universe or what? See if we can talk to any of these people. Wait, what's this game actually? Look, it's the hot new game, Stooge Fighter 3! It's supposed to be the goriest, most violent arcade game since Disemboweling for Dollars! Um, right. Well, at least there's no Astro Chicken, by the looks of it. Hello? You drool in that direction, but no one notices. Hello? Hey, don't put your mouth on that! Actually, the only guy you can talk to is him, so I'm just gonna skip the rest of them, if you don't mind. So this is Stooge Fighter 3. Doesn't look so tough to me. Say, partner! Care to indulge in a friendly game? By the way, the name's Jerkwad. What's your mama call you? A mistake. But my friends call me Roger. Roger Wilco. Well, it's darn fine to meet you, Roger. So... What do you say to a friendly little round of Stooge Fighter 3? Sure, that sounds interesting. Gosh, Mr. <coughs> Jerkwad, that, uh, that sounds neat.
I'm soft. Run, Roger, run! Obviously, a reference to both Street Fighter and the Three Stooges. You can choose between uh, Larry, Curly, and Moe. Basically, I'm gonna go with uh, Coily Joe. To play using the keyboard, press A to move backward, blah 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 blah, S to duck, D to move forward, Q, W, E to attack. Or you can just click the buttons. Which is even stupider. Oh, I can't actually skip this. Let's get ready to... Oh! Doesn't really matter what you do here, you can't win. Nah, nah, nah. Oh, a wise gun! Oh, oh. Obviously all of her oh, are attacks gun. are based on uh, Three Stooges things. I think the ashtray is alive. You summon the ability to leave it alone. Ah, uh, you can't look at that because I don't have a access to the eye cursor here. Man, isn't this game exciting? No, it's not. Just kill me already, will you? Round two. Huh. Interesting that that attack he does seems to be much stronger than any of the others and any of the ones that I can do. The one where he pulls my nose. So either this game is improperly balanced, or he's cheating. Or there's some secret moves. What was the Konami's cheat code again? I don't remember. Game over, man! Indeed. Wow, man! I guess I got real lucky. <laughs> or maybe you were holding back on me. Nah, you wouldn't do that, would you? You don't look that bright. <laughs> I mean, that probably isn't your style. Wanna play again? Yeah, you know what? I want a rematch, but we'll have to do it in the next video. Welcome back! This guy soundly beat us at Stooge Fighter 3. I want to try again. I want a rematch. I've thought it over. I think I'll give it a try. Let's do it, tentacle head. Great! I can't wait to waste ya. You. You're gonna bring good money at the slave colony. Wait, what? Well, let's choose Mo, because he seemed to have a more powerful check. Still can't skip the instructions, even though I already know them. Let's get ready to Rumble! Yes, let's. Hey, I couldn't do that attack when I was playing as Joe. And I can't seem to make uh, 
the nose pulling attack happen either. Oh, so he's wise definitely guy. cheating. Oh, a wise guy. See that? <laughs> oh, a wise guy. Oh, a wise guy. Or maybe he just knows a special combo. Which we don't. Oh, a wise guy. No, no, no. Oh, a wise guy. See that? <laughs> Yeah, the crackling in that Rubble. in these uh, sound bites is in the actual sounds. It's not a problem on my end. How long we can keep this up? See that? <laughs> oh, why? He just resorts oh, to using the cheat move again. Oh, why? Yeah, that's enough of that. Point. <laughs> yeah, I'm just gonna let him beat me. This guy's good. You can kiss this game goodbye. Yeah, like I need you rubbing it in. Sorry. Is Roger talking to the narrator? What fourth wall? We have no fourth wall here. Okay. Let's uh, see what else we can do here. Is there anything in this street? The corner of Staden Rush, apparently. Sometimes it's hard to tell which looks stranger, the ship or the being piloting it. You won't know in this case, though, since this seems to have been abandoned for quite some time. The pilot of this craft employed a truly creative parking technique. By the looks of it, they'd been a patron of Orion's belt immediately prior to executing this fine parking job. Hmm. Drunk driving, indeed. This guy looks like he should be standing watch around one of those barrels. He has a bit of a nervous look about him. And I seem to be blocking his way. Let's see if we can talk to him. Hey! Uh, I wonder if you... Nah, what was I thinking? Wait, what? Hey! Uh, buddy. Maybe you can help me out. I'm trying to track down this ender droid. I'm an ender droid runner. I know it don't look so hot, but I'm in disguise, you know? In disguise? Yeah, you do look disguised. I just don't know what like. Hey, here's a tip. Think seriously about a flea dip. You know it's bad when Roger put you down. I could really use your help getting this one. I've had a hell of a time tracking him down. You've got to help me. Tell you what. If you can find and immobilize this bionic beer opener, it's worth 50 buckazoids to you. What do you say to that? I've scoured this dung heap. I haven't seen synthetic hide in a hair of him. All that's left to check is that bar. I'd go in there myself, you see, but I've had a little misunderstanding with the management. No biggie. I'm sure it'll blow over soon. Anyway, can you help me out? What do you say? Fifty buckazoids. And if you don't mind me saying it, you look like you could use it. So how about it? Sure, why not, I guess? Well, I don't know. What's this Indodroid thing look like? And why do you want it? Well, he's about your height, only maybe a few inches higher. 
And I'd say about your weight, give or take 60 pounds or so. But then that's just probably because of that stuff he's made of. Kind of a liquid metal thing, but that's not important. He's got a crew cut, and I think he was wearing a long, dark coat. Has a strange accent. But why do you want him? Oh, he made some people mad. They do that. How? Oh, I guess he sort of jumped out of his program and kind of killed and or mangled a score or so of co-workers and, more importantly, management personnel. A big no-no. No big deal. I just got to take him in for analysis and processing. It could help pull me out of my, uh, unfortunate cash flow situation. And most importantly, it can mean 50 buckazoids for you. What do you say? Well, I could use the buckazoids. I'll see what I can do. Great. You won't regret it. You're going to need this data quarter. It's been modified to only be sensitive to certain unique components like droidium, something only an endrodroid would be composed of. This will help you root him out. Good luck. Uh, I mean, uh, let me know when you've got him. Thanks. I gotta go check in with the home office. I'll check back out here a little later to see how you're coming along. Right. Well, 50 buckazoids isn't going to be enough to get a room in that hotel, but it's a start. Now we have a data quarter, which I guess is a pun on tricorder. Or not really a pun anyway. A reference to tricorder. This is the data quarter you got from that endodroid hunter dude. And you can actually use it. And if we uh, turn it on... This button turns the data quarter on and off. Oh. I thought I still had the hand icon selected. Hey, my finger doesn't look too good. You notice your firm muscular fingers, the graceful bone structure, the elegant blood blister under your thumb. These are a man's hands. Okay. Also... There are no muscles in your fingers. This is the data quarter's proximity display. If one light is on, the selected chemical compound shown on the LCD screen is present, but at an extremely low trace level. If two lights are on, the compound is within 100 meters. If all three lights are on and flashing, the compound is within 10 meters. If no lights are on, either the data quarter is not turned on, or there is no detectable trace of the compound. All right, now it's not turned on. This is the data quarter's LCD view screen. When powered up, the chemical compound being scanned for appears on this screen. When reconfigured for other modes, the name of the mode appears on this screen. See how easy? And it really, really works. Wait, is this an infomercial for data quarters? Let's turn the power on. Scanning for droidium, and apparently there is not an awful lot of uh, stuff of the stuff around. But it seems that we would be able to find some, maybe, perhaps, in the uh, bar. Oh, it sounds groovy, at least. I guess this guy's the bouncer. This guy looks friendly now. Try to keep it that way. Can I talk to him? Hello, uh, Mr. Bouncer. He pays very little attention. You're pretty used to it. But someday... Someday he'll pay even less attention, I guess. Let's go into the bar. Do it a drink. It would appear that once again, Vice is a bit more profitable than most business ventures. This place is almost too hip for the planet. But then that's no mean feat, given what a total heap this place appears to be. Yep, looks like an interesting place. But we'll have to look around it in the next video. Welcome back! 
We are in the Orion's Belt bar. Looks like a pretty hip place. One of the better bars we've been in in uh, Space Coast Games, by the looks of it. Too bad it's on such a dump heap of a planet. The floor has the universal tacky spill drink and stomach contents feel to it. No sense in looking. In fact, it would be in your best interest not to. And I want to taste and lick it. You start to see something, and then you remember that you're supposed to be a man of action, not words. Or is that the other way around? You can't taste and lick stuff. In this game, unfortunately. This is the main floor of the Swank Lounge, Orion's Belt. This seems to be where things are happening for the slightly seedier beings of the city. As you can see, there's a pretty good cross-section of the regional population represented here. I've got a drink here called Eczema. Not an appealing name. This is the main... Ah. What kind of drinks does he have? A wide variety of concoctions fills the shelves behind the bar. There's probably something there to provide a buzz for just about any organic system. Some of your personal favorites, Babylon 45, Watney's Red Planet, and Starbeck. Starbeck, it makes you go where no man has gone before. That's sort of like the Red Bull gives you wings, in terms of the slogan. They've got Heinleineken. That sounds familiar. This is the main... None of these logos have any... An interesting arrangement of conduits creates an almost artistic pattern to the back bar area. It's hard to tell what is merely decorative and what is functional. Oh yeah, it looks like there's some pipes here with some valves behind the bar. So this is where Sinead O'Connor's been hanging out. <laughs> sure. Looks like this big furry dude is laying out his best Orlanian pickup lines for the Ice Queen. It appears she's not fielding any of them. I don't think you can talk to any other patrons. Their conversation continues uninterrupted by you. See? Some holes in the wall here. Hard to spot, but they are there. An interesting arrangement of conduits creates an almost... It gives you the same message as the conduits, apparently. You look at it, but nothing strikes your fancy. Huh. This is a weird being. Yikes! I'll bet even old Fester Blatz hasn't seen one of these. <laughs> the bartender. A quick look indicates that the bartender is physically well balanced and adroit. A good combination for this profession. The shirt would further indicate that he has the mentality for it. Yes, something Neelix like about him. Especially the shirt, I guess. You recognize the uniform of the Fistal Hemisphere Alliance. This guy has an interesting cranial configuration. Indeed he does. Unlike that popular trunk-bearing pachyderm on that planet Earth, this guy seems to actually be drinking through his trunk. That means he's drinking through his nose. Yuck. Well, still less weird than how drool, uh, drunk. He drunk by putting glasses on top of his head. This rather large individual with the headphones seems to have tuned this place out. And wouldn't you, if you had a chance? I would. Can we get a drink? Hey, what can I do for you there, fella? I don't have any money, though. What have you got? Well, aside from the obvious stuff which is glaring in your face from the back wall here, I do make some mixed drinks. I mean, uh, if I do say so myself, I make a pretty mean William Gibson and a pretty good Asimov cocktail, you know what I mean, huh? Hey, I got you. Try a fuzzy toe jam. They seem to be pretty popular with your particular uh, species here. Yay for sci-fi references. I'm gonna try the fuzzy toe jam. Okay, you got it, pal. But he does not actually give it to us. 
or nothing appeared to have happened anyway. Good thing too, because we don't have any money. One thing you can do here actually is you can walk further to the right, which can really uh, throw you off if you don't know it. What the hell is that thing? Now there's an interesting look. What can be said that isn't painfully obvious? Not much. That you'll look better come closing time. No way, I'm never gonna get that drunk. What can be said that isn't painfully obvious? What's a restroom? This guy's the next in line for the restroom. He looks a little anxious. It's one of several people dying to get into the restroom. This guy wishes he had a clothespin right about now. Yep, it's the fourth guy in line for the restroom. Definitely standing room only. They're all waiting for a restroom. Fortunately, we don't have to go. Let's see if we can pick up any trace of that Androdroid. Using our trusty data quarter. I say trusty, but we only just got it, so... Whatever. Seems to be nearby. But you missed. Oh, I didn't miss. I just tried to leave the screen in the wrong way. Um. Well, he's obviously not here. Or maybe he's upstairs. Not by the looks of it. Still, let's look around. These guys are a nicely matched set. They seem to be amusing each other to a very high degree. How trendy. Cargo ship grating seems to have been used in an artsy fashion to create flooring for the loft area. Hmm, it must be pretty interesting below when someone up here rejects whatever substances they may have consumed over the previous couple of hours. Yeah. Better carry an umbrella with you if you're ever going to this bar. The walls up here maintain the same conduit theme as below. Hmm. I'm sure that will be completely irrelevant. The booths contain some of the more low-key patrons. He looks lonely, but not enough for your company. Oh, yes. This guy looks like he just got back from Cybernom. You gotta be there. You gotta have been there or something. I don't know. I guess a waitress? A waitron hovers about, tray in claw, tending to the upstairs clientele. It makes decent tips, especially for a synthetic being. Why would you tip a robot? Wow, this sucker makes even you look like GQ material. These nitro suckers come in all types. They're all drawing on the hoses. Amazingly, they don't freeze. They just glaze over for a few moments while the others laugh. This one has a tattoo which says, I love Lula. Good to know. These nitro suckers come. This one has a tattoo. Oh. These nitro sucker. This one has. It looks like they're sucking something, sort of like a, a hookah pipe. It's attached to a tank on the ground here. As with some other tables, a large tank marked liquid nitrogen sits beneath the center. It feeds the hookah manifold above. A set of hoses are within reach for each being which might be perched there. They're smoking liquid nitrogen. That sounds dangerous to your health. One thing you can actually do is steal from the... Uh, snag a buckazoid off the Waitron. How cool you are. You can steal buckazoids. Not always, though. Depends on where she is. You snag a buckazoid off the Waitron. How cool you are. Uh, no, I got two buckazoids. I think you can get up to 19. <laughs> And I'm not gonna do that. Shut
Shut up, you two. Well, no trace of uh, the droid up here. So, let's uh, head down. There's a door here! Maybe that is where our droid is hanging out. You probably wonder where that goes. Indeed I do. Uh... Does the data quarter give another reading here? No, it's the same. Let's see if we can open that door. It wouldn't be prudent to do that at this juncture. I guess the hand icon is not the right icon to do that. Let's use just the feet icon. Well, that wasn't too bad for a borderline physical specimen like you. It didn't quite get the job done, though. Let's try that again. Nah, you still haven't convinced the door to yield to your obviously superior physical presence. I have to say it is a mighty wimpy kick. Wow, you really did it! Not exactly the subtlest of entry techniques, but effective. That's pretty macho for the likes of you. Who would have guessed you'd have the makings of a Starsky or a Hutch, or a Tango or a Cash? Who knew, indeed? Well, we'll see what's down there in the next video. Welcome back. We've kicked open the door, so let's see if the Android is waiting for us downstairs. Maybe it's Rutger Hauer. Because, you know, he was in Blade Runner. You go now, and I don't rearrange your organs. Nope, sounds like he's more of a Arnold Schwarzenegger type. There's something on the floor here. It's a small section of pipe, not unlike those commonly found at ice skating accidents. <laughs> what? Let's get the pipe. Let's check out what else is here. It's the Endodroid, and he's repairing himself. Yuck. Uh-oh. I guess we should have taken that threat seriously. I, you can't Yeah, really that's a great improvement. Look much better now. There's an eye on the floor. Well, he did warn you. I'm not going to say he told you so, but he did. And this game gives you a try again option, meaning you don't have to save every five seconds. Um, let's look around a little bit more here. This is actually also a scrolling screen. Oh, and I... Damn. No. I got too close. Yeah, that's a great improvement. Look much better now. Well, he did what? I'm not going to say he... I just want to look at this. This is one of the only open conduits. Indeed it is. What's this, actually? Kegs of Watney's, Red Dog, Samuel Adams. Excuse me, I need to wipe my chin. There. Let's get out of here before he does it again. Now, how can we deal with him? Well, the... Uh Blade Runner type dude we uh, talked to said that he was made of some kind of liquid metal. How do you deal with Terminator type androids made of liquid metal? You freeze them, of course. And... That means we need liquid nitrogen, which is in the tank we saw upstairs. So we gotta convince these dudes to leave. Can we talk to them. Your utterances fall on uninterested oral organs. I guess not. Can we just take the tank? Do you have a death wish or what? That's not a good idea. Trust me. Nope. So what could we do to make them leave? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> These guys are really beginning to annoy me. Well, maybe if we pretend that we are in security, they will uh, listen to us. You can tell by the serious nature of their laughter that they're real impressed by your fake ID. 
Fortunately, they're just faced enough not to want to reshape you. Hmm, seems they're not impressed. Well, no wonder we don't look anything like that picture. Fortunately, we have some photos of ourselves, so we can solve that problem. You quite cleverly paste your picture over the old one on the ID card. Let's see if now they'll buy it. You hear them say, geez, our skimmers double hovered. We gotta run. And they leave, leaving behind some hoses. You snag the four hoses. Never know when you're going to meet that special lady. I don't think I want to know. Oh, I got some tangled mess of uh, hoses there. It's a twisted mass of hookah hoses. See if we can't uh, straighten that out a little. You carefully untangle the twisted mass of hookah hoses and then rehook the hoses to create one long hose. It reminds you of Christmas time back home when you enjoyed untangling the Christmas lights and saying to yourself, I get so much satisfaction from cleaning and straightening. One day, I'll be the best janitor ever. Well, at least one part of that dream came true. You are a janitor. You rehook the hoses to create one long one. I just wanted you to straighten the hoses, not li listen to your life story. <laughs> and of course, we need to tank of nitrogen. But it seems that that is rather a bit too heavy to uh, be dragging down. So how can we get that liquid nitrogen to where we need it? The basement. Well, we've seen all these conduits all over the place. There's conduits here, there's conduits on the main floor, and there was an open conduit down in the basement. And it's rather hard to spot, but there's actually an open conduit here. Hmm, this conduit seems to be unoccupied at the moment. That's an interesting way to drink. You can actually attach the tank to that conduit. The canister snaps neatly into the conduit opening. Okay, now I'm not entirely sure if it's possible to run out of liquid nitrogen if you don't do this quickly enough. So I'm going to save here just in case. Then open the valve. Nitro begins to flow through the tubing and into the conduit. Let's see where that comes out. Hopefully all the way down in the basement, but I doubt it. Let's take a look here. Yeah, it looks like it comes out of the left opening here. Hey, that nitro's coming out through this conduit. Better shut the tank off before it's all wasted. That sounds like a good idea. Until we can get that nitro to go somewhere we want it to go should not leave it on. Can you get out of the way, please? That's not what I meant to do. The nitro stops flowing. <laughs> Okay, so how can we get the nitro from um, that one conduit on the left there to the basement? Well, maybe some of these other conduits can help with that. Let's see. Hey, 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 yeah, 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 there, guy. Come on now. Hey, hey, you can't come back here. Well, you want something? You, you let me know, all right? Hmm. He doesn't want to let us behind the bar, so we'll need to find a way to distract him. Well, maybe that security uh, ID is going to help with that again. That's all we got. Worth a try, after all. Ah, 
so you're with Poly Sorbet Security, huh? And yeah, what can I get for you, Chief? What have you got? Well, aside from the obvious stuff which is glaring in your face from the back wall here, I do make some mixed drinks. I mean, uh, if I do say so myself, I make a pretty mean William Gibson and a pretty good Asimov cocktail, you know what I mean, huh? Hey, I got you. Try a fuzzy toe jam. They seem to be pretty popular with your particular uh, species here. I got just the thing for you guys. It's something I don't even give the regulars here. What do you think, huh? That gives us another option here. Um, the special. Let's see what happens if we order that. Make me a double uvula spritzer. Twist a fleck rind, and I want it hacked and whipped, not like one of those shaken or stirred sissy drinks. Okay, coming right up, Chief. Uh, listen, this'll take a couple of minutes, but uh, feast your eyes on the making of it, all right? Oh, that's just fine. Take your time, my good man. That'll keep him occupied for a few minutes, allowing us to get behind the bar. And besides the conduits... The refrigeration unit blends well with the design scheme. This refrigerator... Hey, when did you start knowing things like that? Okay. The refrigerator is also something we want to look at. Not much of interest in here except this. The refrigeration unit contains an ice cube tray and some chilled beverages, none of which looks very enticing to you. You have to be careful about what you consume in these universal spaceport bars. One creature's wine is another creature's bile and vice versa. Quite true, quite true. Okay, let's check out the conduits. It's solidly in place. Now he's standing in the way. What that it's one? Solidly in place. Check out the valve, actually. Yikes! Yo! You quickly close that valve again. That was not a good idea. Yow! You quickly close that valve again! This one doesn't spew anything. That's interesting. Let's see if we can... Uh, do something with that. With a flick of your very supple wrist, you pull the conduit loose from below the valve. Oops! Sweet! Hopefully that leads down. It does look like it does. Um, so let's see if we can connect our hose concoction. Try the other conduit first, just for fun. Humor me. Oh. Okay. Guess we have to do it in that order. The hookah hose is now attached to the leftmost conduit. You complete the connection between the two conduits. Okay, well, let's see if that takes the uh, nitro all the way down to the bottom, but we'll check that out in the next video. Welcome back. Gotten this hose contraption here set up. Hopefully that will allow us to direct our liquid nitrogen all the way down to the basement and freeze that endodroid. Nitro begins to flow through the tubing and into the conduit. The hell's this stuff on the wall the here? The walls up here maintain the same conduit. Yeah. Can't even look at that. Ah, oh, damn it, I was not quick enough. Rat! It appears that the bartender disconnected your cleverly concocted hose link while you were gone. Oh, that means we have to try that again. So, let's show him the uh, security ID again. Ah. 
What if you? And we don't need to listen well, to all that again. I got you. Make me a. Oh, good. Oh, that's just. You pick up the loose end of the hookah hose. Okay, let's reconnect that. You complete the connection between the two conduits. Well, hopefully, the nitrous is still working. Let's head downstairs. And find out. Yes, it worked! Frosta la quista, baby. Wow, it worked! This dude's in a deep freeze. But now what are you going to do with him? Well, I think I'm going to give him a solid whack with this here pipe. Cool! Laying a solid blow upside the head of this frigid felon has reduced him to cubes! He's not too hard to handle now. Still, I doubt we can just pick that up. Don't touch that. We don't know where you've been. A bit uh, hard to pick up a bunch of ice cubes, but we have a dust pan which may be able to ha help with that. You quite cleverly whisk the cubed culprit into your dust pan. It's going to be tough to carry him this way, though. And if you try, he will fall and you will die. You have to put him into the tray of ice cubes. Very good. He'll be much more transportable this way. However, you'd better hope it doesn't fall. Doesn't he still weigh the same as when he was in his original form? It would be incredibly a heavy tray of ice cubes. Oh well, it's not as if we can fault uh, Space Quest for an ina inaccurate portrayal of physics. Good, bartender's still busy, because we need to go behind the uh, bar again. If you just walk outside now... You can't open the refrigeration unit with the hoses connected and stretched tightly across its front. Oh. Okay, we'll disconnect it then. And mess up your great hookup job? No, you don't want to do that. Yes, I do. And mess up your. Okay, this is stupid. Sorry, you can. O Sorry, you can only break it. You aren't checked out in reconnection. Sorry, you can. O and mess up your great. Well, that sucks. I guess we need to go elsewhere. Oh, wait. Or just wait for him to undo it. The bartender, noticing the hose attached to the bent conduit, disconnects it, much to your chagrin. Okay. Um, we do need to get into the... Uh, refrigerator again, because he will fall if we don't. And that is bad for our health, obviously. So, we need to distract him one more time. Ah, so... What have you got? Well, this side... I got just... Make me a double uvula spritzer. Twist a fleck rind, and I want it hacked and whipped, not like one of those shaken or stirred sissy drinks. Okay. Oh, that's just... Good. We never get drink, though. Anyway. Just close the refrigerator. Wait a few seconds. Open it again. 
and get him out. And now he will... It looks vaguely like your hiney after it's been chewed out by your boss. Really? No, he won't fall until we, uh, before we have a chance to uh, give him to the Android Runner, who's conveniently standing right here. Here's your cubed compadre. Where's my 50 buckazoids? No bull. You really got him, eh? Uh, I, I mean, good job. Don't sound so surprised. Yeah, I really got him. And I could really use my 50 buckazoids. Tell you what. I'll pay you when they pay me. No. I need the money now. Or I let the guy thaw right here. Right now. No, just a minute. You don't want to do that. Hold on to your elementary contents. I got it here. I got it here. Here, you happy? I'll just be taking that tray. Been a special treat doing business with you. I thought he couldn't go into the bar. Hey. He just escaped. Um, I can't move. Oh, I can move. Just not in the direction of the bar, apparently. Sounds like things went wrong in there. Well, at least we have uh, 52 buckazoids now, which is unfortunately not enough. We're going to need a way to make more money. Why did the music stop, by the way? Hey, who's that guy? Haven't seen him before. Wandering around. No, can it be? It is. It's Elmo Pug, the former CEO of Scumsoft. Hard times have hit him like a ball-peen hammer between the, uh, uh, eyes. Maybe there is a karma ferry. Elmo from Space Coast 3. Can we talk to him? He's too far away or doesn't care. Probably both. I don't think you can go back into the bar again. I think eventually the bouncer will come back out, but he won't let you in. I want to talk to Elmo. Hey! Say, you look familiar. Didn't I kick your butt in a huge robot once? Oh yeah, that. I hope to forget that. It was the beginning of my undoing. I was a laughing stock around the company in the final days of Scumsoft. Oh well, if that hadn't gotten me, some of my other creative management techniques would have. In looking at the big picture, I suppose that arrangement left me with all my physical assets intact. Not a single other thing, unfortunately. I'm humiliated to admit that I have, on rare occasion, resorted to selling cheat sheets for arcade games. I've got to maintain a fairly uh, modest profile, I guess you could say. Time heals wounds and all that. Plus, maybe I can avoid a premature termination. Wow. That's all very interesting. No, it isn't. And very boring, if you don't mind my saying. What I want to know is, can you sell me a cheat sheet for Stooge Fighter 3? Well, I think I may be able to facilitate that. I may have one in stock. Okay, here's what I need from you. A nice new bottle of cold sordian brandy. If you can deliver that, I think we can call it a deal. My people, I mean, I'll be waiting to take delivery from you so that we can put a bow on this deal. Catch you later. Looks like he can help us get a cheat sheet for Stooge Fighter 3, which hopefully we can use to 
defeat that guy. Maybe we can challenge him to a game for some cash or something. So we can get enough money to get into the inn. And I must say that really I think that my voice for Elmo was much better than the, the one they gave him here. Anyway, we'll continue in the next video. Welcome back! Roger started whistling the Space Quest theme, which is something uh, he does if you uh, stand around and do nothing for a while. Just do something and then he'll stop. We just talked to Elmo here, former CEO of Scumsoft, and he has offered to give us a cheat sheet for Stooge Fighter 3, which we can of course use to put that jerk in the arcade uh, in his place. But he wants some liquor in return. Now where have we seen a liquor store? I do believe we saw one here. Think Tank Girl. <laughs> okay. I guess uh, you can guess which two movies that is a combination of. I think the Space Quest 4 also shows up here if you uh, come here often enough. This is where we saw a liquor store. Boot liquor. So let's uh, take a look if we ca can't find this cold Sordian brandy there. And hopefully the money we got from uh, catching the endodroid will be sufficient. Hey, look at that. It's E.T. This little flesh wad looks familiar. You wonder what he's doing here. Must have been a victim of the telecommunications wars. Because he wants to phone home. Get it? Eh, that was a stupid joke anyway. Can we talk to him? You start to say something and then you remember that you're supposed to be a man of action, not words. Or is that the other way around? No, oh, that's just one of the standard nothing to say messages. What you can do, however, and you actually get points for doing it, is click the hand icon on him. And he does this little cute thing. You think, hey, I didn't get points. Try it again. And again. Just keep doing it. I think it's the fifth time, but... No. Oh yeah, it is! <laughs> he pulls his finger, and then you get points. <laughs> That's really silly. Not that you'd ever know that you'd miss them. Because this game doesn't actually tell you what the maximum possible score is. Alright, let's look around the place. I guess that's the proprietor. I guess he must get a lot of crime around here, considering he appears to be behind glass. Stop whistling. Pa Concha Hawken sits behind the counter by his favorite possession. Something he values greater than his own life, the cash register. Pa's been in business for quite a while, as his grizzled look might attest. So it would seem. You can actually look at all the different kinds of liquor on the shelves. It's Ursula K. Le Guinness Stout, a perennially popular refreshment and winner of last year's Nebu Ale Award. They're basically all puns. The imported stuff, like Sap Purnell and Major Kieran, is too syrupy for your tastes. There's no slowing down with a Silverberg bullet tonight. These cans of Heinleinekens have been sitting here since Lazarus. Heinleinekens, the strange beer in a strange can. I don't know, I'd buy it with a slogan like that. 
This is the interior of Bootlicker. In keeping with most of the rest of the area, there is absolutely no frills in the decor. Where did I know message for these bottles or? Your mouth waters at the wine coolers, especially this wild Roddenberry flavored stuff. Then again, a nice frosty Harlan Aylison, a cold filtered Beers Anthony, or a Marion Zima Bradley sounds good about now. Hmm. <laughs> This little flesh wad looks familiar. No. This little flesh. I'm looking at the, the shelf, not ET. This is the interior. Look just behind the cans of HP Love Draft and Kilgore Stout. Hmm, they've got a few cans of Meister Brodigan, the only beer made from watermelon sugar. There's probably a good reason for that. Weekends were made for front lobe, and you wouldn't mind removing a few yourself. Um. Sure. Ooh, you've got a good eye. This stuff is excellent. It's called Something Wicked Ale from Ray's Brad Brewery. These appear to be bottles of Alan Dean Foster's Draft Ale, but it's hard to tell because the labels are so faint. They must have been printed in draft mode. Man, that's an obscure joke. <laughs> it's just some green stuff. And that's even more obscure. You might recall uh, a particular episode of uh, the original Star Trek that that is referring to. Security cameras. A camera covers every square centimeter around the clerk just for security measures. It's amazing what kinds of crimes people will commit to get some of Pa's special stock. I guess so. What does that say? No dough? Blow! It's most uninteresting. Meh. Interesting magazines like This Old Planetoid and The Babes of Polysorbate occupy this space. Well, considering what the planet is like, I'm not expecting much of these Babes of Polysorbate. Were it working this device, it, as noted on its top, would supply ice. But I guess it's not working, then. The shelves of this interesting establishment hold just about every kind of swill a buzz junkie could want. Of course, whether or not you would survive this stuff is another question. Indeed. The shelves of this... Are these newspapers or something? A stack of papers lay unattended on the floor. Apparently, Pa doesn't get in a big hurry to put stuff away. The headline reads, Lindbergh Baby Kidnapped. That is seriously out of date. Um, well, we haven't found any cold Sordian brandy yet, so let's look up the stuff he's got behind uh, him here. Pa keeps some of the more expensive stuff back here, like Jurassic Dark, Raymond E. Feisterbrow, and Samuel Douglas Adams. Uh-huh. <coughs> no cold sodium brandy. Pa keeps some of... Pa keeps some of... No, apparently not. Well, I guess we should uh, try asking him for it then. Hi there. Howdy there, partner. The name's Pa. Pa Conshohocker. Yeah, it's my name. I'm the proprietor of this here establishment here. Now, anything I can sell you, why, you just let me know. Uh, but if you steal anything, um, I'll be forced to kind of kill you. <laughs> Welcome. That uh, sounds fair. The uh, direct approach. I like that. But we need to ask him for brandy. So, Pa, what's the stuff behind you? Oh, that, eh? Why, that there's the good stuff, sonny. I got some real fine stuff back here. Oh, yeah, I do. That's cold Saurian brandy. That's what that is. Best available in these parts here. Now, it's way out of your price range, I'm sure. It goes for 20 buckazoids per. I guess that's expensive. Fortunately, we have more than 20 buckazoids, so we can pay for that. I'd like a bottle of your cold Saurian brandy, please. Well, 
Bill. So you're interested in the good stuff, eh? I'll just take that 20. Thank you. I haven't sold much of this stuff lately, except for some sorry looking little pud. <laughs> oh, hey, that reminds me. He still owes me some money. No, oh, I can't believe I fell for that scam. Oh, well, enjoy. <laughs> Sucker. I guess that explains why he couldn't come in here himself to buy it. Now we have a bottle of brandy. It's that cold Saurian brandy Elmo wanted. Yuck! It has a fish floating in the bottom. Oh well, to each their own. I've seen worse. There's some uh, special type of, uh, of sake they make in uh, Okinawa that has a snake in it. I saw them make it, but I did not actually drink it. Not that I'd uh, have any trouble drinking stuff with snakes in it, it was just too expensive. Don't mess with it, or the deal might be off. Ah. Uh, I wanna try it. I can afford another bottle. Oh wait, we were supposed to be trying to get money to get into the inn, weren't we? Ah. There Elmo is! How convenient! I guess we'll just have to give him uh, the bottle and get that cheat sheet in the next video. Welcome back! We have acquired a bottle of cold Sornian brandy for um, our old friend, well, enemy Elmo Pug. So let's trade that in for a cheat sheet for Stooge Fighter 3. Yes! Uh, oh, I mean, Mr. Wilco, I'm most pleased you've chosen to do business with us. You're just in time, too. I have another party on his way interested in the same item. Oh, well, his loss. Yeah, right. Well, I'll take that off your hands. <laughs> Uh, now, per our agreement, here's your cheat sheet. I'm certain you'll find the game much more interesting now. Yeah, because there's nothing like cheating to... Uh... Also, you look like you could use this fish. Uh... Enjoy, Mr. Wilco. I have a real important business in another part of town. Be seeing ya. Oh, by the way, I'd appreciate if you'd not mention our meeting to anyone. Some of those purple skulled old stockholders really hold a grudge, okay? Bye bye. Oh, great. Why didn't we just get a fish? That isn't the fish from the bottle, I think. Why was he even carrying one? Pretty cool looking, huh? Eh? Not really, it's just a dead, rotting fish. But we did get a cheat code. It's the Stooge Fighter 3 cheat sheet you got from Elbow. To guarantee a win, the cheat sheet says, when at the choice screen, press the machine's letter buttons in the following order. A, B, B, A, C, A, C, A. Then, be aggressive and attack as much as possible using your new secret weapon. Wow, Roger can talk and whistle at the same time. That's pretty impressive. Let's go challenge that guy to another game and try out the cheat uh, code. It's not quite a Konami uh, cheat code. What the hell is that? The guy looks like he could really use a visit to Supercuts. If the thought of how he might look underneath didn't cause you to involuntarily retch, you might even have paid. He looks like a Karibo with feet. You know, I seem to recall that the bouncer would come back here. Oh, there we go. Hold it right there, pal. You don't want to go in there. Trust me, it's not a pretty sight. But then, <laughs> neither are you. Nonetheless, it's bad news in there, and I can't let you enter. So hit the pavement. I guess we're not going back in there. 
Fortunately, we don't need to. We do need to go back into the arcade. Now let's talk to this guy again. Challenge him to another game. Hi, Mr. Jerkwad. How about another game of Stooge Fighter? I'm feeling a little luckier this time. <laughs> you know, kid, I'd really like to, but I need a little more of a challenge. Take a long walk off a short asteroid, okay? What's the matter? Afraid a measly little pencil-necked low-life janitor and general waste of human life is going to embarrass you in front of your friends? That's a pretty accurate description of Roger. Well said. Hold on there, you little puke! I'm not afraid of some puny little zit on the butt of the universe! Jerkwad is a scaredy cat! Jerkwad is a scaredy cat! What's the matter, you chicken? Alright, you little wad of spit. Let's play. I'll waste you. Tell you what. <laughs> Let's make it interesting. If you win, I'll give you 300 buckazoids. However, if I win, you're mine to do with as I see fit. The deal? That doesn't really sound like a good idea, considering those terms. But we have a cheat sheet, so let's try it anyway. And besides, we need 300 buckazoids. How convenient. Oh, this is gonna be fun! Oh, <laughs> you're a bit puny, but I'm sure I'll be able to get a few buckazoids for you over at the slave colony. Who'd ever buy Roger? I'm sorry, I don't think I heard you quite right. Did you say, uh, slave colony? Too late to back out, Borg Breath. I knew that. Well, there we go again. So, we need to enter the uh, coat before we choose our stooge. There's A, B, B, A, C, A, C, A. Wow, they actually built an extra hardware button into the thing just for this purpose. That's impressively lame. Um... Let's uh, choose uh, Larry, since we haven't fought uh, with him yet. So now we're both cheating. Let's see how that evens out. Too bad I can't skip this bit. Let's get ready to... Rumble! Let's... Fortunately, my cheat attack seems to do a lot more damage than his cheat attack. Still not doing all that great. Ah, oh, there we go. I must have gotten a better uh, cheat sheet than he did. He must have got the choice of finishing move. Flair Man wins. You pointed him. Indeed, I did. Rumble. Let's try that again. It's really not difficult to win this once you have to cheat. There we go. Let's see what one of the other tricks is. Larman wins the match. Game over, man. We won. Ha! Huh. Lucky can a guy get? That was pure luck! Jeez! Where's my money? I hope he's good for it. Here. 
Now if I were you, I'd make myself scarce, you little lump of phlegm. Otherwise I'm gonna lose my temper and all that's gonna be left of you is teeth and toenails. Well, he may be a jerk, at least he's an honest jerk. He gave us the money, which means we can finally afford a room and get a good night's sleep. I mean, what else are you going to do on this planet? Hey, the robot is also going into uh, the end. Yet now there's no sign of him. Hey, these two guys are still there. All right, let's uh, pay this guy and get uh, a room. Let's hope the room will be a bit decent. Okay, son, you just scribble your old Bill Shatner on the register screen, and I'll get your key card. As fine a room as you'll find on this orb. You have a brief moment of what you think is cleverness. You decide to wittily sign the name Franzel Niekberm. I don't know why he does that. What reason does he have to hide? Okay, here's your key card. Don't lose it. Room 1220J. Up the elevator. Bronzel Neekberg. If I had a buckazoid for every time I'd seen that name, I'd be sitting pretty. I could afford one of those fancy fur lined donut thingies that. Wait, uh, what was I saying? I have no anyway, idea. Anyway, enjoy your stay. If you need anything, don't hesitate to tell someone. Gee, thanks. Say, could you tell me where. I'm a real busy guy, son. You got any questions, why don't you just go find the Chamber of Commerce and talk to them. I'm sure they'll be glad to help you out. Be seeing ya. Well, he didn't become any nicer. But we now have a uh, key card for the do beam in. Room 1220J. Man, they got a lot of rooms there. It's the key card to your luxurious suite at the charming Dew Beam Inn. The room number is 1220J. I'm not sure I'd apply the words luxurious and charming to this place. Alright, let's uh, go up. Nice graffiti at the back of the elevator. <laughs> Wait, an electronic cat zapping mice. I guess they did that because it was the thing that made the least possible sense. He missed one. Great carpet. This is definitely no place to lose a contact lens. Well, it's not quite as bad as the carpet in La Costa Lada in Leisure Suit Larry. I was trying to look at the mouse. That bores me so. Oh, I'm sorry. Hey. Can't read that one, but it does look like something you once read in a fortune cookie. It's actually Katakana, one of the Japanese scripts. And it says, Sierra, Japan. Isn't that cute? Also, the Tyrell Corporation. <laughs> what the hell are they doing here? Well, I guess we had Blade Runner, so why not? A sign in the hazy distance indicates the presence of some huge conglomerate. The window offers you a prime view of the baby spew brown skyline of polysorbate 60. Another dead plant. Maybe they're supposed to look that way, but this plant looks like it was dead and buried a long time ago. And then somebody dug it up and put it in this pot, I guess. Well, um, there's our room. 
Our luxury suite? It's the hotel's not-so-elegant upstairs hallway. They look more like cell doors than hotel room doors. It's kind of a Motel 3 meets Riker's look. Charming, I'm sure. Well, we'll uh, go inside our room and see what uh, fun can be had in there in the next video. Welcome back. We made it into uh, the inn. Finally, we're able to get the money together. And there's our room. I wonder what happens if you try and get into another door, by the way. They're as strong as they are tacky looking. You're not getting through one of those without an invitation. That's delightfully non-helpful. I guess so. You Take summon rat. the ability to leave it alone. The hell? It's those guys from the lobby! Hey there, pal. Got a second. Me and my friend here was wondering something. Fire away. What did you, you want to know? Well, we was wondering if you'd have any objection to us pounding you senseless. Um, yes? Grab them and let's get moving. I gotta report in soon. You puny little scumbag. I can't believe anyone would want you. One thing's for sure, you sure ain't gonna be seeing your home son ever again. Hey, Nigel, let's get back to it, huh? We got things to do and places to go. Now, just sit there and be still and be quiet, little man. I've got some things to finish before I finish you. Well, this seems to be another fine mess we've gotten ourselves into. I wonder if they were actually looking for us or for somebody named Franzel Nikburn. Because if it's the latter, that would be like the biggest coincidence ever. Let's see um, where we are and what all this weird stuff here is. You have no idea where this place is, but it's nice to see that grunge has finally hit the interior decorating industry. Well, at least from the looks of things, we're still on fully Soviet 60. Unless there's another um, weird looking planet like this somewhere. It's a short pile polystyrene rug with the ubiquitous have a cyclopean day symbol. It's a one-eyed smiley. You have no idea where this place is. Yeah. A basketball heat hoop. You don't know what that is, but you keep seeing it above people's garage doors. It must be some sort of anti-theft device. Not quite. This symbol is all the rage among teenagers in the quadrant. None of the adults knows what it means, but it's shorthand for no sign of life. I guess that's clever. It looks like the lead singer for that new death metal band, the disgruntled Postal Workers. There's probably actually a band named that. Wouldn't be surprised. It's Kathy Meyerland, an attractive model with gills from one of those stinky swamp-like planets like Madoria. Or Slimeon, or Muxalon 4. Who names the planets in this universe? It's Cindy Crawfish, a beautiful merwoman and spokesmodel from one of those beach strewn, wimpy, watery planets like Aquaria, or Oceana, or Wateria. Wateria? Real original there. It's the popular pin up alien Krill McPherson. The one that poses all over Time Pods in Space Piston Magazine. That's a Just reference. Just watch that McPherson strut. Um, that's actually a reference to the um, Space Quest 4 manual, which was the Space Piston Magazine. Which indeed had a picture of the Time Pod in it, with a girl looking much uh, like this draped over it. 
I thought it was the triple-breasted horror of Rod Con 6 myself. This little unit is a portable dehumidifier. When you're a guy like Singent, who sweats like a bicranial crud snorter, you need one of these things going all the time. I guess so. That's Singent, by the way. It's one of those wads of lard you ran into at the inn. This optical disc-based multimedia entertainment system has a slew of powerful graphics and audio coprocessors. A unique flexible architecture is extremely high priced and plays a half dozen really bad arcade games. It's called a 3DOA. Another jab at the old 3DO. I thought it was a PlayStation 3 myself, but anyway. How groovy. They've got a neon sign for Spore Beer. Spore yourself a tall, frosty one. With a pun like that, how can you not buy it? Teddy Schmuckspin, a popular children's toy, sits on the floor. If you weren't a popular child, you didn't get one. Oh, so that's what that means. You have no idea where this place is. Uh, I want to look at the ducky. You have no idea. Apparently you can't. This alien woman looks to be in very bad shape. Her pupils are fixed and dilated. Her body is stiff, almost as if she's dead. And her skin looks tight and puffy, as if bodily gases are building up inside her. Bandages and patches appear in profusion all over her, and some of her seams look like they're about to give way. You make a mental note to come back and rescue this poor woman. Um, Roger, I think that's kind of pointless. And it's a poster of Elvis. A beautiful thick shag carpet of pelvis Brelsford, the rock and roll programming sensation, adorns the east wall of this grungy apartment. That's actually a carpet. What's it doing on the wall? Should be on the floor, I guess. They ripped off an alien crossing sign. How sophomoric. Alien crossing. Due to the planetary location of this unit, it can't keep a steady picture for very long. And, as is universally known, the local cable company will get around to fixing it at their convenience. And who knows, you might get lucky and get another shopping channel or country western station in the process. Interesting looking table. Clever! They're using an old video cable spool as a table. Gee, don't let any college kids hear about this. They'll all want to do it. Ear cans. That's one of those devices for catching wayward audio-video signals from distant galaxies. You once saw a horribly violent transmission on one of these, where strange-looking aliens mercilessly struck each other in vulnerable areas, while others looked on in enjoyment. It was called America's Funniest Home Videos, or something like that. Man, I haven't seen that in ages. I'd like to keep it that way. But I was trying to look at the beer cans, but apparently you can't. What does he have at the back of his neck? It looks like a plug receptor. How interesting. We saw um, this guy put a keycard up here on this nail, on what I guess is a fridge or something. You have no idea where this... It's the key ring that doofus hung on the wall after the other doofus left. Or just a wall, I guess. Let's see if we can get that. Ooh, clever. Hey, what the fu- I don't want to see you move another inch or I'm gonna slice you into nice little bite-sized pieces. Now can it? Well, that didn't, uh, that didn't go over well. A nail protrudes from the wall. How novel. Oh, if we can't get the key, maybe the nail will help. You are now a proud nail owner. You never know when that comes in handy. Oh, I guess they took away all of our other possessions. Including the dreadful fish, thank god. Good thinking! 
The nail proves to be just what you needed to free yourself from those handcuffs. Don't get all excited, little Red Riding Hood. You aren't out of those woods yet. Indeed. Can we change the channel? You summon the ability. No. Can we attack this guy? What do you want to do? Give him a nice massage? Wise up! This guy values you less than Starcon does. We can't get through the door without the key card, I guess. You're reasonably certain that this door won't budge without a key card of some sort. Can we do something with that plug? What do you want to do? Give him a. I guess not. Can we talk to him? What are you going to talk to him about? The weather? I don't know. We have been having some dreadful we uh, weather lately, so. Now what you actually do need to do here is incredibly not obvious. <laughs> I guess the only real way you could find out is by clicking on everything in the uh, room. What is it, this stuff you can't actually do anything with? Her skin feels puffy and rubbery, as if her internal body pressure has risen. It must be Regalian Bladderwort Fever. Or alternatively, she's a blow-up doll. I'm Roger Wilco of the SCS Deep Ship 86. Can I get you anything? Water? Food? Uh, some duct tape? Armor all? Are you okay? Y you look bloated. <laughs> Fortunately, he didn't seem to hear that. Nor that. He must be deaf. That's delightful. Can we talk to the posters? Your words are so... No. What you actually do need to do... is... take uh, this thing, the pelvis rug, which requires two clicks, apparently. Pick it up. Now what do we do with it? Can we smack him over the head? It probably seemed like a good idea to you at one time. Indeed it did. No, what you actually need to do with it... Well, it's a carpet, so of course you put it on the floor. You carefully lay the rug on the floor. Even though you were never known for your interior decorating talents, you feel very satisfied with the location you have chosen. And as if it was a perfectly obvious thing to do, Roger will dance on it. Your body is now carrying a nice static charge. Oh, I hate that. I always get zapped when I touch a counter. But let's see if we can't zap uh, this guy's plug here. Wow, the static energy you built up discharged, frying Lard Boy's circuitry. Did you actually think of that, or was it just luck? I really don't see how anybody could have actually thought of that. The only real, the only way you could possibly <laughs> encounter this solution is by clicking on everything until this happens, basically. It is genuinely obscure. Well, now that we've taken care of this uh, uh, dude, I guess we'll continue in the next video. Welcome back! We managed to uh, take out this guy. Not much going on there, eh? Which is a good thing. And he had that uh, key card on him, which I guess we'll need. Smooth move. You've got his key ring. Oh, that's not what I meant. It's that Lard Master's key ring. Indeed it is! Um, let's take a look at the desk, actually. There seems to be a small pile of CD-ROM sitting here. 
Interesting. There seems to be... See what we've got there. Your search through the CDs reveals a bunch of typically boring multimedia magazines. A multimedia phone book. Too bad there aren't any phones around here. Too bad. The Outpost Project Survival Guide. Is that a reference to Sierra's game Outpost? Successful people managing techniques by Carm Trebus. Funny, it's empty. I guess he wasn't so successful. MF DOS for idiots, morons, and feebs. Touring Xenon on five buckazoids a day. By the way, you do actually need to do this. This is not just to get funny messages. It isn't like uh, some of these things. Discovering your inner maggot. Right. How to become a sign to being a corporate creative genius without really trying. Hmm, this might be worth checking out. It's a copy of popular Tektronics. See, we actually took one. You should have paid attention the first time. This game's budget is way too small to allow me to list all those titles over again. Wait, why would that have cost money? Um, there's actually also something on the on top of the humidifier, which I didn't look at before. It's a burlesque modi. A modi. Now, if you remember, um, in uh, implants and stuff, we found out that a modi is apparently something that allows you to alter somebody's behavior. You now possess the modi. And it seems that it would plug into uh, these ports on the back of their uh, of the, their necks. It's a burlesque modi. Indeed, it is. It's a bur. So, um, we also have the uh, CD-ROM, which strangely has holes in it. It's a somewhat damaged CD-ROM disc. Somebody tried to eat it, or what? I guess we could use that computer thingy, the 3DOA, to... Uh... Uh, read that. From data quarter to homing beacon. That sounds useful. If only we still had our data quarter. What the hell is that on the wall, by the way? Way too disgusting. That is true. This optical disc-based multimedia entertainment system, it's called... We already got that description before. We'll see uh, if we can read that, if we can get our uh, data quarter back, and we can make a homing beacon so people can find us and, and come and rescue us and stuff. Make a time machine out of DeLorean. That also sounds very interesting. Let's see. From data quarter to homing beacon, fast. Yes, you too can make a homing beacon from simple household goods. Chief among the devices you can use is the data quarter, which, with a few adjustments, sends out a powerful signal to potential rescuers who could be light years away. First, open your data quarter. In uh, open your data quarter. Inside, you'll find chips, IRK settings, and plates. If you correctly alter these settings, you'll soon be home by the fire with a cup of nog. Of course, any mistakes could result in a barbecue with you as the entree. But let's not worry about that. We'll describe the details in the next issue. Hmm. Well, that's annoying. Can we print this? It does nothing. Can we read any of the other things? Email shopping with no buckazoids. E-shop with absolutely nothing in the accounts. It's easy, when you know the system. First, random gen approximately 32 4x4 numbers and pick a month in the year. These will be your challenge change charge cards. Make up a name, not Nickburn, please, and start calling e catalog stores. The idea is to make the calls fast and give them a challenge card numbers before they can trace the call. As most hackoids know, there are so many cards out there that the probability of one of your challenge cards being a used number is practically 100%. Remember, don't skimp. You're spending other people's buckazoids, so go for it. Always nice when they print stuff on how to uh, be a criminal. 
Mired Emag, hot journalism or hot air? We've all heard the, heard the hype. Mired Emag is the hottest, hippest, hip hoppiest thing to happen to journalism since Gutenberg invented that big printer thingy. Also known as the printing press. But this is. But is it the Emag of the future, or is it just another Cyber Vogue knockoff with some fancy schmancy art? You be the judge. The last issue features an article on smart drug stores on Celine Dion. A list of the latest techno gibberish. And a review of Waterworld. Are these subjects cool, or do they leave you cold? Definitely the latter. It's just about as far from cool as you could possibly get. Make a time machine out of a DeLorean. I want to be able to do that. Chances are that you're too young to remember a quaint little movie about a fellow named Marty McFly, but he and his friend Doc started a trend that has become a popular pursuit among time-traveling hobbyists, making time machines out of DeLorean cars. DeLoreans aren't easy to find these days. They went out of fashion when John DeLorean went in the slammer. But if you have the, l the luck to come across one of these babies, the universe and all its time zones, and we mean all its time zones, can be yours. Happy hunting! Well, I guess it's a better looking design for a time machine than that, uh, uh, overgrown silver tennis shoe thing that we had in Space Force 4. This is such a useful magazine. Again, it doesn't actually tell you how to do it, just that you can. Great Scott. In search of the elusive multiple organism. I see what, what you did there. Since the dawn of time, men and women have searched for the multiple organism. Some say that it is just a myth. Others claim that it existed at one time, but that the effects of toxic waste, pollution and electromagnetic forces throughout the universe have made the multiple organism extinct. This writer for one has searched all her adult life for the excitement of contact with one of these elusive creatures. The thought of seeing a multiple organism sends a thrill through me. I hope with my entire essence that multiple organisms do exist on some level, and that one day I may meet up with one of them just to say hi. Man, the subtext in here is thick. Um, uh, I think that's all, yes. We don't actually need to print anything, nor can you actually print anything. So, um, let's just turn this thing off. I think we need to eject to do that. No. It does nothing until you... The room's... Either that or someone downstairs is using a pro shiatsu. Wait, I missed the first part. The room seems to be vibrating very slightly. This would probably indicate a damping field in operation somewhere close by. Either that or someone downstairs is using a pro shiatsu. Right. Um... Anything else useful on the table? Surprisingly, it's a pile of books. Who'd have thought these guys could read? Not me. This is the data quarter you got from that endodroid hunter dude. Aha! Uh -huh. That is a good thing. Because we just read that it is possible to turn a data quarter into a homing beacon. So let's uh, take a look at it. This is the data quarter you got from that endodroid hunter dude. Yes, we already knew that. Now, normally it is apparently a scanner, but much like Star Trek's tricorder, they can be reconfigured to do anything. I'm just opening them up and switching some chips around. If you screw up, you can just click this button, it will reset it to its original state. Although I don't really see why you'd need to do that. So let's see. 
Well, like the uh, article said, we have a bunch of uh, plates. Which are these things? On each plate is a chip. And each of the plates uh, is mounted in a sensor array. These are the A through E thingies. It's a circuit board, and a darn good one. And they also each have an IRK setting. Captain, there be switches here. These are IRK switches. Only one switch for each sensor array may be on at any time. And only one IRK switch of each number 1, 3, 5, 7, and 9 may be on at any time. It hurts your eyes to look at that. In fact, you feel a major headache coming on. I guess Roger is not the electronics type. This is the Tachyon transmitter plate, hence the awesome TT moniker. Good to know. This is the Dentium chip. Dentium? Clever. This is the particle shield plate, hence the helpful PS appellation. This is the Repentium chip. Are they all going to be like that? This is the subspace emitter plate, hence the handy SE abbreviation. This is the fermentium chip. This is the recalibrating fluctuator plate, hence the always lovely RF tag. How many ways can they find to uh, describe an abbreviation? This is the Dimtel chip. This is the feedback cutter offer plate, hence the clever FC label. This is the Spentium chip. What's this? A crystal of some sort? This is the data quarter power source. A tiny chip of Devalium crystal. The official power source of Starcon. Good to know. You can actually remove all of these. And then we have to figure out how to uh, reconfigure this so that it becomes a homing beacon. But unfortunately, the information for that was not in that uh, popular Tektronix magazine. So where can we find it? Well, I know where we can. In the next video. Welcome back. We found a helpful, uh, well, not so helpful article in popular Tektronix that stated that we could turn this data quarter into a um, homing beacon, which would be a useful thing if we want to get rescued. Unfortunately, the actual information on how to do that was not in the magazine. Now the thing is, that information was supposed to be in the game, but like I told you um, in the first video, the original designer of this game George Mandel uh, left to be replaced by Scott Murphy. Apparently, the uh, story goes that they uh, met up somewhere uh, after the game had been finished and they were getting ready to ship it, and Josh uh, asked if uh, they put that really uh, clever comic strip he designed into the game, and Scott answered well, no, uh, we didn't. We didn't. We couldn't really figure out uh, what it was for, so we scrapped it. To which Josh replied, "But then, how can anybody uh, solve the the data quarter puzzle?" To which Scott said, "Oh shit! Is that what that was for?" So yeah, they hurriedly put the information necessary to solve this puzzle in the manual. It was not intended to be uh, copy protection, they simply forgot to put the necessary hints in the actual game. I have no idea how this um, was not caught in playtesting. This means that they did not have anybody test the finished product who did not know the answer to this puzzle. Which seems bizarre. Anyway, it's not as if Sierra is known for thoroughly testing their games. So the information we need to solve this puzzle is in the manual. It doesn't just give, uh, give you the solution though, it actually gives you hints based on which you can solve the puzzle. So let's take a look. Homing Beacon Puzzle. 
Opening up the data quarter, and who doesn't have one by now, displays a grid of five squares. There are five sub-circuit plates that can be moved from square to square. Each of the five sub-circuit plates has a jumper that can be moved to any of five IRK settings. IRK1, IRK3, IRK5, IRK7, and IRK9. And a socket to accept any of five chips, the spenium, the denium, the rapenium, the fermenium, and the dimtel. The squares that the plates fit into are called the sensor arrays A to E. The player must figure out which plate goes into which sensor array square, A through E, insert the correct chips into each plate's socket, assign the correct IRK jumper number to each plate. All five plates are needed to create the homing beacon. We know that the feedback cutter offer and tachyon transmitter plates need to follow certain configuration rules explained herein. But some confusion about the remaining plates, recalibrating fluctuator, subspace emitter and particle shield still exists. Of these three, we know that A. One must be placed at sensor array E, B. One of the others must be set at IRK1, C. The remaining one uses the spenium chip. We do know for sure that 1. The tachyon transmitter could use the denium chip and should not be placed at sensor array C. 2. The particle shield should not be placed at sensor array E. 3. The subspace emitter should not use IRK7. 4. The recalibrating fluctuator should be placed at sensor array A and be set to IRK9. 5. The feedback cutter offer won't work with the fermenium chip and should not go in sensor array B or C. 6. The plate that uses IRK3 also uses the Dimtel chip. 7. The plate in sensor array D must be set to IRK5. So, that gives you uh, the hints for the uh, puzzle. And it also gives you uh, a worksheet on the right there, uh, partially printed here. It actually continues down the rest of the page. Which you can use to uh, stripe off various options. I've reproduced this worksheet here in a slightly more readable form. And this will allow me to show you how you can solve this puzzle. It's basically a simple process of elimination using the rules we are given. So let's start with the first rule. The tachyon transmitter should use the denium chip and should not be placed at sensor array C. Well, what we can then do is, under the tachyon transmitter, we can um, eliminate all of the chips except the denium and eliminate sensor array C, like that. In addition, because we know that the tachyon transmitter uses the denium chip, none of the others can use that one, so we can eliminate that one for all of the others. Then, the second rule. The particle shield should not be placed at sensor array E, meaning that we can eliminate sensor array E for the particle shield. Pretty simple. Number three was the subspace emitter should not use IRK7. Again, just uh, Eliminate number 7 from the subspace emitter. Not much else you can do uh, with those rules. The recalibrating fluctuator should be placed at sensor array A and be set to IRK9. Well, this is actually a very nice rule because it allows us to eliminate all of the other um, sensor arrays and um, IRK numbers for the fluctuator. And of course, now that we know that the recalibrating fluctuator uses IRK9 and sensor array A, we can eliminate those from all of the others. Rule number five was the feedback cutter offer won't work with the fermenium chip and should not go in sensor array B or C. So again, we can just um, eliminate those options. And number six is a little more vague. The plague that uses IRK3 also uses the Dimtel chip. However, we don't yet have any plate that has um, either IRK3 or the Dimtel chip for sure. However, we do know that the tachyon transmitter does not use the Dimtel chip, therefore it can also not use IRK3. Conversely, a recalibrating fluctuator does not use IRK3, therefore it cannot use the Dimtel chip. Just applying the inverse of this rule. We can stripe those off. Rule number seven, then. The plate in sensor array D must be set to IRK5. Unfortunately, there's nothing we can do with that at this point. 
So let's look at the uh, other rules, which apply to the particle shield, the subspace emitter, and the recalibrating fluctuator. It says that one of, of those must be placed at sensor array E. Well, we already know that the particle shield and the recalibrating fluctuator cannot be placed at uh, sensor array E, therefore it must be the subspace emitter. So we can eliminate all of the others. And of course, we can eliminate E from all of the other plates because now we know which one uh, uses sensor array E. Then if we go back to uh, rule number 7, it says that the plate in sensor array D must be set to IRK5. And now, b by eliminating E, we know that the uh, feedback cutter offer has been assigned sensor array D, so it must also use IRK5. And then, of course, we can cross off 5 from all of the remaining uh, plates. Rule number 6 tells us, again, that um, IRK3 and the Dimtel chip are linked, and now we have an additional, uh, uh, additional plate that cannot use IRK3, namely the feedback color offer, so that one cannot use the Dimtel chip, so we can cross that off. Let's go back to these rules. Once again, um, one of them had to be placed at sensor array E, and that was the uh, subspace emitter. The next one says one of the others must be set at IRK1, so that's either the particle shield or the recalibrating fluctuator. And we know that the fluctuator cannot be placed at IRK1, so that must be the particle shield, so we can eliminate the other options there. And of course, we can strive off the one from uh, all of the others which uh, fixes the IRK number for the subspace emitter at 3. The final uh, rule in this set is the remaining one uses the Spenium chip, which therefore must be the recalibrating fluctuator. So we can cross off those others, and cross off the Spenium everywhere else. And that leaves the uh, Repenium for the feedback color offer, so we could cross that off at the subspace emitter. And rule number six again tells us that IRK3 and the Dimtel chip go together, so now we know that that must be the subspace emitter. So we can cross off the Dimtel at the remaining particle shield, giving us the fermenium for that one. And there we have it, the solution. Well, now that we have the solution, we can simply uh, apply it. We now know that we have to put the uh, Tachyon transmitter in uh, sensor array A, and put the uh, Spenium chip on it, and set it to IRK9. Then we uh, put the. Oh, wait, actually, I'm doing that wrong. Sorry. The recalibrating fluctuator goes there. Tachyon transmitter actually goes in sensor array B with the uh, Denium chip on IRK7. Then the particle shield goes in sensor array C with the Fermenium chip on IRK1. The um, feedback cutter offer goes in D with the Repenium chip on IRK5, and then the uh, the final one, I've forgotten where I was, this is the, the subspace emitter, with the Dimtel chip goes here, and it is set to IRK3. Now, if we've done that correctly, we should turn it on, and yes, it's a homing beacon. There seems to be something stopping the data quarter from transmitting. Hmm, maybe it's that damping field that the, uh, uh... narrator mentioned when we tried to touch the building. I guess we need to get out of the damping field then for this plan to work. Oh, well, let's see if we can go through this door. Unfortunately, that probably means that we have to contend with the, uh, second dude. But we'll, uh cross that bridge when we get to it. First, let's see if we can actually get through the door with this keycard. I don't see why not. 
Well, 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 the worm is out of the hole. So, you have to ask yourself, do I feel lucky? Well, do I punk? You're doing it wrong. Well, it seems he isn't gonna bother us as long as we don't bother him, which is a good thing. We'll see if we can take this punk out. Hopefully in a more logical way than by dancing on a carpet and zapping him in the next video. Welcome back! We've escaped one of the thugs, but unfortunately the other one is still in our way. Fortunately though, it doesn't look like he's going to harm us as long as we don't bother him. I guess he doesn't seem to think that us escaping while he's around is in any way realistic. And, well, if you were in his shoes facing somebody who looks like Roger, wouldn't you think exactly the same thing? I know I would. Anyway, since we're still alive, let's look around a little bit. This appears to be some sort of control room. There's a landing platform beyond the damping field induction coils in the archway. Aha! Uh -huh. A damping field, eh? The archway glows with the energy of a damping field. No wonder it's so humid in here. Yeah, because the outside air really looks a lot better. The cityscape stretches like an immense pestilent rash across the puckered, festering face of Polysorbate 60. Ah, pretty. No need to get quite so florid, uh, there, narrator. Anyway, it seems a damping field stands between us and freedom, because it is what prevents the homing beacon from working. So if we just walk to the outside, I'm sure we'll be home free, no problem whatsoever. Yeah. If you didn't see that coming, you weren't paying attention. Let's look at some of the stuff in this room. It's the one called Nigel, the larger of the two mass-laden brothers. Nigel and Stringent. Nice pair. He's got some kind of computer console here. Looks like it's playing, uh, showing a computer game, but anyway. A massive subspace neurotransmitter fills the desk. Amplified by brainwave patterns, neurotransmissions are not affected by local damping fields. But you already knew that, right? Of course. You think I'm stupid? I guess that means he can transmit uh, whatever the hell he wants to transmit, even though there's a damping field. This controller controls the controls on the subspace neurotransmitter. Jeez, is this guy a control freak or what? Seems like it. Wow, that's a signed poster of the lead singer for that country western band, Hall and Az. Nice name for a band. It's just another picture of a heavenly body. That's the kind of pun I'd expect the narrator in a Larry game to make. This looks like a giant battery. This monomine oxidase inhibitor brightens up an otherwise depressing room. Sure, why not? A small decorative novelty lamp displays bolts of electronic discharge. They were quite the rage a century or two ago. Yeah, I remember those. Another one of those formerly trendy bolt discharge lamps sits on the console top. I guess Nigel likes them. What's in these boxes? Anything that can help us? The carton is full of spare parts and tools to keep the subspace neurotransmitter in operation. An acetylcholine torch, a bunch of axon terminals, a cell receptor, and a new package of postsynaptic membranes. Warning to phenyl ketoneurix contains phenyl alanine. That would be a very useful warning, if I knew what any of those words meant. Is there anything in that box we might be able to use? The room seems to be vibrating ever so slightly. The telltale residue of a local damping field. I'm trying to click the box. The room seems... 
appears to be very hard. You poke around and look for something useful, but since you're not exactly Mr. Subspace Neurotransmitter Repair Guy, none of it appeals to you. Nope, doesn't look like it. This box is full of daddies. Daddies are modules which, when inserted into intracranial slots, give the user complete knowledge of whatever topic is programmed into that particular daddy. That's a good idea. We can use one of these modis to teach Wilco Kung Fu. Then we can take out this guy. Dude! You rummage around in the box to look for something useful, but all you find is an almost complete set of line dancing in zero-G daddies. Only volume two, the achy breaky, appears to be missing. Why would he have that? No, on second thought, I don't want to know. Well, only one box left. Hopefully that one will be a little bit uh, more helpful. A box of modies, behavioral modification, Euro circuit chips lies under the desk. Again with the modies. I guess we could trade those with uh, Fester. If we could get there, which we can't, so... Why did I say that? Anything useful in there? You poke and prod amongst the modies until you find... a modi labeled Churlish. Being intrigued by the word, you glom it. Incidentally, you might want to look up the word churlish before you do anything stupid. Okay, well, let's look up the word churlish then. Uh-huh. It's an adjective, and it means rude in a mean-spirited and surly way. Good to know. Well, we already saw, saw that uh, Stringent, the other guy, had a plug that's presumably for these modis in his neck. So, I'm guessing this guy has one too. Now we have two modis. One that's burlesque, the results of which all be interesting. And one that's churlish, which is unlikely to improve his uh, uh, personality. Let's try it out anyway. Wow, he really creased your can. Pretty impressive. Maybe not from your point of view, of course. I don't know. I think Roger uh, has really learned to appreciate a good death scene over the past six games. Okay, well, like I said, didn't really improve his disposition. Let's try the burlesque Marty. That ought to be interesting. It would appear that merging those two items is not a good idea. It would appear that Nigel is smarter than to accept a modi that has the word burlesque on it. Must be smarter than he looks then. But if you look closely, it looks like the label on this modi is kind of loose. Maybe we can uh, free it from its uh, adhesive. The corner of the label in this modi seems to be loose. Well, that worked. That allows us to disguise the burlesque modi as the churlish modi, so maybe then he'll accept it, and hopefully that will render him less of a threat. Gotta be interesting in any case. Thinking it was the churlish Muddy, he pops it in place. Thanks, Sierra. Now I'm scarred for life. <sighs> They must have sat down in the designer's room and basically went to each other. We had Roger in drag in Space Quest 4. What can we do to top that? Congratulations, you managed it. If you uh, look carefully, there's something on the floor here that was not there before. I guess um, he dropped it during his striptease act. It has a couple of things attached to it. 
all. Apparently it's something that has things attached to it. It's actually a belt, but anyway. Let's see what it has attached to it, then. It's Nigel's belt, complete with a damping field actuator and a nifty personal grooming assistant. Okay, well, at least the uh, personal grooming assistant is going to be useful. No, wait, I mean the damping field actuator. Let's uh, take a closer look. Oh man, that thing needs cleaning! This is a personal grooming assistant. A well-used personal grooming assistant. Come on, what? Why is there a mouth icon here? Can we talk to it? Considering the state of it, I wouldn't be too surprised if it talks back. You start to say something and then you remember... Th no. Why is the mouth a oh, icon available here? I don't think you can actually do anything with it. Would have been a good opportunity for... Uh, a taste message, but anyway. Okay, well, let's uh, unhand it from the uh, belt, as well as the damping field actuator, which we can actually use. So, let's see if we can use the damping field actuator to uh, actuate the damping field, I guess. It probably seemed like a. I guess I need to. Yeah. Yay! Damping field! We're home free! Now we just gotta jump off this terrace. Boy, this terrace is a nice change from the stink-laden confines of that apartment. It sure is. We still don't have a way to get out of here. Wait a second, didn't we have a homing beacon? Hmm, why isn't anybody coming to get us then? And who were those two guys anyway? Were they working from the la for the lady in the abandoned warehouse in the introduction? What did they want with Roger? What does Fronzel Nikberm uh, have to do with any of this? And whatever happened to Spike, by the way? The answer of all of these questions will be given... Well, sometime, I guess. I can tell you this, though. It won't be in the next video. Welcome back! We made it outside, but nobody's coming to get us. What about our homing beacon? Well, I guess that's because it's not turned on. So let's turn it on, see if something happens. Hopefully somebody will come to get us. Hopefully somebody is on our side. Yes, it worked! Hey! Here's your fish! Uh... Thanks? What's with the fish? I'm sure it's just a red herring. Stellar, you picked up my homing signal. Uh, I can't believe I actually made it work. Now no one can say I spent a little bit too much free time in the bathroom with Popular Tektronics. Popular Tektronics? Who are you trying to kid? I know what you were... reading in there. What was that voice, Roger? I thought I heard something. Pay no attention, Stellar. It was probably just a mechanical flatulence from the ship. What fourth wall? Anyway, we received a transmission from a nearby Starcon communications monitoring platform. They told us of some unusual signal originating from the area of polysorbate 60. We dialed it in, scanned the coordinates, and found you. So what are you doing in this sector, Stellar? I thought you were stationed on the SCS Heinz 57. I am. I had some leave accumulated and decided to take it. Uh, this is kind of embarrassing for me. I actually came to see you. I've been thinking about you a lot lately, and I was curious about what you'd been up to, so I decided to visit. And when I arrived here, I found you had just left for shore leave on polysorbate. 
I decided to follow you down and try and catch up with you. When I got to that dump of an inn and found you'd been kidnapped by those thugs, I searched around but could find no trace of where they'd taken you. That certainly is a strange place. No kidding. I decided to beam back up to the deep ship and try to locate you through your transport communicator signal. When I'd returned, I found you'd left it up here on the ship. I didn't know what to do then until that call came through from the Starcon installation. You're a lucky man, Wilco. Uh, yeah. I, I guess I am. If you hadn't gotten there when you did, I'd probably be a victim of some serious cement poisoning after those geeks chucked me off that balcony. Terrace. What? Well, actually, it was a terrace. Whatever. Whatever. Thanks, Stellar. I sure owe you a big one. I'd sure like to collect that sometime. But let's talk about you and me. Perhaps I could take you to dinner sometime soon. When did Roger get popular with the ladies? I'd like that, Stellar. I'd like that a lot. The thing is that I kind of have a kind of a relationship with another, and I wouldn't feel very comfortable about that. I mean, it, it wouldn't be fair to her. You understand? Not to mention the fact I'd be wearing my sphincter for a necklace if Beatrice ever found out. I hope you do understand, Stellar. I like you. I, I think I even more than like you. I, I don't know where I got this inordinate sense of loyalty toward Beatrice. I believe the word that explains that is fear. Pound sand, pal. Please know that, were the situation any different, I'd be making that date with you right now. Oh, I see. Friends, co-workers, buddies. That's all this is gonna be. I guess I knew it somewhere inside. I just didn't want to believe it. I guess I admire your trueness of heart, however misplaced. But I feel much more inclined to damn you for it. I know, that's selfish, but it's how I feel. I must admit it shows something more about you, more depth of character than I gave you credit for, Wilco. Well, I'm patient, if you ever have a change of heart. Well, Roger, uh, we, should, uh, we should see what we can find out about those subhuman walking dumpsters that had such a keen interest in you. I don't suppose you heard their names. No, uh, but I did get this neat personal grooming assistant. It needs a little cleaning, but... That's great, Roger. Don't clean it, though. Take it to the sick bay. There's a DNA analyzer there. We can scan the contents and perhaps use the results to get some names and information about these guys. Good thinking, Stellar. I probably would have thought of it, eventually. Sure. Yeah, I'm sure you would have, Roger. Look, I've got to go to sick bay and get some treatment from my back after that not-so-graceful rescue. Oh, yeah, that. Uh, sorry. Well, uh, I'll see you there. By the way, if you don't know who Stellar is, don't worry, you didn't miss anything. Commander, I am receiving a message from Starcon. Computer on screen. Hello, Commander Kilbasa. I have a new directive for Deep Ship 86. It's the Admiral from our trial. This is actually a special request from me, Commander. As you may know, I served with Admiral Blundfang during the Fallopian Campaign. Admiral Blunfang's widow is involved in building an off-world retirement community. They are almost finished, but have requested assistance from Deep Ship 86. Commander, 
Please extend her every courtesy. You know, if things go well, this would not look too bad in your personnel file. I will let Sharpay, the Admiral's widow, explain further. Hello, Commander Kilbasa. As Admiral Toolman mentioned, we have almost completed our project here, but could use Starkhan assistance. To be honest, Commander, I pulled a few strings, but this is an important mission, I assure you. Since you are scheduled to be present for the dedication of the Golden Light Years Retirement Center anyway, I hoped you might alter your travel plans to accommodate an earlier arrival. From the information provided me by my old friend, the Admiral, you would be able to warp here within a few hours. I require some assistance from your ship, as well as one of your crew members. Allow me to explain. Well, that's not ominous at all. Meanwhile, back in sick bay. In Space Quest 12. That's an interesting way of intraship, uh, intraship uh, transportation. Well, well, well. I'd say something highly suspicious is going on here because if I'm not mistaken, and I'm not because I've played this game before, the lady who just uh, contacted our captain was the same person from the introduction and possibly the same person who sent those two geeks after us. And literally minutes after her attempt to kidnap Roger fails, she contacts the ship that Roger works on with some kind of weird mission. I don't trust this. I don't trust this at all. One thing though, um, the cutscene established that Roger can apparently hear the narrator, <laughs> and so can Stellar for some reason. So he would know the names of these two dudes, Nigel and Stringent, because the narrator told them, uh, said those names several times. Oh well. I guess he can only hear it when it's convenient to the plot or humorous. You know, rule of funny. And now we're in sick bay where we can scan the uh, hair on the personal grooming assistant with this DNA analyzer, I guess. This is a DNA sequencer. During a starship's travels, many different organisms and artifacts are discovered and a DNA sequencer can come in quite handy in analyzing them. But mostly it just gets used to make sure the food replicators are working properly and not brewing up anything that might hatch and grow inside you, for instance. I would say that's quite important then. And there's Stellar getting her back uh, treated. Stella is getting treatment for her back injury. You should be ashamed of yourself for jumping on her like that, you baby. And yeah, like I said, Stella literally comes out of nowhere. We have no idea where Roger knows her from or what their backstory is, nor do we really get told during uh, the game. It's really just another thing they did to sort of try to erase all the stuff that happened in Space Quest 5. Seems they didn't like Beatrice. And decided to go with uh, a new love interest for Roger. Not, qu not really realistic, I think. I mean, th the fact that one girl in the universe is interested in Roger is already uh, quite bizarre. Anyway, we'll continue in the next video. Welcome back! We're in sick bay. This is the sick bay. All ill or injured crew members are brought here for treatment. 
It seems everyone in a red shirt ends up in here eventually, or at least what's left of them. But, but the captain is wearing a red shirt. Also, wouldn't they usually be better served with a coroner? Who's this guy? Apparently the doctor is way busy as he completely ignores you. But I guess Roger's used to that. Jabba is an interesting looking fellow. That is, if you think a melted purple marshmallow with an internal skeleton is interesting. He's the main research attendant here in the sick bay. Okay. I guess he's some kind of spoof of uh, Jabba the Hutt. It's a medibunk. This is where all ill or injured crew members are treated. It's also where they bring all the guys in the red shirts, or what's left of them, after they've suffered their inevitable calamities. What, well, couldn't think of an, uh, another joke? Many things rest on the center console. Most of them are merely non-functional screen dressing. Pretty cool looking, eh? I'd say so. Stella is getting treatment for her back. Oh. We already saw that message. It's a case of something you don't care about. Looks a bit like the slime from uh, Space Quest 4. Many things rest on the... Oh. It's a scale. No, you can't weigh yourself. Ah. It's a cabinet. There are usually useful things in cabinets. I guess we were blocking the doctor's way. You know, if the, this wasn't an adventure game, I'd think Roger has kleptomania. What did we just pick up? A syringe of morphine. Yeah, that's surely a good thing for Roger to keep around. It's a bottle of morphine. Whatever. Anything else in the cabinet? Don't, don't so. touch that. We don't know where you've been. I guess not. It's the keyboard for the DNA sequencer. So it is, and we need to use that, so let's use that. That's delightfully non-helpful. Oh. I'm sorry, Mr. Wilco. The sequencer is for use by trained personnel only. Obviously, you don't fit that description. I'm afraid I can't allow you to use it. Ah, uh, come on, Jebba. Be a pal. Who'll know? I'm sorry, Mr. Wilco. It's a Starcon regulation. Screw the regulations, I have money. Wait, no I don't. I guess we'd better talk him out of it then. Peace, Jebba. Who's gonna know? Let me try this one thing. I'll be out of your way. No one will find out. I don't know, Mr. Wilco. I'm not one to break regulations. I really don't think it's a good idea. I swear, it'll only take a minute. We're out in the middle of nowhere. No one will find out. And I'll tell you what. Anytime you want it, one free plunge job, day or night. What do you say? Well, I don't know. It'll only take a minute or two, really. Come on, Jebba, be a pal. Well, okay, but just this once. If anyone finds out I'm sunk, then I'll come looking for you to take it out on. Keep that in mind. No problem. I'll be done in a flash. I really don't know why I'm doing this. Neither do I. I guess Roger's actually quite persuasive. Alright. So, let's uh, put the s uh, shaver on the uh, sequencer. Or at least the hair. You are visually... Oh. You display your standard blank stare, but it is unimpressed. I guess so. Well, let's just press the scan button then.
and imprint a data card. Sweet. Now we have a data card. This is the program card you got from sickbay. Now what do we do with it? Is the big question, of course. And the answer to that is that you can actually use that on the uh, control panels that you see all over the ship. So let's do that. Neat. I've always wanted to try one of these on the compost. Yes, they're called composts. Or it automatically does this, actually. Which is kind of nice. This is the DNA pattern of Nigel Rancid. File closed. That's peculiar. Oh, hi, Stellar. I hope your back's feeling better. They just finished treating me, and it is starting to feel better. However, I was told to lay off rescuing people for a while, especially you. So, did you have any luck? I got some information from the sample I ran through the DNA sequencer. When I tried it, all I got was a name. All it said after that was that the file is closed. I wonder why that is. I don't know for sure, Roger, but it seems a bit suspicious. When a file is marked like that, there's usually a very good reason. Most frequently, it indicates the file is closed for intelligence purposes, or it's legally sealed by some judicial body. That seems odd. In the case of those tubs of guts that grabbed you, I'd have to say it's not a government agency directly behind it. it sounds more like someone with access from the outside to a friend or two inside. A more paranoid person might say this smells way wrong. Then again, when did you last change your socks? Stay out of this. If the files are sealed, then we have nothing to go on. True. The only thing I can think of is that they may be accessible by jacking into cyberspace. I've never done it, but I know it can be done. So I guess this means you won't be trying it first. Uh... I mean, I'd love to try it, but I can't, since uh, we don't know how. Well, actually, I read it can be done with the help of a cyber jack and headset, and a cyberspace jack interface module. The article said there are several things to access out there, and that there's a vast library of files to browse. Mostly porn. It said that the Information Superhighway Project is a little behind schedule, but that there are some operative areas. Other than that, I don't have a clue as to how we can gain any information about them. So you think this cyberspace thing could work? Well, I can only tell you what I've read. Navigating it takes a little patience, but I think it's the only option you have. I don't know if you'll locate a cyberjack and headset. Because of the delays in the project, they've become more like collector's items than marketable, functionable products. We do have cyberjack modules built into the compost. Convenient. That's true. Of course, we won't know anyway without the jack. That bites. I wonder where we could find one of those. I wish I knew, Roger. There must be some place. Attention! We are now orbiting the Delta Berxelon 5 colony as requested by Starcon. Most of you know your assignments as they have been broadcast to your composts. Please represent Starcon properly. Kilbasa, out. You better get moving since you don't know yet what your assignment is. I have some checking around to do. We'll talk later. Thanks, Stellar. I'll see you soon. Maybe we can work in that uh, dinner. I thought you weren't interested. It's not the most dignified way to travel. And it's Roger's Quarters! Man, he's a slob. It's actually filled with uh, 
interesting stuff, some of which refers to uh, our previous adventures. Also, a plant that's just as dead as the ones in the hotel. This is a Beetlejuice clamoring hagfish fern. You've tried everything you could think of to get it back to health. Unfortunately, all you could think of to do was to stand over it and say, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. I love that movie. Ordinarily, your closet contains clothes. At the moment, though, you're using your clothes as knickknacks. Yeah, because they're all on the floor. These controls open and close the closet, perform passive handprint IDs to prevent unauthorized entry, monitor its humidity, and scan for moths. Impressive. Can we look in the closet? You never learned how to work these controls. That's why you keep everything that should be in the closet scattered around the room. Ah. You had tickets to see Quasar live in concrete with Beatrice. That was before you got busted back down to janitor and assigned to this dad blasted floating heck hole of a mother talking spaceship. A note, this game has scrupulously avoided any rough language that would result in having to be rated as an adults only computer or video game by the game censorship board of the US Senate subcommittee. A note to those of you who told me that it was supposed to be pronounced Beatrice. Seems the game itself can't decide either. Because Roger says Beatrice, but now the narrator says Beatrice. You've got a Quattro Zebi portable quartz heater set up in here. Must have got cold or something. I don't know. It's a spaceship. Shouldn't it have, like, regulated environment or something? Your kitchen is in here, complete with garbage disposal, solid waste regenerator, and cockroaches. Oh, I guess that's not any more unbelievable than rats on a space station. Your kitchen is in here. Oh. Can we rummage through the trash? Feels clean for once. I guess not. Hey, look, it's our golden mop. Your quarters are cozy and intimate, yet spacious. That's one of the advantages of living in a converted cargo hold. Cool. Holy cow! It's your Golden Mop Award for your feats of daring do in Space Quest 1! You saw this detailed diecast model of an early Starcon Solar Scout in Milky Way today. Starcon's in-flight magazine. It seemed like a great investment at the time. It always does. Can we take it with us? Don't pick it up. You've already broken it several times. Now the port stabilizer flange is out of configuration by 5.2%, which could result in a warp core breach. Now you've done it. You've really done it. I guess not. Electrical outlet, so I look at it. It's a four-socket recursive current subspace grounded socket, devoid of any cords, plugs, or pins. That's going to end well, this, I think. Yep. That went about as well as I expected. You pick strange methods of getting a charge out of life. I do love this try again button. Save so many useless saving. That mop is a piece of your history. You would no sooner carry it around than you would your cigar butt. But we did carry around the cigar butt. This poor dresser hasn't worked right since they hauled it on board. Wait, were you looking at yourself or at the bureau? <laughs> well, same message either way. Points to the narrator. I guess we'll continue looking at all of this stuff in the next video. Welcome back. Roger's quarters are filled to the brim with junk and memorabilia from our previous adventures. Stop whistling. He does that too quickly. This poor dresser hasn't... Wait, no. well... I was, this poor I was wait, trying to look well. at the thing that was on it, but apparently you can't. A window. Somebody told you that Venusian mini-blinds would look good in here. Then again, somebody told you that you look great under fluorescent lights. 
Was that the same person? If so, I guess they're blind. This lovely kryptonite mood lamp casts a cool glow over the room. Also has the side effect of making sure Superman won't break in. Your quarters are cozy. That's one of This headboard contains vital function telemetry modules, full spectrum illumination, and as the ultimate in high tech entertainment. An eight track player with quadraphonic sound. Boy, nothing beats being part of an advanced civilization. I think that glitch was intentional as a reference to the sound quality of A-Track. Feels headboardy. I guess because it is. Can we open the blinds? There's no reason to open the blinds. There's nothing to see out there except billions of the same old strange new worlds, ho-hum new life, and new civilizations, and lots of stupid places for insane death-wishing daredevils to boldly go where no insane death-wishing daredevils have gone before. I guess so. Since the lamp is the main source of illumination in your room, you decide to leave it on. Why do all these starships come with shimmery sheets? What's so futuristic and wonderful about shimmery sheets? They wake you up at night. They're cold and slippery. And the worst thing is getting up every morning with sequins imprinted all over your face. What's up with that? I don't know, Seinfeld. We didn't make this game just so you could crawl into bed and go back to sleep. Be productive. Wait, in a game? Let's get our clothes. You're perfectly comfortable in the pair of pants you're already wearing. And how long has he been wearing it? That's odd, you don't remember having a second pair of pants? Maybe you've got an evil twin from a parallel universe walking around the ship naked. There's a scary thought. These are your boots. Wait a second, you're already wearing your boots. Hmm. This is one of the things I do love about this game. There's so many silly messages. So yeah, unfortunately that does mean we're stuck in this room for quite a while, but anyway. Your quarters are co- uh. That's- Your quarters are- That's- I can't even look at the book. It's a medical no. reference of janitor-specific ailments. Diseases of the janitalia. <laughs> Dear God. <laughs> Now's no time to catch up on your reading. It never is, Roger. You've been meaning to do this laundry for several months. Now it's permanently stuck to the floor. Well, if you wait a bit longer, it might do itself. Picking up your clothes? Damn it, Roger, you're a janitor and not a responsible adult. There's some more items I recognize on the counter here. Wow, it's your official employment rejection letter from Sierra Online at the end of Space Quest 3. It just says, not a chance. And it's signed by Ken Williams. Wait, when did he have time to get, give him that? Hey, here's that pack of matches you stole from the Eulent Splats bar when you returned to Space Quest 1 during the time travel sequence in Space Quest 4. Meet. Hey, here's that pack of... No. This table is supposed to be used for paperwork and gracious dining. Since you do neither, you've found it makes a great place to stash all this junk you've collected over the years. Just trying to look at the damn, uh... Cigar. This table is supposed. This table is. It's a discarded cigar stub from the Galaxy Galleria in Space Quest 4. I thought you discarded that after using it on the lasers, but anyway. Hey, it's the Pocket Pal terminal you filched from an abandoned land speeder on Xenon during Space Quest 4. Neat. Whoa, it's the Star Generator remote control you found aboard the Serian ship during Space Quest 1. This table is supposed to be you. Wow, it's the old translating gadget you used to communicate with the subterranean alien back on the planet Corona in Space Quest 1. And it looks nothing like Too bad the they don't make those little dilithium watch batteries anymore. It looks nothing like the way it did back then, but anyway. This table is supposed to 
Ooh, it's your old auto bucks card from your shopping spree at the Galaxy Galleria after you save the latex babes from that hideous sea slug in Space Quest 4. It's expired, unfortunately, but then you don't need much money aboard the deep ship. Besides, people would talk if they saw you dressed that way again. Thank goodness we're not doing that again. Say it's the old hint book you found in the bargain bin at the software store in Space Quest 4. Looky, it's your old Labion Terror Beast mating whistle from Space Quest 2. Notice how there are no references to Space Quest 5. Why didn't they like this game? I don't know. It was a good game. Can I take any of this stuff? You won't need it. It's reminding you of your inadequacy just fine where it is. The table appears to be... The table appears... You've long since used up all the matches in this book. The cover is lying around as a souvenir. The table appears... Come on. That cigar butt is a piece of your history. You would no sooner carry it around than you would your golden mop. I expected it to say that. The pocket pal will be of no use to you whatsoever. It's AC, and the ship is DC. Now adapter, eh? Unless there happens to be a star generator in the immediate vicinity, this remote won't be of any use to you whatsoever. This thing didn't... And there isn't, so there won't. Good to know. The table appears to be... Don't bother with it. The batteries are dead, and there's no alien language here to translate. You won't be needing the whistle. I didn't think so. You won't need that hint book. You've already won Space Quest 4, haven't you? Why, yes I have. Thanks for asking. You won't need to take the Autobox card. Here on the Deep Ship 86, there's no need for money. Everything's free. Neat. It's kind of like a Royal Caribbean cruise, only without the aerobics classes. Which might be considered a good thing. Sure, go ahead, grab that red-hot spike of quartz, so it'll fuse your hand permanently to the heater. Sounds like a neat idea. Why would they let us zap ourselves in the socket but not do that? Can we unplug it? Sticking your finger in the socket might provide us with a few cheap laughs, but we're above that sort of thing. But only with this socket, not with that one. No, there's nothing behind the poster. Ah. You think about plucking one of the dead brown leaves from the dead brown plant, but that would just be adding insult to injury. Okay, enough fun. There's actually only one thing you can do here, which is use the compost, which appears to be flashing. Wow, a message for me. I must be getting popular. Unlikely. I wonder what it is. Wilco, Commander Kilbasa here. I have a special assignment for you. A crew person of special skills is required on Delta Berxelon 5. In the spirit of Starcon cooperation, we have decided to offer them your assistance. Transport there immediately. Kilbasa out. Wait, we're offering them our assistance? Whoever's there must have done something terribly wrong. Actually, come to think of it, that too is sort of, uh, suspicious. As it seems that, uh, this woman, who may or may not have been behind our uh, earlier attempt at kidnapping, is now requesting our presence down on this colony. This is very suspicious indeed. Let's take a look at this uh, compost. Nice name. This is your standard compost panel, where you can get information, travel to other ship locations, or just pretend to be doing some work. Indeed we can. It looks like a Cyberjack plug receptor. That's because it is, I guess. That slot takes one of those data cards. We use that for the DNA card. You look at it, but nothing strikes your fancy. 
And what you can do with this, uh, basically you can uh, uh, go places. We'll be going to all of these uh, at some point during the game. You can uh, read your messages, but well, we don't have any at the moment. We had one, but we already saw it. And you can look into the database, which is actually quite um, extensive, and there is some information in there that you will need. And there's cyber functions. But uh, you would need a cyberjack, and also it looks like it wouldn't work anyway, because person to Starcon R and R subdirective G one four five nine three eight all access to cyberspace from Starcon vessels and offices is hereby terminated. We apologize for any inconvenience. Well, I guess we'll uh, poke around in the database in the next video. Welcome back! We uh, are going to look at the ship's database, which is quite extensive, so this might take a while. I'll probably not do anything else in this video, so um, if you're not interested in me reading the database um, and just want to get on with the game, feel free to skip this video. There is some information in the database that we'll need, though. Let's take a look at the entity database. DNA sequencing. That's just uh, for interesting in data card, which we already did, and since I still remember uh, the guy's name, I don't need to do that again. So we go back. Known races. A through E. The Andromedan Decapos. Extinct. C. Coronian Tenticular Slime Sucker. Oh, that's short. Andromedans. These repugnant creatures are known for their mohawk dews and their well-developed prehensile snouts, with which they can pick up small objects, give themselves neck rubs, and unleash projectile mucosa at enemies. The most famous Andromedans are the two guys who rose above their humble Andromedan beginnings to become two of the most popular and su successful game designers in the galaxy. And they're humble, too. They were once kidnapped and pressed into servitude by the notorious Scumsoft Corporation, but were later rescued by an unidentified worker. Hey, that was us! Most Andromedans prefer flavored foreign coffees, such as hazelnut mocha and steak, and vanilla cottage cheese. Well, to each their own, I guess. Big Dealers! The primary civilization of the planet, Mega Big Deal, in the Sector B subcluster. See Coronian Killer Mammal. The Bicranial Crotch Snorter. Imagine a crotch snorter, only with a bifurcated cranium. Bicranial crotch snorters are limber, simian creatures with frontal lobes the size of Talosian binary casabas. These are very useful comparisons they're giving here. One would assume this makes them smarter than the average simian. One would be very wrong. Bicranial crotch snorters prove to the old adage that it's not how big your brain is, it's what you do with it. Just like their monocranial cousins, they spent most of their time snorting crud and then hacking it out again in extended coughing fits that often last up to 12 hours. While they're not gagging and choking, bicranial crotch snorters enjoy swimming, cycling, jazz, and eating gibberellian uh, dust mites. What is this, uh, a private ad? Um. There's more. The Bjorn! Uh, we actually um, missed an opportunity to look at those in the uh, streets of Polosorbate, I think. They uh, are sort of like the Bork, except they have a, a coffee pot on their head. You can see them walking around in a couple of the videos. The Bjorn, a race of half-humanoid, half-kitchen appliance creatures, are the scourge of the known universe. The Bjorn seek out civilizations in order to assimilate them. The collective knowledge of each civilization is then applied to the task of creating newer, shinier kitchen appliances. This is how the Presto Hot Dogger and Daisy Seal Meal were invented. So they're basically like the Borg, except even more evil. The leader of the Bjorn is the toaster sculpt Nocuticlus. Starcom has posted a reward for the deactivation of Nocuticlus, who may be recognized by a socket just below the interior crust control. This socket is typically used to connect Nocuticlus to various power sources in order to recharge him and, through him, the entire Bjorn collective. The great irony is that the Bjorn never spent any time in the kitchen, preferring to send out. They eat a peculiar mixture of batteries, nuts, bolts, and pre-processed organic sludge. 
good to know, I guess. The Birthnik Boulder Beaver. The herbivorous boulder beaver is most recognizable for its powerful prehensile tail. Unlike the tails of most beavers, which are strong enough to fling mud, the boulder beaver can use his tail to bench about 330 pound, 40 pounds for three sets of 15 reps without even stopping for a fruit-flavored sports beverage. Impressive, I guess. Hence it can, in fact, create a dam out of boulders of nearly any other material, including molten steel, lava, and stellar core fragments. The beaver prefers to eat the sweet, spicy leaves of the creepy habanero eucalyptus vine. Replicator number... blah blah blah. Don't bother writing all of these down, there's actually only one code which works, and uh, I'll show you later. The Urnan Sea Urchin The Urnan Sea Urchin is a pitiful little creature and doesn't really care who knows it. It cries constantly, which was only recently discovered since the creature lives underwater. It's an emo, then! It also refuses to play with the other sea urn and sea urchins. However, some of its feelings are understandable. After all, it's just about the ugliest sugger on Urnan. Its spiny quills make romance a tedious and impractical affair, and its gonads are highly prized as sushi. This would make you cranky, too. Indeed it would. Astrosian sea slugs. That sounds familiar. The multi-tentacled sea slug is a large, menacing carnivore with a squid-like beak. Its spectacular adaptive abilities and matchless ferocity ensure that it can easily survive for extended periods underwater, or land, or in space. Yeah, that's really likely from an evolutionary standpoint. However, due to its numerous disgusting habits and unrestrained lifestyle, the Astrosian sea slug would not hold up for more than five minutes under the scrutiny of the liberal media. Okay. Astrosian sea slugs eat all manner of creatures, particularly aquatic ones. Their favorite food of all, though, is the latex babe of Estros. It's the slug we've beaten in Space Quest 4. And, oh, the, and it goes back. Okay, I guess that was the first category. Now let's go to F through M. I told you this database was extensive. We're actually starting at the G now, but anyway. The Galanian Gutterettes. Galanian Gutterettes are so slimy, sniveling, and nasty that they give a bad name to all other Gutterettes. That's impressive. But of all their despicable habits, the worst is the fact that they're the lousiest bowlers in the galaxy. Hence their name! Sure, that makes sense. Not only do they rarely break 100, but they talk loud and cuss when other people are seriously trying to bowl. Their preferred diet is the bowling alley combo. French fries, burgers, hot dogs, and beer. Good to know. That's del oh. Green slime! Half animal, half vegetable, and half lousy mathematician, the green slime of Xenon is a vague byproduct of industrial waste and organic compounds combined with a powerful electric charge. The resulting life form is a slow moving mass of gelatinous acidic protoplasm with simple reflexes and a voracious appetite. This makes it ideally suited to dissolving locks and appearing in bad horror movies. Green slime will eat anything in its path, dissolving it quickly, but not painlessly. Bizarrely, it has no such effect on glass, making it ultra-convenient to carry around bits of green slime in an ordinary jar, and indeed, it was marketed that way, under the fa name Face Be Gone, Orc City! That's the slime from Space Quest 4. Grell, another creature we've heard of before. At one time, many eons ago, Grell were the primary inhabitants of Corona. Artifacts and ruins have revealed much about them. They were creatures of immense size, towering some 30 to 40 meters tall. They were extremely ugly and couldn't bear to look at one another, which is why their race died out entirely. They were hunter-gatherers, preferring hunting-gatherers to gathering hunters. Sure. Coronian Tentacular Slime Sucker The Corona Tentacular Slime Sucker, which lives deep in the subterranean caverns of Corona, has never been seen by anybody who has lived to provide a complete description. Yes, it has. We've seen it. All that has ever been seen are their slimy tentacles, which are tentacled-like and slimy, resembling tentacle-like slimy tentacles. Anything finding its way into these tentacles is first slimed, then devoured. Actually, we haven't actually seen more of it than that, so I guess they're right. This is an appropriate moment to note that tentacles comes from the root ten tickles, since the Andromedan decapus, which its ten serpentine flexible appendages, tickled its foes to death. The horror. 
That's just another fun fact to know and tell, even though it's completely wrong. More! Coronian Killer Mammal. The Coronian Killer Mammal has an undeservedly fierce re reputation, due primarily to, to its name, or rather, to what its name has become over the course of generations of sloppy pronunciation. Originally known as the Lonely and Bewildered Sandpill, the Coronian Killer Mammal is a gentle, slow-moving, herbivorous insect that would rather squash itself than come into contact with any other life form. These tiny introverted creatures are native to the planet Omega Big Deal, the only planet with the distinction of having its entire civilization flunk phonics. Yeah, I have. To, I guess you'd uh, have to flunk it quite badly to um, mangle up that name that badly. This lack of linguistic agility is said to account for the distortion of the Sandbill's name, although another theory has been put forth that the killer mammal appellation is merely to the centuries of sarcasm. The Coronian killer mammal eats dust mites. Lots and lots of them. Useful to know. Not. Coronians! They're the blue dudes from Space Quest 1. The sentient civilization of Corona consists of the Coronians, a secretive and shy race of scholarly old men. They devote their lives to the pursuit and dissemination of knowledge. How can an entire race consist of scholarly old men? Conversations with Coronians are liable to be dry, peppered with obscure and dull references to places and people you've never heard of, and full of self-congratulatory rhetoric. So it's basically like talking to me. Most members of Menza are Coronians. Sure. Most Coronians are vegans and prefer the local flora. Replicator number... Okay, I'm not actually going to read all those. Um, however, some Coronians eat their own young, just so they can knowingly say, Oh yes, I have done that. We taste like chicken. Man, they sound like assholes. The Killer Cave Beaver! This beaver's eyesight is among the worst in the galaxy, matched only by the giant cataract bear of Pestulon and the blind plummeting mountain goat of Andromeda. Although the cave beaver is herbivorous, it frequently accidentally kills other creatures because of close they all look like tree trunks. It's only after the beaver has chewed its way through the nearest sturdy limb that it discovers the limb is some creature's arm or leg, thus the dams made by the killer cave beaver are quite disgusting. The killer cave beaver's favorite food is clinging girlfriend ivy. Sure. Um, the labian cave squid. I think we met one of those in Space Quest 2. The labian cave squid is a fish-like mammal which has not yet realized that it's a land dweller. Thus it still tends to squirt ink, which lies ineffectively in a puddle on the ground and gets on the bottom gets on the bottom of your boots. It also uses typical squid-like flexing motions to propel itself, a very inefficient mo mode of transportation when moving through rocky tunnels. So the labian cave squids gets a lot of nasty cuts and scrapes as it tries to frog kick its way across a rough stone floor. This makes it more cranky than ever. The cave squid is also frightened by both humanoids and light, since it thinks it's still in the murky depths of deep labian swamps. Don't confuse it by approaching it. It will happily crush you, rather than be forced to question its reality. It will also eat you, if given the opportunity. We didn't actually encounter those uh, in Space Quest 2 because I re remembered how to get through the caves. If you go wrong there, you'll encounter one of those. The Labian Root Monster A direct descendant of the Venus Buggerfly, the Labian Root Monster is a carnivorous plant with roots both above and below ground. The underground roots absorb water and nutrients normally, but the soil of Labian is nitrogen poor, so the above ground roots collect nitrogen by capturing and digesting small stupid animals, or larger, stupider ones. Such as certain janitors we know. When disturbed, the roots wrap around the luckless creature and convey it to the central sac, wherein lie the digestive juices and spike like cilia that, re that reduce the creature to a pulp like consistency. At this point, the root monster exudes nitrogen like a Clorox II beam bladder at the Gilroy 9 Garlic Festival. The Labian root monster is best observed at a distance, or in the highly acclaimed Vidcard series, The Trials of Grotesque Alien Animal Behavior, by highly acclaimed naturalist Dr. David Aidenborough. Clever. The Labian Swamp Slurpee. A lot of Labian entries here. The Swamp Slurpee is believed to be a hideous, grotesque half-fish, half-reptile, 
Nobody's quite sure because nobody who's seen one up close has ever lived to describe it. Hey, where have you heard that before? Witnesses are usually found slightly decapitated or with a modest discount in the cranial region. We can only assume they eat everyone and everything. A fair assumption, I guess. They should have at least mentioned that, they're, uh, that they'll spit you out if you taste the berries. The Labian Terror Beast! The Terror Beast is aptly named since it spends most of its life in terror. Although the Terror Beast could easily defeat a humanoid, it usually avoids conflict unless faced with a particularly wimpy opponent. Oh gee, that really pays, uh, paints Roger in a good light. Most of its time is spent keeping to itself, avoiding public appearances and banquets. Its preferred diet is composed mainly of the roots of the Starshock bush. Terror beasts are born with extremely powerful leg muscles, however one leg is shorter than the other, so the beast tends to spin in a tight circle as it zooms across the Labian landscape. This creature is a whirlwind effect, this, this creates a whirlwind effect even, that can prove particularly hazardous to trailer parks. So that's what causes tornadoes. A highly intelligent creature, the beast enjoys figuring out small puzzles and will often stop in the middle of a hunt to solve a matchstick puzzle, logic problem, or riddle. Or a cubics rube. Curiously though, the beast hates arcade sequences. Hmm, like me then. Latex babes! They're a race, actually? I guess so. These natives of the planet Estros are usually nubile humanoid females although the occasional wily stringy male is not unheard of. Turn-ons include constructing the finest underwater craft in the galaxy, arc welding, and chopping. Turn-offs are Estrosian sea slugs, plaque build-up above the gum line, and two-timing janitors. Well, that explains a lot. Favorite foods are eelworth sashimi and roasted dry mouth kurami. Is there any more in this one? I don't think so, nope. So then we go to N through R. And considering you will need one of the, these races, I guess they expect you to uh, read through all of this. As any true adventurer would anyway. The Nose Nugget Nomads. These lumpen creatures toddle around the universe in wood-paneled station wagons. With their sack-like children in tow, they go on sightseeing tours that last upwards of 30,000 years. Oh, these are the guys we saw visiting uh, Fester's World of Wonders uh, on Fleabot in Spacecraft 3. During these tours, they make literally millions of slides, most of which show them waving high on every dinky little planet, asteroids, and intergalactic tourist trap in the Crab Nebula. During their hibernation phase, which lasts about 4,000 years, they have their film developed. When they awaken, they watch their slides. Entire civilizations have risen and fallen during one of the Nose Nugget sli slideshows. I've seen slideshows like that. Nose Nuggets pride themselves on their gustational, uh, gust, sorry, gustatorial. I'm not entirely sure what that means. Flexibility. They eat whatever foods aren't native to the location they're visiting. On planets where the natives subsist mainly on Nose Nuggets, this presents the Nose Nuggets with a difficult situation in which they often end up having to eat themselves. That is taking it a bit too far. Or rats. On a stick, possibly. These aggressive carnivores have been the bane of visitors to the planet Corona for hundreds of years. Hulking and heavily muscled, or rats walk on two powerful hind legs. They enjoy crushing other life forms with their massive forearms. They also enjoy basketball, and often combine the two by playing a quick game of one on one with a recent catch, as we have personally observed. Interestingly, or not, the flesh of the Orad is highly prized for its flavor and buttery texture. It's found as a common ingredient in the cuisines of several different planets. As a result, there's a burgeoning black market in Orad poaching. For that reason, the Orad is considered an endangered species, but nobody seems to mind except for a few chefs. Yeah, I wouldn't particularly care uh, if they died out. The Pestulon Monochrome Boys, from Space Quest 4. You won't find the monochrome boys in their native habitat. These foul-mouthed, belligerent beasts spend most of their time zipping around on Hartley drama mines, bullying weaker life forms and tinkering with their hawks. You summon the oh, not their motorcycles, but their real hawks. Don't ask. You don't want to know. The monochrome boys are so named because of their unusual white and grey pigmentation. The blotchy blemishes are partly responsible for their sour demeanor. Do not make eye contact. 
Should they force a confrontation, do not call them monochrome or boys. It's alright for them to call each other monochrome, but it's not okay for anyone else. I love double standards. The diet of monochrome boys consists mainly of any other life form that has a light, crunchy exoskeleton. Which fortunately does not include janitors. The Fleabot Pot Snatchers, who we once used to kill a killer android. The only other life form indigenous to Fleabot, other than the Fleabot Tinskis, Pot Snatchers hang from the rubbish, from the sorry, from the purplish rock formations that dot the landscape. They attach themselves by means of a strong, solid muscle, and their tough, chitinous outer shell protects them from potential predators. At birth, the Pot Snatchers cannot focus its on its prey. Fortunately, it has glands located near its tear ducts that secrete a liquid glass that hardens and forms a lens over the eye, usually in about an hour. Imagine that! Lenses in about an hour! That is quite fast. The pot snatcher then looks down from its upside-down perch and uprolls a sticky extensible tongue that can pick up an enemy 250 times his own weight, snag a fly moving over 35 kph, or perform several dubious tricks designed to get onto Quadrant 12's funniest home videos. Their favorite food is Flebatinskis, but since there are no Flebatinskis left on the planet, they mostly eat sand, or the occasional uh, janitor or killer android. The Flebatinskis, then? On Fleabot, the laws of natural selection are clearly illustrated, particularly in how they can sometimes go horribly awry and produce a poorly adapted race totally incapable of surviving its native habitat. The creatures native to Fleabot col are collectively called Flebatinskis, or Blats for short. They have three fingers, which end in suction cups ideal for grasping small prey or souvenirs. They have oversized pupils for seeing in dim light, large yellow incisors for cutting through food, and long narrow nostrils to protect against inhaling most foreign objects. Unfortunately, the planet of Fleabot, a greenish dust bowl, has no small prey to grasp, is brightly lit throughout the day and night cycle, features deposits of naturally occurring pulpy food, which must be gummed extensively before being swallowed, and has rock formations which cast off long, narrow slivers of mica, which are easily inhaled by the blats. These mica slivers can cause extensive lacerations of the sinus cavities. Thus, any blats who is unfortunate enough to survive the atmosphere typically loses his teeth, goes blind, or starves quickly. In fact, there's only one known currently surviving blats who has moved off of Fleabot to seek a more hospitable environment, and started a shop named Implant and Stuff on uh, Polysorbate. The Pinkins. The Pinkins are a race of many contrasts. They are they're so cute you just want to eat them up, but you can't because they're very tough, and you can chew them for hours without making any headway. Which is all right because they taste horrible. They live on Labian and create elaborate warrens or dents. They also swim through the Labian swamps with ease, since they use certain berries to repel the swamp slurpees that inhabit the marshes and base. However, the berries are ineffective against the monstrous killer cave beavers, who invade the dens and feast on the pinkins within. The cave beavers are not intelligent enough to figure out how tough and chewy the pinkins are, and often sample every pinkins in the den before realizing that none of them are tender enough to eat. Pinkins are herbivorous, so they only eat creatures named Herb. Sure, that's what it means. They will also eat the young shoes of the wandering atheist. Why is that in the replicator? All right, final group of letters. The Syrians. The Syrians are a humanoid race, treacherous, evil, but always eager to please. The Syrians make wonderful hosts, especially if you're their enemy. They pride themselves on their technique of torture, mutilation, disfigurement, napkin folding, and selecting their right wine to go with whichever enemy they're eating. It's sort of murder, arson, and jaywalking here. They're also very easily offended, should you insinuate that they're doing less than their best to grind you into a fine red paste. Sirens are omnivor omnivores, um, preferring to eat old black issues of Omni. <laughs> sure, uh, old back issues, by the way. Space monkeys! Billions of years ago, the planet Serenia was devastated by a collision with an asteroid. All whopper water evaporated from the ecosystem. Every day the inhabitants survived was a victory. Eventually, all life perished. Or so it was believed. 
Many of the life forms adapted by encapsulating themselves in cyst-like eggs. When these eggs are immersed in water, they hatch. One such life form was known as the brine monkey, a tiny water-breathing simian. Sereno products mined the planet for its huge deposit of brine monkey eggs. While they were at it, they also mined encysted brine apes, brine marsupials, and brine aardvarks. Torino has since marketed the monkey eggs under the trademark name Space Monkeys in comic books. Space Monkeys prefer space food sticks, or tangy, piquant brine bananas. Sure. Wow, finally a reference to Space Quest 5. Spiny Alien Fangs. Spiny Alien Fangs are a marvel of adaptive ability. With exoskeletons far too cumbersome to permit traditional reproductive techniques, spiny alien fangs have learned to propagate by kissing. This is not a little platonic kiss, it contains a fertilized egg, which heads straight for the victim's stomach. Here it absorbs nutrients for days or weeks, like a parasite, only... well, just like a parasite. When it senses a most dramatic moment possible, it bursts forth from the stomach in a spectacular display of special effects. This explosion naturally kills the host. But isn't it worth it for all the cool gore, especially if the host was merely an extra and not a highly paid guest star? Uh, this is the alien that kisses you in Space Quest 2. And finally, the only one we actually need, the Vulgars. The Vulgars are a peaceful race of brilliant and logical thinkers, whose only real joy in life is to stride around the galaxy with superior attitudes and correct other people's grammar and spelling. Those are the worst kind of people. They also enjoy designing outer space strategy simulation games. This makes them nearly as insufferable as university academici <laughs> academicians, but not as well paid. Considering their placid and studious lifestyle, it's interesting to note that the Vulgars have developed an extremely practical martial arts technique called the Vulgar Nerve Pinch. This is a tactile oral maneuver in which the pincher pinches the bundle of nerve fibers at the base of the neck while whispering dialogue from either Tango and Cash or Hudson Hawk. This particular combination of stimuli results in a searing flash of pain and then unconsciousness, which can last for several hours. The technique is demonstrated in Hollow Joint program number 5551212. That's the only piece of information we'll actually need in the game. Well, that's the races. But we're not actually done yet. There's also ships functions and the science database. The ships functions include the Hollow Joints. The hollow joint can recreate any environment for which a program exists. To start a program, enter the program number and press enter. Warning, all materials in the hollow joint are made from vertiplast, a virtual material that cannot exist outside the hollow joint environment. Attempting to remove any vertiplast items from the hollow joint environment will result in their immediate disintegration. So don't think you're going to go in there and conjure up something useful and then leave and expect it to still be in your inventory. Good to know. Food Replicator Food replicators are available in many ships' locations. To use, enter the number of the desired foodstuff. Menus are available in the seat pocket in front of you. If there is no seat pocket in front of you, try looking behind you. If there is no seat pocket behind you, just hail the waiter and request one. If there is no waiter in sight, please wait and there will and one will be with you shortly. Somehow I doubt it. And the signs database. Current medical issues. Starcon Hardware Subdirectives W411923 recommends that humanoid lifeforms ingest no more than 10% of calories from fat. Therefore, Kung Pao Chicken has been deprogrammed from the replicator manual list. Ah. Starcon would like to congratulate Dr. Beverage Crusher on her self-administered balloon angioplasty. This procedure uses a tiny inflatable balloon to compress a blockage against the sides of a vessel. Self-administered... Congrats are in order to Scott Murphy for finally figuring out how to firmly wedge his head between his own cheeks. I guess that's good to know. And the periodic table! For more information on this, please see Volume 2, Issue 1 of Sanitation Hotspots. This is actually in the manual. Or, you know, any science book. Because it's the periodic table, it's not exactly a secret. Alright, um, 
I guess that's it for uh, the compost, and we'll go actually do something useful in the next video. Welcome back! Can you believe we're still in Roger's quarters? Don't worry, we'll do something um, actually relevant to the game today. There's just one more thing uh, I actually forgot to look at here, which is kind of funny. The uh, mirror. You glance in the mirror. For a moment, you can almost see a silk-clad brunette overacting in a stone tower. Alexander, I feel so alone. Come on, her actress wasn't that bad. It's a picture entitled, Rocket Ship to the Moon. Now, if you could only figure out what the heck a moon is. Haven't we been on a moon at some point? I don't know. Yes, yeah, Bechelon. There's nothing behind the picture. Okay. And just to clear this up right now, there's nothing under the carpet, beneath the bed, inside the closet, behind the dresser, or inside the garbage can. You're thinking of that other game from that other company. I'm not sure which game they mean. The surface of the mirror feels cold and hard, like glass. Yet you can see yourself in it. Strange. The wonders of modern technology. Alright, um, we actually need to uh, beam down, so let's go to the uh, transporter room. I'm sure whoever requested our servers is down on the... Uh, planet, or colony, or whatever, is waiting for us. Okay, I'm ready. Energize! Hopefully it'll go a little bit better this time. Well, at least we're not stuck this time. Commander Kielbasa and that other guy look like they're just finishing up a conversation. Janitor Wilco, Dr. Bellows and I were just talking about you. Really? Please report to Sharpay's quarters, Janitor Wilco. She is in need of someone with your special skill set. Be quick about it. Yes, sir. Okay, um, now I know that the Ascendo Pad is just about the most message-filled location in the entire game, and contains some of the funniest messages in the entire game. However, since we just spent three videos looking at stuff in Roger's quarter, quarters, and um, um, reading the stuff in the computer, I'm gonna postpone looking at the stuff here for the moment. Well, let's just go to uh, Sharpay's quarters, like we were told to do. Don't worry, I will look at all the stuff in here and show all the funny messages. This one location has more man messages than any other location in the game. I'm not kidding. There's the old hack. Janitor, second class. Roger Wilco, reporting as ordered, ma'am. Wilco, you say? Yes, ma'am. Well, Mr. Wilco, I expected you here some time ago. I've been kept waiting for minutes now. I'm very sorry, Matt. Ugh. Save the pathetic whimperings for your Starcon superiors, which I would expect includes everyone and everything on the food chain over there. Pretty much. Ma'am, I came as... Young man, I lack the time, and most importantly, the patience to indulge you as you whine your way from one excuse to the next. May we please just begin? Sorry, 
but I wasn't briefed on what tasks would be required of me. You are a janitor, Mr. Wilco. What do you think I want from you, a heart transplant? <sighs> what has become of Starcon? When my fifth husband, Admiral Bluntthang, served, the crop of up-and-coming cadets seemed to have such promise. Ah, I recall this one rather striking cadet. Oh, oh well, never mind that. But you, I pray you do not typify what might be slithering down the halls of our formerly prestigious academy. That is one thing I do not look forward to witnessing. Get to work, Mr. Wilco. You'll find a mop and a bucket right over there. I have no time to devote to your education. That would take a lifetime, and the most copious amount of patience a universe could muster. My life is soon to expire. Please, just clean. I must rest now. Man, what a bitch. The wrinkled one rests quietly in her crapomatic adjustable bed. Nice lamp. I guess even the ill rich must have some extravagances. Where's the cyber poodle? Oh, well, they're making them too well now anyway. You just can't seem to kick them hard enough. <laughs> this is the personal medical suite of the legendary Sharpe. She spends her advancing days here at the ever-expanding retirement complex on Delta Berksalon 5. And what a nice place it is. It's a neat round design on the floor to break up the flatness of its look. But more than anything else, it serves to be more of a clod trap for people like you who trip over it, even though it's absolutely flush with everything around it. Go figure. It's quite an achievement. Seems like a few sequels since we've been in any bathrooms. I know what you've been thinking. You're probably thinking, have they waited four sequels to do bathroom humor? Or has it been just three? Hmm. Her well, mouth. to tell you the truth, in all the sequel-generating excitement, we've kind of lost track ourselves. So, you've got to ask yourself just one question. Are they hard up enough to resort to that level of humor at this point in the game? Nah, not yet. That is, I mean, we like to think we've slithered up a fair number of floors from the basement level of the comedic food chain. Either that or it's one of those relative things. Maybe it's because Al just continues to lower the basement. Anyway, uh, what were we talking about? <clears throat> Mr. Wilco, I asked you to mop the floors. Do I have to get Commander Kilbasa in here to get you to do your job? But we were making fun of El Lo. No, ma'am. I'll get right on it, ma'am. It's some kind of red medical type thing. Very detailed description. It's some sort of medical unit. You don't know what it is. After all, you're a janitor, not a doctor, damn it. Sure, Bones. The cart contains many devices which could be held in the palm of one's hand. But for the sake of the much more fiscally important impressions which must be made on patients, administrators, and wealthy contributors, they are incorporated into large carts with neat devices which make nifty beep and ping sounds. Helps the funding. Always important. These are supplies of a medical nature for the cratered one. That's a good description of Sharpe. It looks like a heart monitor. It must be amazingly sensitive since this crusty old beast appears rather heartless. There seems to be a few redundant systems monitors here. A more alert person would be led to believe that someone has accounted for the possible arrival of different types of humanoids in this otherwise personal facility. Mm. <clears throat> no, ma'am. I'll... Keep your shirt on. A contaminated waste items receptacle stands awaiting contaminated waste items. Okay, let's just do what she says. Like you need another one. I guess we need to click on the knob. Oh, by the way, I meant what I said. Keep your shirt on, please! Wow, is it the first time we ever did some real janitorial work? Mr. Wilco, please rattle the handle on that commode. It is positively maddening. 
Actually, no, it's not. We cleaned the Academy crest in the previous game. You got it, Toot. Um, uh, I mean, right away, ma'am. Whatever I can do. Please do it. And quietly. I must have my rest. Okay, let's do that. Mr. Wilco, it is time for me to take my meds. Please, fetch my trisonic sortium from the medicine cabinet. Yes, ma'am. Maybe I can get this old hag to overdose. What was that, janitor? Uh, nothing, ma'am. I I'll get those for you right away. I guess the medicine cabinet is behind the mirror? It's a cabinet containing old Sharpay's drugs. Seems like it. What's in here, then? Things are stored in there, probably. It's incredibly common. I guess he doesn't know. A clean towel dutifully hangs, awaiting its next use. Can we wash our hands? It wouldn't be prudent to do that at this juncture. I guess not. Let's just get, get the medicine. I can't find her medicine. I don't think she knows what she's talking about. What's she doing? Hey, what the... While we await a fully formed thought from Roger, it should be mentioned that there seems to be some sort of gas entering the room through the left vent. That's not a good thing. Hey, there seems to be some sort of gas entering the room through the left vent. I seem to be in a world of deep... Ah, jeez, the door! That can't be good. We'll have to find a way out in the next video. Welcome back. Sharpay has released gas into the room. Not much going on there, eh? I think there is something going on. What can be said that isn't painfully obvious? But somehow the narrator doesn't want to comment on it. That's a joke can. The old-timers use it to fake the new interns into thinking they have sucking chest wounds. It's a real hoot. Sure. Something tells me this gas is not good for our health. Health. You look at it, but nothing strikes your fancy. We need something that can help us get out of here, because I think the door is blocked. You realize your strength alone will be no match for the mechanized door. Oh, so much for that idea. Wait a second, if this gas is... Poisonous. She killed herself too. Seems to me there's something wrong with that plan. Then again, maybe the gas is not actually lethal. More likely it will just knock us out. Still, probably a better idea not to hang around to wait and see what happens afterwards. Obviously I am hanging around waiting to see what happens afterwards. We'll die, actually. Or at least get a game over. Which usually happens a lot quicker than this. Oh well, let's see if we can find anything useful in this uh, room. We've already looked at most of this stuff. What we need is some kind of device to help us pry the door open. Something, I don't know, pneumatic or something. Like a piston. Like maybe that thing on the bed here. Okay, there we go. Finally. And you thought the fumes from lactose intolerance were bad. I assume that he's not actually dead, that whatever Sharpe was planning for him is gonna happen next. But we don't get to see it. Anyway. She seems to be resting rather peacefully. See? She's not dead. She's not that stupid. Anyway, we want to use this piston here to pry open the door. The Hydro Riser piston gleams proudly, truly up to the task of propping up the most expansive of dermally housed humanoids. So it should have definitely no problem with uh, a skinny old lass like her. I'm sure she'll like this. You 
you give the piston a yank, and sure enough, it comes loose in your hands. Perhaps it was your raw strength. More than likely, it was defective. The narrator has such faith in us. All right, let's see if we can use this piston to pry open the door. Escape this trap. Good thinking! Wedged in the door, the manual override control causes the piston to strain against the door. It pushes a few inches and seems to strain at that point. Stellar! Loco. Oh, hi, Stellar. What are you doing here? There's no time to talk, Roger. We've got to get out of here now! One... Two... Three... No! Stellar! Just as you crash to the floor of the turbo shaft, the hydro riser piston gives way, and the door slams shut, with Stellar still trapped inside. Can't you just beam up? You claw and pull at the seams of the bulkhead door, but to no avail. Just then, you hear and feel an explosion which seems to have come from behind the door. Oh my god! The door is sealed tight. You can hear no other noise after the ear ringing from the blast subsides. My god! I, I can't believe this! It can't be happening! She was... Uh, I was... Stella! That's Roger's big no moment for this game. Alas, poor Stellar, we barely knew ye. It's hard to believe that this is the Hollow Suite. The setting is much like the graphics you've scanned in the library from those planets more interesting in their climatic diversity. From the scenic jutting peaks, soft hills, and lake in the conjured distance to the lush, pixelized growth of trees, flowers, and grass in the foreground, the hollow deck has that sublime park-like perfection. Unfortunately, its serene beauty is sadly negated by the headstones and the solemn event about to occur, the laying to rest of your rescuer and true friend, Stellar Santiago. You are feeling as you have never felt before, perhaps helped along by the relatively short stints aboard the various ships, as well as all too brief friendships, you've been spared the emotional devastation of true loss by lack of attachment. This, however, is a different feeling, far different from anything you've ever experienced. You can't help but wonder how you'd act towards Stellar given a second chance, but you know that can never happen. She gave her life for you, and you will never be able to thank her. Enough smarm already. Let's funeral! <laughs> Ladies and or gentlemen, we assemble here today to honor the memory of a former crewmate, Lieutenant First Class Stella Santiago. Her unfortunate death takes place in the shadow of a new community, the dawning of a new life for the aged of our galaxy. Although death is never easy to accept, we must remember that the tragic accident which took her from our midst occurred while she was on duty. If a member of StarCon must perish for some reason, there is no more honorable way. It is part of the oath we recite and take to heart when we pledge our allegiance. I believe her friend, Janitor Second Class Roger Wilco, has a few words he'd like to say. Mr. Wilco? We have a eulogy for Stellar in our inventory now. Uh... 
I only knew Stellar for a short time. I wish I uh, could have gotten to know her much, uh, much uh, better. To have had a deeper understanding of this uh, person. I, I was proud to have called friend. Of my friend, I can only say this. Of all the souls I have encountered in my cleaning, hers were the most scuff resistant. I love a good funeral. It's a nice shades of uh, Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan here. Computer and program. I guess. Well, that was a first for Space Quest. The death of an important character. Well, I say important. She basically showed up out of nowhere, and now she's dead. And this is apparently the uh, Hollow Deck, also referred to as the uh, Hollow Cabana. The floor is featureless. And it is featureless, when it is turned off, at least. The walls have a flat, nondescript finish. Very deceiving when you consider what this room is capable of. Indeed. This is the control panel, but we don't need that at the moment. So, um, yeah. That was weird, especially because, uh... That woman, who was probably behind the abduction, of course Roger can't know that because he wasn't privy to that part of the introduction, tried to uh, get us a second time now. And for the second time, we were saved by Stellar. This time, it cost her her life. Where do we go from here? It is a difficult thing to move on after an event such as that. Well, I guess I'd better go back to uh, our quarters. I'm sure Roger can use a rest after uh, something like that. Why doesn't anybody else get their clothes pulled off by this thing? Hey, that's curious. The uh, column post is flashing again. Looks like you have a message waiting for you. Hmm. Who'd want to contact us? Are they going to send us back down there with that harpy? Wow, a message for me. I must be getting popular. Sure. I wonder what it is. Roger, help me. I only have a moment. They faked. Stellar, what happened? The picture's gone. You're alive? My God! Stellar is not dead. It seems that whatever Sharpay was planning for us, she has uh, taken Stellar instead and faked her death so that we wouldn't come looking. Interesting little tidbit. Actually, the uh, original title for this game was supposed to be Where in the Universe is Stellar Santiago? Obviously, uh, a play on the Carmen San Diego titles. But um, the publisher of Carmen San Diego, I think that's Broderbent? I'm not entirely sure. Um, threatened to sue Sierra, so they changed it to the Spinal Frontier. So 
So I guess we have to uh, find out a way to rescue poor old Stellar. But we'll have to do that in the next video. Welcome back! Well, we're going on quite the emotional roller coaster ride here. First, after the grief of Stellar's death. It turns out she's not actually dead. It was all a setup. Probably intended to kidnap us after the uh, kidnapping on Polysorbate uh, failed. But Stellar got in the way and they took her instead. Well, I guess the prudent thing to do would be to tell the captain. Whom I suspect is on the bridge. I'm surprised Roger even has clearance to go there, but anyway. I guess the bridge needs cleaning too once in a while. There's the captain. I like his, uh, well, hard to call it, uh, chair. This is a weird-looking fellow. That's Dorf, the ship's chief of security. And from the looks of things, he's rather uh, short-sighted. This is the bridge, the very nerve center of the SCS Deep Ship 86. The enormous deep ship cost millions of buckazoids to build, stretches on and on seemingly without end, and limps along at a snail's pace. Sort of like the first Star Trek movie. Badoom tsh. Um, it's actually hard to see when Kilbasa is sitting there, but the uh, control panel directly in front of him. Oh, somebody else wants to use that thing. <laughs> okay. The control panel directly in front of him, you can see it when he's not sitting there, um, in some of the previous cutscenes, for instance, is actually an SNES controller. That's Commander Kielbasa's command center. No, wait, it's his scratching post. No, it's his command center. It's probably both. Scratching post. Wait, kids, don't fight. It's both. Oh, that explains the tears, I guess. With these controls, Commander Kielbasa can adjust the elevation, tilt, rotation, and firmness level of his command center. Cool. And if you put in a quarter, it'll massage 320 different acupressure points. Even cooler. Can we use that? Yeah, you rearrange the commander's chair and he'll rearrange you. I guess not. That's Commander Kielbasa, dummy. I knew that. That's the schematic diagram of Deep Ship 86. This is the bridge. The, the sort of like... We already heard that. This is the engineering station where the power grids and engines are constantly monitored to make sure they're within Starcon spec. Or at least somewhere around a point close to an approximation of the same general idea of Starcon spec. Sounds like Cliffy's style of uh, engineering uh, is the norm around uh, Starcon. This is the communication station. All intraship, ship to ship, and ship to surface communications are routed through this terminal. Except when the communications officer is too busy leaving juvenile, my M5 Multitronic unit is more powerful than your old Daystrom laptop messages on Internet. Hmm. Didn't the M5 try to kill someone in Star Trek, or am I confusing that? That's the communication officer. He would probably have picked up that message from uh, Stellar then. This is the science station, housing the advanced sensor systems, extended computer reference modules, and pattern detectors. This station houses the security and tactical arrays. 
And the view screen. The main view screen is filled with stars and distant galaxies, representing untold scores of civilizations and a vast amount of untapped knowledge that could reshape the way we think of time and space. But more importantly, you're proud to notice that your new squeegee didn't leave any streaks. Yes, yes, yes. Untold civilizations. Mostly it's just um, on lift burger joints, isn't it? Anyway, we should probably tell the captain about uh, the message we got from Stellar. Commander Kilbasa, you're going to think I'm crazy, but I've just received a distress message on my compost. And it was from Stellar. Wilco, have you been whiffing cleaning fluid again? Yes, but that's not the point. I'm absolutely as sane as I've ever been. She's being held on Delta Berxelon by Sharpay. Wilco, do you realize how irrational that sounds? We buried Stella. You were there. Maybe you need a rest. Take a couple of hours off. Sir. Wilco, we have our orders from Starcon and we'll be carrying them out. Drop it, Janitor. Leave the bridge now, Wilco. I've made my decision. Hmm. Janitor Wilco, you must have something to clean up somewhere. Make yourself scarce. We're very busy up here. What an asshole. Maybe he, uh, Admiral Toolman, and Sharpay are all in league. Can you look at this control panel, by the way? With these controls, Commander Kielbasa can override navigational subsystems, access ship-wide computer functions, perform sensor sweeps, and get to level 6 of Super Nunzio World. Very important. Maybe the communications officer knows, knows something about the message. You get a jump on senility. Except we can't actually talk to you him. You get a jump. How about, uh, You dwarf? get a jump on senility. Nope. Well, I guess it's up to us to rescue Stellar, which means we need a way to get uh, off this ship. For which I suppose the, uh... The transporter would be the most logical thing to use. Let's see what happens if we go there. There's the transporter robot. This droid is the teleporter station technician. It's all business. I don't really see the point in having a robot operating a computer. This is the transporter control panel. The droid assigned here handles all transport duties from this station. The transport alcove contains transport pads for up to five crew members and or supplies. Above each is a subatomic particle scanner. The transport room is a very important place aboard any Starcon ship, and for safety reasons tends to be one of the cleanest. You ought to know. Yes, I remember a very unfortunate incident with uh, a fly. Due to its proximity within the ship, many of the superstructure elements of Deep Ship pass through the transport chamber. You'll probably remember this quite well since abandoning or uh, escaping from dangerous situations. After all, it is your forte. Indeed. Can we ask him to beam us down? It's interested only in its job. It has not one speck of personality. In fact, it could make you look like the life of any party. Can we beam down ourselves? I wouldn't try that if I were you. He may not react too favorably. No. What happens if we just walk over here? Beam me down. It's interested only... Well, I guess we're going to have to find another way off the ship. Hmm. What else could be useful? The shuttle bay. Take a shuttle back to uh, Delta Brooklyn so we can rescue uh, Stellar. 
Those two guys don't look very friendly. Magnum Opus belongs to an elite Starcon fighting forces called the Flying Flingers, FF for short. That's Chesbro, one of the Shuttle Bay guards. This is the entrance to the Shuttle Bay. Since the Shuttle Bay is a hazardous area, and since visiting dignitaries often pass through these doors, security is extremely tight here. Uh -huh. This handy-dandy scrolling board announces incoming and outgoing shuttles. During the quieter stretches, it's also used to display the scores when they hold donkey basketball games in the shuttle bay. Useful. And it looks like he's eating donuts. Mmm, a nice fatty donut. Magnum will probably scarf this down. After all, he needs to maintain his boyish tub of guts figure. Can we get a donut? I want a donut. That's delightfully non-helpful. I guess not. Maybe we can just ask them to let us through. Magnum doesn't talk. He fancies himself to be like one of those Buckingham Palace types. Yeah, I can clearly see the resemblance there. You consider saying hi until you remember how dedicated he is to his job, and you wouldn't want him to get in trouble for slacking off while on duty. I wonder why you don't worry about that for yourself. Good question. Let's just go through. No amount of brute strength can pry these doors apart, even if you had some. Hmm. <clears throat> An interesting thought, but you wouldn't want to give him the wrong idea about your intentions. I really don't think that's a good idea. He's not the touchy-feely type. Is that a button? It's one of two buttons you must push simultaneously to open the shuttle bay door. Oh. Well, that sucks. An interesting idea. What are you up to, Roger? Oh. An interesting idea. I'm up to trying to get it into the shuttle bay. What the hell's going on with all these messages? <laughs> hmm. We need some way of getting rid of the um, guards. What do we have? Maybe they'd like a dead fish. Boy, wouldn't it be cool if that really worked? Sure would be. Uh, maybe you can inject him with morphine. It would appear that merging those two items is not a good idea. Maybe we can inject his donuts with morphine. That's an interesting idea. Not a good one, but interesting nonetheless. Nope. Too bad. Roger's such a wimp. If only there was a way he could quickly learn an effective martial arts technique that would knock out nearly anyone. If only there were, I don't know, some sort of program on the holodeck that could teach you that. Wait a second. I'm having an idea here. But you're going to have to wait until the next video. Welcome back. We need to get rid of these two guards if we want to get into the shuttle bay so we can go back to Delta Berksland 5 and rescue Stellar. Eat at Joe's, okay? Um. But how can we do that? Well, if you remember in the uh, ship's database, uh, we saw an entry about a race called the Vulgars, who apparently have a super effective martial arts technique called the Vulgar Nerve Pinch. Obviously, uh, play on the Vulcan Nerve Pinch, which we can uh, learn by playing Hollow Joint Program number 5551212. So, let's try that out. So, go to the Hollow Cabana. Nobody can apparently decide what this thing is actually called. Hollow Joint, Hollow Deck, Hollow Cabana, I don't know. <laughs> the 
better be really effective if we want to get rid of that uh, big guy, but anyway. Okay, let's see. Oh, I guess I need to turn it on first. Five, five, five. One, two, one, two. Seems like a phone number, but anyway. Something seems to be happening. Welcome to Hollow Suite Program 5551212, the Volga Nerve Pinch. Despite our reputation for being pacifist, we Volgas have developed an extremely practical martial arts technique used mainly for defensive purposes. It is called the Volga Nerve Pinch. This is a tactile oral maneuver in which the applier pinches the bundle of nerve fibers at the base of the neck while whispering into the victim's ear dialogue from either Tango and Cash or Hudson Hawk. This particular combination of nerve stimuli and loss of cerebral control due to the torturous mantra of movie dialogue results in a searing flash of pain and then unconsciousness. In effect, it is similar to a temporary orally induced robotomy. Victims are soon rendered unconscious for several hours. When they awaken, they will remember nothing of how they came to be unconscious, if they are extremely lucky. I shall demonstrate on my most eager volunteer. I didn't realize those movies were you that bad. You will please to pay attention. Address the subject in this manner. Please to notice the location of my hand as I begin the narcotic chant of cinematic morphine. He mutters something thankfully unintelligible into the ear of the volunteer. So, as you can see, it is very effective. If you can apply a proper grip to the neck, it will disable 9 out of 10 neck-bearing species. This completes our program. Thank you. That guy was apparently called Ptui. Right. <clears throat> Let's see if we can employ that uh, technique on the uh, guards. Problem is, you'd probably have to do it on both of them as once uh, in order to be effective. But anyway, let's try anyway. I think you just have to click the hand icon on it, and Roger will do it automatically after you've uh, seen. The uh, uh, program. <laughs> Sorry. Ooh, boy, I got you with my fingers in your Kurt Russell. Now you can't get away. I got you now that you've got a card to believe this is a real job. Oh, my God. So, how come you're not going down? I've got you with your mumble jumbo and your hobbit chubby. Oh boy, I, I, if I only could, I would. Jeez, if you, why don't you step outside, pal? I got you with this. And I, mm, I think I broke a fingernail here. Wow, I can't believe that worked. Oops. <laughs> That was not a good idea. And now we're in the brig.
Wow, we're getting a lot of food from this guy. That would be Dorf, the nearsighted and fairly clueless security chief. This is some very fine food, uh, whatever it is. <laughs> I'm sure you'll find it quite to your liking. Heck, it's probably better than what they feed you janitors. <laughs> Live it up! <laughs> oh, that darn light needs to be amplified. I need to contact maintenance. <laughs> Okay, let's uh, get some of this food. Or all of it. Is there something in this cell? And then he leaves. He uses his nose to push the buttons. Oh no! We're in jail! Whatever shall we do? From where you're sitting, it looks like freedom. Home sweet home, until you figure out how to get out of here and away from that nearsighted security guard. They do seem to like reminding us that he's nearsighted. Oh, he's back. I'll keep doing that uh, for a while, but anyway. Home sweet home until. There are lots of graffiti in here. Sarek lies. Major Tom was here. Golly, this food looks so good it might be worth becoming a prisoner for. <laughs> yeah, like I'd sure want to be in your position. Not. We got another donut. While that's an interesting idea, even Dorf would notice that something would be missing where there were two things, the cart and you. I didn't want to climb in the cart, I didn't want Not to get now. the donut. Dorf is looking. As if that makes any difference. You, I don't think you can get the second donut while still have uh, the first one. Anyway, he'll be back again. I was just looking at the graffiti, like Major Tom was here. Ground control to Major Tom. Uh, anyway. Seems this guy is really nearsighted. Um, but still... Yikes! What the hell is that? Um, but still, he'd notice if we try to climb into uh, the cart, as the narrator pointed out when I was trying to pick the donut. But maybe we can... Uh, figures uh, something out with these uh, pieces of food. Hey, we still have the data quarter. And this is sort of difficult because you have to do it in exactly the right order, otherwise um, it uh, won't let you. Um, And I don't remember exactly what the right order is, so I'm just going to try some things. Nothing happens. See, most games would just give you a generic response when you try something useless like that. But we've custom tailored this response exactly for you. Um, great. Careful. Combining those items might cause a rip in the space-time continuum. A tear in the very fabric of space itself. Or not. Uh, let's look at this first, actually. These look like something they cleave from the side of Yoda's head. Indeed. It's a tuberous growth of some sort from the food cart. Well, potatoes or something. I remember what this is. It's a rack of Orat. Haven't seen this stuff since Space Quest 1. It's a nice round melon. It's a plate of grill hair spaghetti. So it is. It's the donut you filched from the food cart. Cool. Bobbit kebabs. They whip up some interesting food items in this joint. 
It's one of the interestingly shaped pastries you took from the food cart. Um, if I'm not mistaken, actually, you start with these two now things. Now it has some cool ears. You can see that this sort of looks like legs with feet now. And I guess this could be uh, a torso. The rack of a rat adds a nice touch. And maybe um, these could be the arms. An interesting idea. Something's starting to take shape. What are you up to, Roger? A head? Nothing happened. No. Nothing happened. A touchment of that adds something more to your work in progress. Guess we needed to add hands first. How creative. Then, uh, a head, and finally, hair. That's a nice touch. And now we have a perfect duplicate of Roger. Well, okay, wouldn't fool anyone, uh, except that security chief seems to be incredibly nearsighted, so hopefully it will fool him. Put it on the bench. I'm sure he won't be suspicious when there's suddenly two people in there. Um, and then? And then the game locked up, apparently. Well, I'll, um, fix that and continue in the next video. Welcome back. The game keeps locking up when I try to put uh, my carbon copy down on the bench. I guess I'm gonna wait until uh, he returns. Hopefully that uh, will fix the problem. If you put it down before he comes, he'll say that you have a visitor. <laughs> This is some very fine food, uh, whatever it is. <laughs> I'm sure you'll find the same thing you said last time. Okay, let's try that now. Thank you. Then we can get into the cart. It's really bright to make somebody with eyesight that bad. The Chief of Security. Nice work. Sometimes you actually surprise me. There's another cell here. We've seen there's some kind of monster in there. Inside this cell is the creature from the Ego. A bizarre, invisible monster caught on Rialto 4. It's violent, brutal, bloodthirsty and is a sucker for insincere flattery. What are these numbers? This is the Brig area, where transgressors are placed for punishment and supposedly rehabilitation. In order to strike fear into the hearts of evildoers, the cells are labeled 105 and 106. Actually, these are the only two cells aboard the ship. <laughs> But the subtlety is usually lost on these intergalactic criminal types. As you would expect. I'm gonna try setting this guy free. I'm sure that's a bright idea. Now there's a real bright idea, but then perhaps you deserve the consequences. If the force field were turned off, you'd be the only one to suffer the consequences. In the event that someone might be looking over your shoulder, we'll save your embarrassment for another time. But I want to see it! Game over, man! Game over! <laughs> Being a good Samaritan is one thing, but you should have been just a little skeptical about that move. Well, I was. I just wanted to see it. <laughs> All right. Enough mucking about. The uh, 
problem, however, remains of the uh, security guards in the shuttle bay. Unless, maybe the, uh, the one guy we uh, knocked out is still gone, which at least would reduce our problem. So far I've been using the arrow keys here, you can also use the numbers. Like that. Let's see uh, what happened. Nope, they're both back. Damn it. Something tells me this vulgar nerf pinch thing is not gonna work on the big guy. I really don't think that's a good idea. He's not the touchy-feely type. But... We have a donut. Maybe we can bribe him with the donut. That's an interesting idea. Not a good one, but interesting nonetheless. Or just put it on the pile. Yep, we gave him a donut. He's not eating it. I guess so. You can take it back. That's delight. No. That's delight. You can't take it back. Not very helpful to give him a donut. Because we need to do something with the donut first. Fortunately, there is a spare donut in the brick. Hey, now we ate it. Or at least it's gone. <laughs> I think some of these fade-ins are slower than they're supposed to be on a under DOS box. Not that you'd have any hope of playing this normally on a modern computer, because it does have some timing issues. I know it's uh, likely to freeze after you scan the uh, data cards you got from the DNA analyzer if you uh, run it on a computer that's too fast. So what can we do with the donut to make it a little less appetizing? Well, it just so happens that we have a syringe of morphine. I'm sure that's uh, something that would be strong enough to take even that big guy out, so let's poison the donut. Good thinking. And now we. No, you. Oh. Now we give it to him. I'll wait until he eats it. This ought to be interesting. Getting weirder and weirder. Was that a parody of Elton John playing the theme song from King's Quest VI? Sure looked like it. Well, he's out. Now to take care of his friend. Which we do the same way as before. Fortunately, he doesn't, uh... Ooh, grab us. boy, I got you with my fingers in your Kurt Russell. Now you can't get away. I got you now that you've got a card to believe this is a real job. Oh, my 
like, oh, so how come you're not going down? I got you with your mumble jumbo and your hubba chubba. Oh boy, I, uh, I, if I only could, I would. Jeez, if you, why don't you step outside, pal? I got you with this, and uh, mm, I think I broke a fingernail here. Smooth move. You've got his key ring. Sweet. It's a key with a little button thingy attached to it. Interesting that we got his key ring, even though this door does not have any keyhole, so it must be for something else then. My, this guy would give Sybil a run for her money. Sybil? That's an incapacitated security guard. I think it's time to spend a lot less time leisurely touring and a lot more time trying to get your can out of this place. Quite. Well, it seems there's two buttons on the door that you actually need to press simultaneously. It's one of two buttons you must push simultaneously to open the shuttle bay door. So, let's uh, try that. Hmm. We need something that's long to extend our reach, and we don't have anything right now, so let's check out some other areas of the ship to see if we can't find any such uh, thing. We haven't seen anything that would qualify for that so far, but there uh, is at least one area we haven't visited yet, namely 8 Rear. I think that's the only area we haven't visited yet. And I'm right. 8 Rear, obviously a play on 10 forward, is the recreation area of the ship. And we've seen it before, actually, in the introduction. But we have not yet visited it during gameplay. There we go. This is 8 Rear, the ship's lounge. Here crew members come to relax, drink, eat, converse, party, hit on each other, brawl, hurl, pass out, and intrude on each other's personal space. Sounds like a night out. Interesting living types here. An unusual plant specimen that someone left behind. It appears to be thriving here. Perhaps it prefers beer and popcorn to fertilizer and you grow it lamps. I guess. This view screen lets eight rear patrons watch the subspace transmissions of Major League Hairball games, Monday Night Bunion Ball, and the occasional pay-per-view or rat fights. It's your old non-organic friend, Circuit Sydney. Sort of a data stand-in. Apparently he's our friend. They've got floating tables here. Fancy. The anti-grav tables are specially designed to compensate for the ship's motions, minimizing drink spills while under enemy attack. Now you can drink an alien secretion during a hull breach and still not spill a drop. Yes, your eyeballs will implode within 2.3 seconds, but if and when you make it back from sickbay, your drink will still be there waiting for you. Looks like they've got their priorities straight. And we thought the Elvis 1987 poster in our office was tasteless. What is it with the Elvis references in this game? And we thought the El oh. Eating burgers or something, I think. A peaceful panorama of light, color, and limitless black space drifts quietly by the window. The infinite flow and ebb of matter and energy dancing around itself in a never-ending light show of creation. Poetic. I want to see something blow up. <laughs> Roger voices everyone's thoughts. Two scientific dudes stand by the back window, talking stars. It's hard to say anything sarcastic about them, since stargazers are inherently cool. I've always thought so. Mm, well, we'll see if there's anything useful in this place in the next video.
Welcome back! We're looking for something to extend our reach so we can push those two buttons simultaneously. Maybe the uh, replicator will help us. It's called Mr. Soylent. Reference to uh, Soylent Green, of course. It's people, I tell you! This is 8 Rear. The oh. This sign and the menu screen attached indicate that this is a Mr. Soylent food replicator. It makes you wonder what kind of kickback Starcon is receiving for this blatant plug. A friendly Mr. Soylent food replicator stands in wait to serve anyone who wants a snack. Technically, these aren't replicators. They're wormholes into the restaurant universe. But the food still tastes replicated because the chefs in the restaurant universe are mostly ex-monolith burger employees and know nothing about food. That's an interesting technology. Maybe it can provide us with something that uh, we can use to push those buttons? Actually, no, it can't, but it can provide us with a lot of funny messages and a pretty big WTF, uh, WTF moment. So let's take a look at it anyway. This is the screen used to display the numbers as you enter them. Impressive technology. This is the replicator hatch, a sliding door behind which is hidden the vortex resonance coils and the molecular soilentization generator. This access panel contains the food replicator's resonance flux shield. This access panel contains the food replicator's transwarp field stabilizer. This access panel contains the food replicator's quantum inhibitor conduit. That's a lot of technical details about something that serves absolutely no purpose in the game. No, you don't need the replicator for anything. The access panels are all tightly sealed to keep people who don't know what they're doing away from the controls. Yes, people like you. Oh. You shouldn't try to open this door by tugging on it. You'll strip the gears just like you did to the replicator in your quarters. Figures. This world's a great big ball of dirt with 50 billion souls Who like to sit around and veg down in the dark like moles But me, I'm just the kind of girl who loves the open air And bits of unburned hydrocarbons blowing through my hair New soil is clear, at last it's here with clearly better taste Less people, too, like me and you, and less reprocessed waste. More hearty crunch for snacks or lunch, it's crystal clear to see. New soil and clear, the last frontier for folks like you and me. New soil and clear, clearly less people, clearly more taste. Right, let's not do that again. I think you can actually talk to some of this stuff as well. Access panel, I command you to open. Not surprisingly, the access panel doesn't open. But it does appear to glance your way, give you a who made you the boss look, then shrug and glance away with a superior attitude. Or was that all in your mind? Either way, messed up. Replicate. I command thee. You have no power here. Apparently. Open up in there. Guess there's no, there's no one in there. Access panel? Not surprising. Oh. Or was that... All of the panels give the same message. This one too, I think. Access panel? Yeah. Not surprising. Or was that... What is this one, actually? This access panel contains the food replicators. Uh, mm, uh, the thing that keeps the... Uh, uh, well, it's got this lever with this other thing connected to it. Uh, uh, anyway, it keeps the replicator from getting the... Um, uh, um, uh, never mind. <laughs> I completely forgot about that. Anyway, uh, you can actually enter numbers here. It sure doesn't. But most of them uh, actually do nothing. I can, for instance, uh, enter the number for um, coronium plant from the computer. 
It sure does. Shut up. It sure. Which is harder than it looks. But nothing happens. In fact, the only code that does anything, as far as I know, is not a code from the game. It is, in fact, the code from Bjorn, uh, for Bjorn Chow from the demo of Space Quest 6. Yes, Space Quest 6 had a demo, which was not just a couple of puzzles from the game. It actually had its own little thing. And th there you get to use a replicator and you use it to create some Bjorn Chow to distract some Bjorn. So, uh, it sure. let's try that code, which I happen to have handy here. 7469410. Hmm, something tells me you're thinking of the demo. Demo? Yeah, you remember? The demo that had more version numbers than the game? Uh, yeah. That demo. You want this stuff? Maybe we should relegate the Roger Wilco character to demo-only status for the next game. You did have a brother, didn't you? Perhaps his IQ broke double digits. I don't think I actually want that stuff. Never mind. Okay, nice little easter egg there. I think that's about it. Um... Well, we're still no closer to opening the shuttle bay door, but maybe Circuit Sydney here can help us. After all, the description did say he was our friend, so maybe he can give us a hand. Hello, Roger. Please join me in consuming something. Thanks, Sydney. You seem uptight. Say what? Upright? What are you talking about, Sydney? Uptight was the word. Perhaps that is too archaic a reference for you. It would have been more effective to say that you seem concerned. Oh, yeah. I, I do have a thing or two. Uh, well, at least something on my mind. I am sorry to hear this. I hope your concerns are soon alleviated. Thanks, Sid. I do have to come up with some solutions. You know, I know that uh, he's probably supposed to be uh, a reference to Data, but if you ask me, he reminds me more of Crichton from Red Dwarf. Sydney, I have a favor I'd like to ask of you. Flame away, Roger. You know I'd give you my right appendage if you needed it. Funny you should say that, Sydney. I kind of have this situation where that very item could come in handy. Really? Well, I was merely saying that uh, metaphorically. You really are a great friend, Sydney. That'll come in real handy. I can't thank you enough, Sydney. Well, if you really are seriously in need of it, I suppose I could lend it to you. You will get it right back to me, won't you, Roger? Sure, of course. No problem. Oh, yeah. You bet your nut flanges, Sydney. We got us an extra arm. Let's see if we can open the uh, shuttle bay door with that. Uh, back to the shuttle bay entrance. two guards are still passed out, and I think they will stay that way. So, let's push the button on the right, and then use Sydney's arm to push the other button. That is one seriously reinforced entrance. Wow, there's a lot of shuttles here. 
This large, well-ventilated shuttle bay is probably the largest single room on the ship. Which is why you can often find Andorian megopeds playing hacky sack in here. I don't know what that is, and I don't think I want to. Hey, that shuttle looks familiar. Some guy wearing a Delco air filter on his face parked this shuttle. That sounds like a certain chief engineer I know of. Ooh, a mint-conditioned 57 Gateway Bel Air with mag thrusters, overhead lifters, and four pod barrels. This baby is a sleek streak Corsair with push-button tranny and dual airbags. These balsa wood shuttles are really maneuverable, but they don't last two seconds in a phaser battle. Who would build a shuttle out of balsa wood? Just by the way, there's another familiar looking shuttle on the left here. You hear a disembodied voice saying, Remember your parking space, Luke? But it's an Imperial shuttle, unless it's the one they stole in, uh. uh Return of the Jedi. This Kiapian runabout strikes fear into the heart of the Japaxian Empire. It's a good compact shuttle for under 8,500 buckazoids. Wait, are you trying to sell it to me? He's waxing the ship. Good service they have here. What's this place up here? This workstation allows manual control of the shuttle airlock and other functions, most of which are routinely handled automatically by the ship's computers. They're incomprehensible to you, so don't even fool with them. All right. What, they don't have a droid here to do it? They actually do the, the sensible thing and have the computer handle it? This Tiberian skimmer may look intimidating, but it's seriously underpowered. And that clear steel compound cockpit is particularly vulnerable to meteorites, baryon radiation, and large insects. This is the hatch leading into the Starcon shuttle. And something tells me that's the one we're going to have to use. Namely the fact that that's the shuttle that's on the box of the game. What a beauty! A true museum quality McKinley Ultramarine Blue Runner! It will be mine. Oh yes. It will be mine. In your dreams! Denied! Some woman driver parked her shuttle here and contaminated the whole deep ship with these acid-bleeding, multi-jawed, exoskeletal aliens, and you had a really huge mess to clean up. Just for that, Kielbasa refused to validate her parking slip. <laughs> That's, uh... Not really punishment fitting the crime. I guess these are refueling uh, stations or something. They've got uh, water, oxygen, nitrous oxide, and carbon dioxide. This refueling pillar signifies parking section F8. Instead of F8, this post used to have a picture of a large cartoon mouse, but Starcon removed it after being threatened with legal action by the same company that lost its shirt on Androma Disney, the first amusement park on Andromeda. And another one. This support is labeled F9 so that entities can easily find where they park their shuttles, pods, runabouts, and other mini-ships. The deep ship's shuttle has a reserved spot in this row. Well, we'll see if we can use one of these sh uh, shuttles on the quest to rescue Seller in the next video. Welcome back. We're in the shuttle bay and there's a whole bunch of shuttles here. Which is the one we're gonna have to use? I hope it's the Imperial shuttle or the Enterprise D shuttle. Probably not though. I'm guessing it's this one because this one is on the box of the game. Um, and we actually got a key from the uh, one of the shuttle bay guards. Which wasn't used to enter the shuttle bay, so probably it uh, belongs to one of these shuttles. And it has a button on it, so that might be able to uh, unlock it at a distance, or at the very least identify which shuttle it is. The shuttle's alarm is now deactivated. Sweet! Additionally... 
we now know it is in fact the shuttle that we need to use. So let's head inside. Hmm. Looks like this place needs some cleaning. The shuttle always looks trashed like this when it gets back from one of those intergalactic tailgate parties. Who in the world left all this trash in here? Isn't somebody supposed to clean up the shuttle when it comes back from a mission? Probably you. Oh wait, that's me. On second thought, it, it doesn't look so bad, after all. Yeah. I agree, it adds a certain je ne sais quoi to the décor, or something. This tank of emergency oxygen serves an incredibly important purpose. It ensures that the shuttle's hatch makes a neat hissing sound when it opens and closes. Indeed, very important. The shuttle always looks tr- oh. The shuttle closet contains an EVA suit and helmet for those infrequent repairs. I'm sure we won't be needing that. This compartment contains the manual override array and the pattern buffer subroutines. This compartment contains the Devalium crystal subprocessor and main flux coupling. This upper compartment contains the subspace transmission relays and tachyon emitters. All very important, I'm sure. The shuttle always looks... If you recall correctly, this thickly shielded conduit routes the plasma runoff into the reintegration chamber. It's either that, or the hot water. I think it's probably important not to get them f uh, confused. I hope this cable wasn't important. Someone must have been fixing the diagnostic relays. The lights here are half-spectrum in order to give everyone the same pale blue mole person look. They did that on purpose. The shuttle bay doesn't look so spacious from in here. In fact, it looks kind of fuzzy. Maybe you need to clean the windshield. These are the seats for the pilot and navigator, built of a semi-translucent gel foam that molds itself to the shape of whoever's sitting in it. The semi-transparency also makes it easier to spot loose change and crumbs that have fallen between the cushions. Neat. Or something here in the uh, back seat pocket. Maybe it's a replicator menu. It's a recall notice. No, too bad. Out oh, here. These are the seats for the no. the semi truck. Nothing apparently. This is the shuttle cockpit. You sit here. You will be smart. You will make it go. You will make things work. Is that a reference to the pack lads? I think it might be. Let's get the recall notice. Huh? Huh? That makes perfect sense. It feels slightly... It's the recall notice. Yes, I noticed that. It feels slightly... It feels like... I think, I think it has another it feels side on it, but... It's the recall... It's the re- I think you could, there's more to that recall notice. It's the recall. It reads, Dear ah. Ham Shuttle Owner. It has come to our attention that there is a minor misprint in the owner's manual for the 1000 series of shuttles. Until a new manual can be acquired, please disregard page 73, paragraph 4 of that manual. Where it reads, as soon as any more knows, when jumping the 1000 series, please match the plus cable end with the plus terminal on the polar flux repeater deck. Follow the same procedure for the minus cable and the minus pole. It should now read, as any more know, knows, uh, when jumping the 1000 series, please match the plus cable end with the whatever this symbol is, pole, and the minus cable end with the, uh, well I guess that's no pole. Thank you for flying a hamster. Well, that might come in useful in case we need to actually jumpstart this thing. Let's hope that won't be needed.
Right. Let's see what we have here. This is the main cockpit display. Various subsystems of the shuttle are monitored and controlled from here. It says power. Could it be that this button has something to do with the power system of the shuttle? Nah, that sounds way too obvious. This is the shuttle's cockpit. All the action takes place right here. Through the cockpit glass, you can see the shuttle bay interior. This looks like the launch initiation button. At least that's what it says it is. Oh, we'd better believe that then. These are navigational system readouts. You might want to fire up the sucker before you try that. Oh. This button activates the PTS system. What is the PTS system? It's the Intermix Confirmation Display button. Those are the words which inform you that the slot below accepts subroutine program disks. That makes sense. Can't you read? It's the subroutine program disk slot. I think the narrator is getting... Sheesh. So it's a little small. I'm so tired of hearing that. Too much information. Also, I think the narrator is getting fed up with me looking at everything. Looky there, it's the trunk handle. It appears to be a release handle for the hood of the shuttle. Oh, I don't need that now. I want to know what the PTS is. This is the photo triangulation system unit. It houses the optics as well as the print recorder and ejector. I guess it allows you to triangulate something via the use of photos. That's the retinal scanning unit. Upon launch initiation, the operator is asked to place his or her eye against it to be checked for proper authorization for operation. That might be a problem. Somehow I doubt that Roger has proper authorization for this thing. Oh, sweet, we've got movies and games. Cool! This button is for the movies option package available in the DS-86 series of shuttles. Too bad Starcon was way too cheap to spring for it. Ah. Cool. This button is for the games option package available on the DS-86 series. Too bad Starcon was way too cheap to spring for it. This panel would control the weapon systems were this shuttle so equipped. I'm betting it isn't, though. That's the co-pilot seat. You wonder why it looks stained. I don't want to know. It's the right side display panel. It's just mostly pretty lights and stuff. It appears to be the shuttle's version of a glove box. Ooh, anything in the glove box? It reminds you of one of those hand pumps you use when the astro head plugs up. It's a tube of Elmo's Gluzol. It's the most indispensable item in the universe. Duct tape. Well, those all sound like useful items, so let's take them. Anyway, let's try to get out of here. It's just another in the array of displays you are totally mystified by. Oh, I thought it might say something. You might want to find... Um, no, uh... Anyway, let's just press the launch initiation button. Intermix not correctly set. Make necessary adjustments before initiating launch sequence. Hmm, that sounds like a bad thing. I, C, D, eh? That was the Intermix configuration display, so... That's probably what we need. Okay, well, what we apparently can do here is um, set up the Intermix for the shuttle. Fuel tank 1 contains mercury at the moment. Fuel tank number 2 contains sulfur. Fuel tank number 3 contains potassium. And the catalyst is neon. And the current confirmation code is apparently lasagna. Wait, isn't that spelled wrong? Hmm, unless they're Dutch, because that, that is actually the correct Dutch spelling of the word lasagna. Um, I guess it might be in other languages as well. Not English, though. This is the Intermix confirmation display. Once the proper four elements have been selected, along with the proper confirmation code, the shuttle is ready to fly. This is... Oh. 
Ja change the confirmation code. Snowy. Napkin. Fences. Lasagna. But only lasagna lights up, so apparently that's the one we have to uh, use, I guess. This puzzle is fairly uh, obscure, I have to say. These are all elements, and we found earlier in the computer a reference to the periodic table, and I mentioned that it is actually listed in the uh, uh, yeah, in the manual. Well, let's take a look at the uh, periodic element, of uh, the uh, periodic table. Now, uh, all of these elements of symbols, of course, and if we remember the confirmation code, lasagna, LA is actually lanthanum, and um, S is sulfur, AG is silver, and NE is neon. So that's actually what you need to do. You need to set this to lanthanum. Sulfur is already right. Silver and neon. Okay, that should do the trick. Let's try the launch initiation button again. Intermix confirmed. Stand by for retinal scan. I'm standing by. It wouldn't be prudent. Maybe I need to use my eyes with it. Oh. Unauthorized personnel initiating launch shutdown. Well, that sucks. I guess we're going to need um, to fool the scanner, much like we did in Space Crash 3 with the photograph of uh, Elmo. But we're going to have to figure out how to do that in the next video. Welcome back. Roger has failed the uh, retinal scan. It seems he does not have authorization to use the shuttle. Are you really surprised? Now, uh, we need to fool the scanner somehow, for which we will need... Um, well, somebody has eyeball, I guess. Somebody who does have authorization. Now, who do we know who um, is a good enough friend of Roger to uh, help us with this? may be authorized to use a shuttle, and will be capable of giving up their eyeball. Why, Circuit Sydney, of course. He already gave us an arm, after all. So why not an eyeball? And yes, I know that if you talk to Sydney twice the first time you meet him, um, he will already give you the eyeball. But I did not want to do that because we didn't know we needed it yet. And it makes more sense if you do it this way. And you know I am all about making sense. Sydney, I kind of need another favor. I need one of your eyes. Pardon me, Roger. For a second, I thought you said you also wanted one of my eyes. I must have my auditory circuits diagnosed. Well, actually, Sydney, I, I could use one of your eyes. Are you certain, Roger? Well, I guess if you really need it. Oh, I do. I really do, Sydney. You're a mechanized lifesaver. You will return them soon, right, Roger? Right. Oh, uh, of course, Sydney. Real soon. Listen, I've got a couple of things I've got to attend to. I'll see you soon. Uh, thanks, Sydney. As long as you say it will be soon, Roger. Oh, yeah. Uh, see you soon, Sydney. In actuality, it will be more along the lines of never. And now we have an eyeball. I mean... An additional one. Which apparently does not have a message if you try to look at it. What the hell? 
It's the most indispensable. It's the right arm circuit Sydney was so kind to loan you. This is Sydney's left eye. Okay. I don't know why it wouldn't let me uh, look at that stuff uh, just now. Okay, back to the show, eh? One of the things we've uh, actually no longer have, if you check our inventory, is the fish. Thank goodness for that. I mean, what did we need with that rotting fish anyway? I guess they took it away when we were throwing in the brig. Although why they didn't take away the data quarter, no one knows. <laughs> Nobody goes to check on them or anything. this one. Okay, let's see if um, we are able to uh, start up the shuttle now and get out of here. Save Stellar! Every moment we waste, Stellar's life could be in danger. Which is why it's such a good thing that I keep stopping to look at stuff. Alright, stand by for retinal scan. So now let's put uh, Sydney's eye up to the scanner. Let's see if this sucker works. Why am I reminded of the longest journey? Uh oh, stormtroopers! We just randomly start shooting. I guess they went through the stormtrooper motion hey, ship again. Here's your fish! No, I don't want the damn fish! Somehow it seems we just can't get rid of it. And off we go. Janitor Wilco, what are you doing? You have no authorization to take that shuttle. To make matters worse, you have launched into the middle of a super double reverse anti-anomaly. You will turn that ship around immediately and head back to the shuttle bay. Do you understand, Wilco? Bite me, Commander. What was that last transmission, Wilco? Uh, we're, um... Having a little problem with the signal, sir. I mean, uh, with all due respect, sir, I did plead with you not to leave Stellar behind. Sir, I sense that something's just not right with that community. I don't believe Stellar is dead, and I just can't leave her there. I'm going to do this, sir, regardless of the consequences. Stellar saved my life not once, but twice. I owe her. Well, that was her own stupid mistake. I demand that you return at once, Wilco. If you do so and surrender now, your record will be taken into consideration during your disciplinary hearing. That won't help. Oh, that'll help you loads. See? 
I'm sorry, sir, but I just can't. I have to do this. Wilco, you fool! Come on, we saved the universe, like, four times. Just then, the shuttle is sucked into the anti-anomaly. Communication with the deep ship has been disrupted. Well, at least it'll stop them going after us, I think. So as long as we don't encounter any problems, everything will be just fine. I just had to say that, didn't I? Now what happened? We're standing still. I don't like that. I like moving. This is the shuttle's cockpit. Oh. No description for the starfields. There's a flashing light here. This button activates the manual override state. It is effective only while in flight. Well, since it's flashing, I guess we're going to have to use it. The hell? Sir, I am unable to access the navigational computer. I am guessing that it may have overloaded just as the Divalium crystal somehow went offline. Once repairs have been made and the shuttle engines have been re-fired, I believe I can follow the deep ship's ion trail back to Delta Berxelon 5. How did he know we wanted to do that? That would be quite cool, Manuel. You sure about that? Once the Divalium crystal has been repaired, our electrical system re-established and the engines fired, I am 97.2% certain. Why only 97.2%? I judged 97.2% to sound more hip to our audience than would 100. You would have to mention it. Sorry. I always wondered about that. Don't apologize to me. It's the players you ruined it for. Again? No sign of the fourth wall. I guess manual uh, override here is uh, something a bit like the uh, autopilot from Airplane. You know, the blow-up doll. That's manual override, your holographic navigator. Sir, we are unable to proceed with the Divalium crystal offline. A lack of power to restart the engines and with a potential engine blockage. Okay. That means that we need to um, check those things out and fix them. Well, first of all, the Divalium crystal, which is behind this hatch, uh, which, because it said so when we looked at it before. Let's take a look. Wow. The crystal seems to have broken. I swear, it wasn't me. Now we're in deep. Hey, I've gotten us this far, haven't I? Yes, and what a wonderful place it is. Hmm. How did I get hooked up in this deal? My agent's going to be hearing from me big time. Whatever. It seems a piece of the uh, Divalium crystal is missing. Now how can we fix that? Come to think of it, haven't we seen a Divalium crystal before? Indeed we have. In the data quarter. That's why we still have it. See, there it is. This is the data quarter power source. A tiny chip of Devalium Crystal, the official power source of Starcon. Sweet! Okay, well I'm sure if we just put that on there, it'll uh, work just fine. Boy, wouldn't it be cool if that really worked? Sure would be. But it doesn't. I guess it won't stay in place by itself, but we have glue! Elmo's Gluzol. 
So let's put some glue on the... Uh, you pour glue all over the crystal. On the crystal. Put some glue on this crystal as well. And then glue it in place. You hold the glue-coated segment to the broken devalium crystal for 10 seconds to set the glue. That was easy. All appears well in the crystal compartment. Let's confirm that with Manuel. I am here to serve you, sir. Great. Sir, the Divalium crystal seems to be in proper configuration, but I'm afraid we'll need a power boost to restart the engines. I'm sensing that we may also have some sort of engine inlet blockage as well. Okay, so it sounds like we're going to have to jump start the engine, and we're going to have to take care of that blockage. But we'll have to do so in the next video. Welcome back. We have hit a little snag in our plans to rescue Stellar, namely the fact that we appear to have a uh, engine clogging problem, and we also need to, to jump start the engines. To fix that, we are going to have to go EVA. And we will, of course, need uh, to get under the hood in order to uh, jump start the engine. So let's open that from here. And we'll also need to get into the trunk, actually. You pull the handle and hear something release on the outside of the shuttle. There we go. Can we close this panel again, by the way? Probably a good idea to do. Okay, now let's go EVA. So, let's just go outside. I'm sure the dangers of space are greatly exaggerated. EVA suits weren't designed just as a fashion statement, Roger. Oh. Well, that was not a good idea. That's the second time in two games that Roger's fallen out of an airlock. So, there was an EVA suit in this closet that we saw earlier, so let's uh, take it. As well as the helmet. And wear it, of course. So, I think this time it ought to be a little bit safer to uh, go outside. Strangely enough, there's also no decompression winds when you are wearing the EVA suit. I guess we depressurized the uh, shuttle. This is dangerous, by the way, going EVA without a tether or anything securing him to the shuttle. But anyway. The unfilled hollow of space is now just a fabric's thickness away. You forgot just how much more spectacular the view is from outside. You won't find anything like this in any oxygen-filled environment, except maybe for that small vacuous chamber barely holding your ears apart. Just couldn't resist the temptation of throwing another insole in there, could you? That, of course, is your freshly stolen shuttle from the Deep Ship 86. Here it is. Hey, that's me. Well spotted. Okay, well, something was apparently clogging the engines. That, of course. Oh. And I think I can spot it here, and as you might have guessed, it's, uh... What's with this fish deal? Now one stuck in the engine intake. It's our fish! I agree. <laughs> yes, that'll work in a vacuum <laughs> as a way to move yourself. Oh well, too late to complain about physics. In Space Quest games, we have the fish back. 
is off with that fish. I want to get rid of it. I'm going to throw it out into space. It would appear that merging those two items is not a good idea. Ah, it won't let me. Damn it! Well, I guess we're going to have to hold on to hold on to it then. Uh, there are some items in the uh, boot here. It's a help sign. These are the shuttle's jumper cables. That sure doesn't make you feel real secure about this spacecraft if those are standard equipment. Yes, indeed. Of course we'll need the jumper cables. How does he do that? Um, it makes NASA look really silly that they invested millions of dollars in... Uh, these rocket EVA maneuvering thingies they use with the space shuttle. Well, apparently you can just push yourself forward with your arms in space. Okay, that's all we need from the trunk. Of course, in order to jump start, we need uh, another ship to jump start. Uh, it from supply the juice we need for that so let's put the uh, help sign up and wait until somebody stops I mean considering that the universe is infinitely large and we're in the middle of nowhere and in the middle of a double reverse anti-anomaly I'm sure somebody will be along uh, within uh, too long It's like the least effective possible way to call for help in space. Roger can probably play chess against himself and still lose. Even more time passes. Wow! Somebody actually showed up! Hello, sweetheart. You look like you could use a little assistance. Is there anything I can do? Well, yes, there is. Thanks for stopping. Well, you just name it, I guess. It seems I've stalled my engines. Could you give me a jump? I, I have cables. I'd jump you in a heartbeat, dollface. I guess you must have got caught up in that anti-anomaly. It can be a real pain in the... <laughs> well, anyway, let's get it done. When the hell did Roger get so popular with the ladies? Well, here's your end of the cables. I'll let you know when I'm all hooked up. Why do I feel like we've stumbled into a Leisure Suit Larry game? Contact! Also, what the hell um, does the name Wrigley Remind me of. Hmm. Okay, why do we want to put the red cable? Well, I guess, uh... Hmm. Oh, I guess I'm just gonna wing it. Okay, Manuel. We're all hooked up. Give it a try. You pick strange methods of getting a charge out of life. Okay, that wasn't such a good idea. I remember um, the recall notice. This would be a good time to uh, recall that, you could say. 
It's the recall notice for the owner's manual. It reads, Dear Ham Shuttle Owner. We've already seen that. The important part is that we have to attach the plus cable to um, the pole, which looks like this, and the minus cable to the pole, it looks like an O. So, um, that'd be this one. Why does it even have so many poles if it's <laughs> just two cables? I don't know. And that one, I guess. Okay, manual. We're all hooked up. Give it a try. I you guess... pick strange methods of getting a charge out of life. I guess that wasn't it after all. I think maybe they need to go the other way around, perhaps. Um... What's this, by the way? Warranty notice. That's just another thing I don't understand. There's something about a fish here. Can't really read it anyway. That's just another thing. That's just another thing. Oh, I think he doesn't say anything else for this screen. That's too bad. Okay, let's try it the other way. Uh, oh, wait, I see. Did I click that one or that one? Uh, but I thought it was this way around, but I think I need that one and not... Okay, manual. We're all hooked up. That Give one. it a try. Yes, there we go. We've got power! Bye bye, sugar bunny. I gotta be running along. Hey, thanks for stopping to help me. See ya. Oh, so that's where I knew the name of me from. To play on Ripley. Okay, at least we've got power back and we fixed the engine clock, so we should probably head back inside and continue our journey. You need journey. to replace the EVA suit in its proper place. We should be able to. Continue on towards Delta Berxelon 5. Good work, sir. I believe I can now follow the Ion Trail of Deep Ship 86 back to Delta Berxelon 5. Good. Then make it so. Initiating warp sequence. We seem to be on approach to the uh, retirement facility. And we have arrived. Look outside. Through the shuttle's view screen is the visual splendor of Delta Berxelon 5. Well, visual splendor. It's mainly purple. Okay. And this should take us back inside. <laughs> To the Ascendo Pad. We've been here before, and I guess this is as good a time as any to spend some time looking around here. Because as I said before, this location has more funny messages than any other uh, location in the entire game. But we'll have to do that in the next video. Welcome back! We have returned to Delta Berxelon 5 in an attempt to um, rescue Stellar. 
And we are, are back in the Ascendo pad, which as I said before, it has a wealth of messages, which I skipped before, but now let's take a look around. The wall panels of the Ascendo pad are formed from a core of fiber steel between dual layers of expanded polycarbamite sheathing that's guaranteed not to rust, chip, peel, or need repainting for at least 12 millennia. This is probably more than you wanted to know. That's a safe bet. This port interfaces visiting shuttles with the Ascendo pad. This portway interfaces the Ascendo pad with most of the rooms in the Golden Light Years Research Building. These hermetically sealed components house the Ascendo pad's direction correction connections, the quark torque fork, and the ascension dissension suspension tension extensions. Try saying that ten times fast. The Ascendo pad works much like an elevator. In fact, if you can figure out why we didn't just call it an elevator, please let us know. Three words, I think. Rule of funny. Beneath the Ascendo pad, the lift bay relay outlay array quietly does its thing. And if anyone knows what that thing is, I don't know what. These hydraulic brakes allow the Ascendo pad to stop smoothly. Note that you can't really see them from where you are, but you, uh, uh, you somehow sense they're there. Yeah, that's it. You somehow sense that they're there. That's the ticket. No need to get sar sarcastic. The Ascendo pad slides smoothly along these four rails, usually. Usually? Should I be worried? The Ascendo pad oh. in... Now you might think that's it, but it's not. You mistake the dual layers of polycarbamite sheathing for some sort of lickable wallpaper, and you give the wall a lick. Hey, the snozberries taste like snozberries. An actual taste message. The only one in the game, I think. Wait, did we look at the sign? No, I don't think so. This display shows you the Ascendo pad's current location. Ah. Unless you miss your guess, this button will take the Ascendo pad to the docking bay. Your highly developed sixth sense tells you that this button will take you to someone's quarters. Your keen janitorial instincts tell you that this button takes you to Lab A. Every fiber of your being cries out, This button will take me to Lab B. He's good at this, isn't he? I want to go to the docking bay. Up, up and away! Unfortunately, the elevator does not respond to verbal commands. You attempt and fail to press the quarters button with your tongue. Hmm. Ben Gay. <laughs> you deftly attempt to press the Lab A button with your tongue. Unfortunately, you lack the lingual strength to depress the button fully, but you deduce from the taste that whoever pushed this button last has recently been sifting through sewage. Well, that's good to know, I guess. Take me to Lab B. I have clearance. Believing you utterly, the Ascendo pad immediately descends to Laboratory B, where it drops you off and you save the galaxy. The end. As if. <laughs> um, what else can we do? The Lip Bay Relay Outlay Array is permanently lubricated. Licking it will not help. Don't distract them. They're holding your life in their hands. Hi, Drolix. Wow, that has to be the worst joke of the entire game. It's times like these that we know your elevator doesn't quite reach the top. It's no use screaming for help at a time like this. Nobody cares what happens to you. That's actually a plot point, believe it or not. 
You're about to ask, where am I? Until you notice that the little lights overhead actually spell out the name of the location. Wow! And another fun one. Probably one of my favorites here. I bid thee close. If you're staying in here, Graham, I'm going out there. <laughs> the first time I heard that, I was literally rolling on the floor. That is a brilliant uh, joke, but only if you've played King's Quest V. If, if you haven't, you wouldn't understand this. So then, go play it, then come back to this, or wait until I do a Let's Play of it, which might be a while. Then come back to this, you'll get it, and you'll agree with me that it's funny. Open you. Um, oh, he only does that with this door. Okay, well, if you can talk to it again when it's closed, you'll get a similar message. From inside the Ascendo pad, you can't reach the lift bay relay outlay array. Heck, you can't even say lift bay relay outlay array. You can't operate these hydraulic brakes manually. You'd shear your hand off into a thin smear of blood, mashed flesh, and pulverized bone. I want to see that. But hey, it's something to think about, right? Sure. The Ascendo pad guide rails are like elementary algebra beyond your grasp. You try to rust, chip, peel, or repaint the walls of the Ascendo pad, but the dual layers of expanded polycorbomite prevent you. They're true to their word. Don't touch it. You'll break the magic spell that keeps it working. How oh, so technology is magic. Good to know. These components are permanently sealed so that clumsy, ham-handed adventurers who like to fiddle with everything won't accidentally kill themselves. Well, that was nice of them. You're far too much of a wuss to pry open the portal doors. Plus, they don't actually open on this level. Just walk through it. No sleight of hand is required. Okay, um, I think that's about it. The reason this screen has so many more messages than all of the others is apparently because this is one of the few screens of the game where Josh Mandel actually wrote the script. Whereas uh, he didn't for most of the other locations. I think he also did the uh, uh, the, uh, the what's it called? The replicator. The Mr. Soylent, that's the name I was looking for. And apparently he really likes these kinds of silly messages, so that's why there's so many of them. You press the lab B button, but the Ascendo pad doesn't move. Apparently you need some sort of clearance to get to lab B. So it won't open. I didn't want to go to lab B anyway. No messages for this. It's a bit of a shame. Anyway, um, we could try and return to the scene of the crime, which is the quarters. Except it seems that the doors aren't opening. Uh, now that this door is closed, actually. I bid thee open. If you're going in there, Graham, I'm staying out here. Which is the inverse of the message we just got. Open you. What it still doesn't do. You're far too. You can't go outside at the quarter, so let's try lap A instead, which is the only place we can actually go. And here we can uh, go out the door. Wow, a mad scientist working on a planet called Delta Berksalon. You wonder what he's doing here? Designing women, perhaps? I think I'm missing a reference there. Sorry. <laughs> We've been here before. It's where we originally beamed in. This is one of the nanotechnology laboratories in the Golden Light Years Research Installation. 
It's too dark to make out any details beneath the grid, but you think you can hear whirs, clanks, and clicks far, far below. Well, this one has a funny one, too, actually. Just for the purposes of exploration, you hork a loogie down the grid to see how long it takes to splat at the bottom. You never hear a splat. Cool. Indeed, my friend. Indeed. A beautiful ruby-backed flagellant hops around in this cage, whipping itself with its prehensile tail. You peek inside the cage and see... Prip-thrip! A kind of moth that beats you up, steals your team jacket, and then eats it. How evil. A cybergenic incubator! You've heard about them. You've seen pictures in magazines, but you never thought you'd actually get to see one up close. Big whoop. Narrator was more impressed than Roger is, apparently. An overhead readout constantly displays the lab status. Oddly, it reports that all conditions report green. Perhaps it's colorblind. <laughs> Perhaps. A couple of Bunsen burners sit on the counter. Indeed they do. Hey, they've got their own multiband UV wave bath straight out of the Ed Mundane catalog. I don't know what that is. Can we turn on the Bunsen burners and burn the place down? They're permanently attached to the counter. You're hosed! We didn't need them. The lab table is illuminated by a full-spectrum trithysonium bulb that simulates the naturally occurring light of a trinary star system. Useful. This is the only piece of equipment in the lab that's totally unfamiliar to you. That's quite surprising. It appears biomechanical in nature, with a metallic skin that seems to expand and contract slightly. I have no idea what it is. You're not sure whether to turn it on, turn it off, open it, close it, disassemble it, pet it, wear it, whip up a batch of margaritas in it, launch it, or clean it. So in your decisive way, you do nothing with it. Good choice, probably. Do you understand me? Sprechen Sie Deutsch? Parlez-vous Francais? Klatu Barada Nikto? Apparently, it is either non-sentient or sentient, but a good enough judge of character not to want to encourage you. This depiction of a region holder is based on science fact and current NASA research. Science so hard, you could bounce an asteroid off of it. That statement and hard science don't really go together, do they? This depiction of... An Erlenmeyer flask. You think it's an Erlenmeyer flask? Except it's not. As usual, though, you're sadly mistaken. An Erlenmeyer flask is conical. This flask is spherical. Shows what you know. Actually, I knew that, but I also knew that that was the message, so... Or am I just pretending that to cover up my own mistake? You'll never know. This lab table has a conveniently round shape and pleasingly flat surface. It looks like a typical tank of smegminium, a cheesy substance used in the manufacture of projectiles, thrusters, and pistons. The markings on this tank indicate that it's full of fresnon, a deadly nerve gas. Symptoms of exposure include slurred speech, a red neck, raisin-like wrinkling of the face and extremities, and a sudden fondness for livestock. Oh, that's Fresno. Are we do anything with the cages? Don't let the crypt thrip out. It could be rabid, and there's nothing more dangerous than a rabid moth. I can think of a couple of things that are more dangerous. You'll keep your hand out of the ruby back flagellant's cage unless you're looking for an angry red welt across your knuckles. And who isn't? I don't get it. We'll continue in the next video. Welcome back. We have returned to Delta Barcelona 5 and are in Lab A. But we're having too much fun looking and interacting with all the stuff here to actually do anything useful. The sound of your voice irritates the caged creatures and makes them jump up and down excitedly and hoot and holler. That's odd. 
You had the same effect on the inmates when you toured the Starcon penal colony. And stop giggling at the word penal. Hey, I wasn't giggling. Just what this room needs. A wall light that gives off a pleasant red glow. It's not your job to change the light bulbs here, but someone seriously needs to. Can I talk to it? Can you change color, or are you just going to ignore me? It's going to ignore me. In this cage, you can just make out the familiar form of an Orion vivisectional mud puppy, the only creature in the universe that sedates itself, pins itself down, dissects itself, and lets you copy its lab notes. Wow, that saves a lot of time in school, I guess. This cage appears to be full of endearing little furry purring creatures. You vaguely remember seeing similar creatures on someone's screensaver. What are they? Tribbles, or...? I don't know, gremlins? Careful! The Orion vivisectional mud puppy also enjoys vivisecting the occasional humanoid finger. Hey, 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 careful! These endearing gremlins. little furry purring creatures have only three rules. Don't get them wet, don't feed them after midnight, and... Uh... Oops, wrong endearing little furry purring creatures. Oh, not gremlins. Whatever. Books. There's a nice variety of books on the doctor's shelf. The Hidden Life of Orats. What they don't teach you at StarCon Academy. All I need to know I learn from the Q Continuum. And the hunt for Red Corpuscle. Nice. You've got far more important things to do than read books right now. Like play computer games. Definitely. These are old-fashioned books. You can't talk to them, print them out, edit them, transmit them, or upload them. I think it's a damn box. Anything in it the box? It wouldn't be prudent to do that at this juncture. I guess not. Your words cause everything. No, oh, I think we run out of uh, custom messages there. It's just techie stuff. There is a Callahan Mahdi here. Seems you remember talking about those things to someone recently. Hmm, indeed. Fester Blatz. We also used him to get rid of a certain Nigel Rancid. Mr. Wilco, I would advise you to stay out of my personal belongings. I do not want to have to get physical with you. Mind you, I will if I have to. And don't think I can't take you. Oh. He doesn't want me to take his stuff. Surprisingly. Actually, it's more surprising that he doesn't just turn us in. Say, they've got all four volumes of Asik Iasimov's Foundation Trilogy. There's something wrong with that sentence. You've got far more important things. It looks like maybe it holds a set of books or something. This would be something foreign to you. Indeed. Allergen. And it's from the Schlepper image catalog. Wank. It's also the only non-red light here, I think. You see no on-off switch. That's because this lamp has a motion detection rheostat that turns it on whenever anyone enters the room. Cool. It's also cheaper to animate that way. Well, at least they're honest. You start to say something and then you re Okay. Don't pick at it. What are all these papers? This lab report charts the progress of the Golden Light Years Orbital Retirement Village. By Arnold's accent, what precisely do you think you're doing? I was just, uh... No, 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 I don't have time for your gibbering. Just leave that alone and don't slam the door behind you. If it's an automatic door, how can we slam it? 
The subject of this memo reads, Submicroscopic Neural Linkages. This page appears to be a memo from Sharpay to Dr. Bellows. I'd be interested in that. By Locerous chromosomes, what are you doing? I thought I... Uh... I don't care what you thought. Take your hands off my private papers and get out of here. Dr. Bellows does not appreciate our meddling. It's a monitor! You've seen one before. In fact, you're seeing two right now. Three, actually. Four, if you count my laptop. Gee, Dad, it's a North Gateway with five gigabytes of RAM, a molecular memory hard disk with infinite capacity, a dodecaspeed CD-ROM drive, micro-sloth compatible mouse, and a built-in 10K pin laser printer. Just three more gigabytes and you can install OS2 on it. <laughs> you can't talk to a computer. What do you think this is, 20th century Earth? Hello, computer. It's Dr. Bellows, Delta Berkselon's token evil scientist. Gee, Dad, it's oh. just three more... Let's talk to uh, Dr. Bellows and actually, you know, move on. Hello, Doctor. Janitor Wilco? What in blazes are you doing here? Well, Doc, I got a distress call. So why are you here? Because I know it originated here. In fact, it was from Stellar Santiago. Dun, dun, dun. You're out of your mind, Wilco. Now go away and leave me alone. I've got important work to do. Goodbye. I... I know something's up here, Doc, and I'm going to get to the bottom of it. You'll be sorry, pal. Yes, whatever you say, Wilco. Just get out of my face. And he leaves in a huff. Or slowly walks away anyway. Which is a good thing, because it allows us to rummage around with his computer, I guess. And to look at all that stuff that we couldn't look at before. Like the high-tech stuff. Ooh. It's just an old beat-up chip. It appears to be an old 1586 circuit board. Oh, that's right. You're not supposed to be a techie. We hope we didn't confuse you. It appears to be a Callahan Moddy. Hmm, seems you remember someone talking about these recently. I want that Moddy. You take possession of the Callahan Moddy. It's just boring techy stuff. You've heard of black boxes, haven't you? Well, this one's red. Actual black boxes are orange, you know. It's just boring. I don't need anything else here. Can we... You're hesitant to... Can I take a look at that you memo? You pick up the memo and read through it. Sharpay was concerned that the secondary transplant subject had evaded recruitment and that steps would need to be taken to either procure the subject forthwith or find a new STS. As usual, you're not really sure what they're talking about, but you're sure you don't like the sound of it. I have the feeling that this... Uh... Secondary transplant subject might be us. Can we do anything with this computer? Hey, it has a, a cyberjack, a cyberjack plug. It looks like a cyberjack plug receptor. If only we uh, had a cyberjack. It's unlike the. Uh, the ones in the, uh, on the ship, on the composts, we might actually be able to use this one. If we had a cyberjack. But we don't, so it's a bit pointless. Let's take a look in the computer anyway. A 
accounting. All accounting functions are currently down due to blah 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 blah. Thank you for your patience in this matter. That's actually not all that less descriptive than most real error messages. These aren't online yet. Apparently budget isn't a big concern here. Seems like it. Research. All research functions are down until further notice due to insufficient funding. Talk to your local congressperson to complain. I will. Ah, who wants to look at boring old research records? Try something else. Ah, looks like it's downloading something off the internet or something. Oh, it's a pop-up. After a click of the screen button, Plotigy begins to painfully, slowly fill the screen. Oh, screw it! Even you don't have the time or patience for this! Man, it must, uh, must be on dial-up here. We don't have a cyberspace jack. And obviously we need one, because remember what uh, Stellar said, that cyberspace might be the only way to get information about Nigel Rancid and Sharpay and all of the other uh, things we need. Find out what's actually going on here. However, we will need a cyber uh, space jack for that, like I said. Now, where would we, we be able to get one? Well, I think that might actually be the kind of thing that uh, dear old Fester Blatz might have. And um, we know that he trades moddies, and we just found a moddy. And since we haven't actually done anything at uh, Fester's yet, perhaps we should give that a try. The door is a mi what? The door is a microbe-safe biofilter with quasi-redundant filter seals. You'll never get it open by hand. Oh. So we have to go back to Polysorbate 60. Which means we have to go back to the uh, docking bay. Nice music here. Just walk. Okay, so we have to go back to um, Delta, no, to Polysorbate, but we'll do that in the next video. Welcome back. We uh, need a cyberspace jack, and we found a uh, Callahan Moddy. It's the Callahan Moddy you scavenged from Delta Berksalon. And we know that Fester Blatz of implants and stuff on Polysorbate trades in those things, so um, I guess we are going to have to go back to Polysorbate. Bet you didn't think we were going back there, did you? But we are. Sir, I believe I may be able to tap myself into the PTS and perform a limited set of functions. PTS? Yes, sir. PTS, the photo triangulation system. It was installed as a crude backup navigational device to the modern navigational computer system. It's what you see before you mount it in the middle view screen. Okay. So let's push the PTS button. And we need to take uh, two photographs in order for that to work. Uh, 
There we go. This is the photo taken with the photo triangulation system. Um, I think... Well, we got two of them. This is the second PTS photo. It has yet to be peeled apart. You need to peel apart the negatives. You peel apart the photo and negative from your first PTS image. You peel apart the photo and negative from the second PTS image. Okay, what you need to do is take one of the negatives and one of the photos and put them on the image uh, on this, this display. This looks to be just a backlit screen of some sort. That wouldn't prove... Your utterance... Nope, this isn't like the Ultimercial where you can talk to everything. So, uh, put negative on there. And put the other photograph on there, I believe. And the inventory has stopped cooperating. The hell? The PTS is online and working. We can now launch to polysorbate. Great! That's what we wanted to do! Oh, I guess we need to launch to Polysorbate 60. There we go again. Hopefully we won't have any mechanical trouble on the way this time. Okay, uh, now we're there. Now what do we do? Let's talk to uh, Manuel. What may I do for you, sir? Beam me down, Manny. Step over to the transport pad and I will beam you down to the surface of polysorbate. Manual tosses you a transport signaler. You can only use this from the place I beam you to. At least we uh, ended up on the street this time. I think Manuel may be better at beaming than that robot. Our hole is still there, though. Yes, you actually left a cool-looking mold of your lower torso. Well, actually, it's not that impressive. Outpost, the movie. Referring to the Sierra game Outpost, I think. Um, didn't this place used to have, you know, music? I don't know. Music is obviously still working, but not on the street for some reason. Well, let's see if old Fester is willing to do some trading for this here Marty. Hello there, Mr. Blatz. I think I have something you might be interested in. Think so, hey? Oh, I really think you'll find it interesting. Ooh! Why, I'd love to take that off your hands. Of course, you realize that it's illegal to sell those but I could trade you for something. Look around and see what interests you. I could really use a cyberspace jack. 
Tell you what, I'll trade you for one of those fine specimens in the case. What do you say? No, I want the jack or it's no deal. Oh, now take it easy, Sonny. I think we can do business. I'm glad you see it my way. It's been a pleasure. Take care, Fester. I gotta fly. And now we have a cyberspace jack. That's the cyberspace jack. Indeed it is. Okay, now we need to go back to the beginning screen. Too bad we don't have the room key anymore, otherwise we could have checked out uh, our room. Which we did, you know, pay for. Hey! Space Quest 5 is playing now. Okay, from here we should be able to use the um, transport signaler. And beam back to the shuttle. And then, you guessed it, we go back to Delta Berkslon. That was a pointless interlude now, wasn't it? Your whimper is my command, sir. Good. Launch initiation to Delta Berkslon. Huh. Back that way again now. to lab A. Where we can jack in the cyberspace. Of course this game was made in the mid-90s, so obviously their interpretation of the internet is somewhat uh, incorrect. In this case, probably done on purpose uh, for uh, humorous ends. Dr. Bellows is here, but I don't think he'll actually bother us. You know, he's a bit ticked at you. I'd leave him alone unless you've got something really important to bug him about. Well, we don't at this point, so let's jack into cyberspace first. Alright, let's see what happens. We can turn this on, go to Cyber Functions, and plug in that cyberspace jack. That was interesting. So this is cyberspace. It's different than what I expected. Talk about a brave new world. You'd better be up for it if you plan to explore this cyber terrain. This cyber terrain is just a little arid. It's just more evidence to confirm the old adage that if there's time enough to do it, there's time enough to do it half-assed. Very true, that. Talk about a brave new world. Uh. This cyber... That's quite a leap. You'd be able to clear it if you could get a running start. But you can't run in this game, only walk. In this space quest, you can't switch to sprint. 
Is that a jab at the product placement in Space Quest V? I think it was. And wouldn't you know it, we actually do need to go there. Whoops. Guess you're about to find out if there's cyber gravity. Apparently it does exist. As you plummet to your cyber death, you are confronted by a variant of an age-old question. If you fall and hit the ground within cyberspace, and no one is there to hear it, will you make an audible splat? Yes. Yep. Smooth move, Xlax. Guess this cyberspace thing can be pretty painful. And I'm not just talking about the rates. Okay, well, I guess we're gonna have to take the uh, long way around. Why is that road upside down? Talk about a brave new world, you'd better... Oh. This cool cyber cacti. Not even cyberspace is immune from the mentally deficient types who shoot at road signs. How macho they must think they are. What's this thing in the middle? Talk about a brief... This cyber... Nothing, apparently. Alright, we're gonna have to take the long way around to get to where we're going. But we'll do so in the next video. Welcome back. We've jacked into cyberspace to find out some information about Nigel Rancid, the one of the thugs who attacked us, or kidnapped us, or whatever. And maybe also about Sharpe, but unfortunately, this game was made before Google came around, so uh, finding the information might be a tad difficult. For one thing, we need to go to the left there, and we can't, so we're gonna have to go to the right instead. And the uh, layout of this place is somewhat strange. Oh wait, now we're over there. Wait, bird seed? Hey, free bird seed, and so conveniently placed under a huge boulder too. Hey, free. Forget it. You don't resemble that bird. Well, except for the pin feathers in those chicken legs of yours. Meep meep. Let's move on. Yes, this is going to take a while. Oh, now we're over there. Knowing that the scrolling is somewhat uh, slow in uh, those box. This whole segment would be a lot smoother if that weren't the case. But unfortunately, it is the case. This is actually a pretty fair representation of what browsing the internet was like back in the days of Alta Vista. Slow, annoying, and boring. But we'll get there eventually. Perhaps, maybe. Don't worry, we don't have to do this again on the way back. That's one consolation, at least. Have we made it? I think so. Yes. A stop sign. For those of you who aren't paying attention, that's a stop sign. Hey, leave the signs alone. Were you born in North Fork or what? Your words are so unspect. Yeah. Anyway. Yay. We made it. We want to go to the office, I guess. It's an office sign. 
Hey, leave the sign. Yeah, it's the same message. Well, that was needlessly long and pointless. Wait, that's a bit redundant. Looks like they're under construction here. Pardon our dust. Future site of the Information Superhighway Executive Offices. Opens 6,345. Or 7,000, 8,000, 9,000. Never! I guess the project has some delays. The sign says it all. There was much talk and rhetoric about the Information Superhighway, but the executive and legislative branches seem quite opposed to getting together on just about anything either one of them introduces. Just look at the space program. Anyway, the frustration of a former employee is documented in the amendments to the Opens date. Indeed. Wow, a genuine Tonkoid M501. And the best year, too. It's been a long time since it's rolled over any plastic crate. Yeah, looks like the work has been uh, laying still here for a while. Wow, a jet... It's a BFT-9000 Cyber Earth Mover. That makes perfect sense. A long section of board lies on the ground. Can we take that? Bet you can't fit that thing in your pants. Guess I was wrong. It does fit. There must be plenty of spare room in there. Well, we already fit a ladder in there once, so I'm not that surprised. And besides, this is cyberspace. This is the one time in all of the games when it actually makes sense that he can do that. Girders. Some of the building materials some airheaded committee thought necessary for their project lay unused and heavily rusted. You etch your initials in the rust, like anyone will notice. Fresh out of spray paint, you are only able to read it. It's been sitting far too long to be able to start now. Ah. Uh. It's out of commission now, but you did always dream of driving one of these babies when you were a rug rat. Old highway safety devices recycled from either a decade or ten years ago stand alert and ready for the non-existent workers to use. A rag hangs from the sawhorse. Who knows what it last wiped up? Can I take that? It wouldn't be prudent to... I guess not. Hard to spot. There's actually a screwdriver on the floor here. A screwdriver lies on the ground, probably discarded by the malcontent who vandalized the sign. We can pick that up, and we'll need it, so... A carelessly discarded bucket of building material has been spilled and allowed to harden. The Port Ahead by Schrode Johns Incorporated stands silently waiting to make its designated collection of organic waste products. Can we go to the toilet? Oh, mama! I'm guessing one too many burritos for the last guy in here. I guess the smell is too bad. We'll have to hold it up until we get back out of cyberspace. This seems to be the contractor's office for the information superhighway. It's not too congested. Not quite, no. Old highway safety device. Yeah. In case you're able to see text only, and not pictures, the sign says, Office. Thank you for that information. This is the temporary on-site supervisor's office. It was abandoned with the rest of the project once funding was slashed. Let's head inside. Wow. Cyberspace looks familiar. You saw it here first. A preview of the famed Information Superhighway. Wow. Something else made waiting Next. times. Next. The waiting times uh, might be a bit long. It looks like some poor slob actually waited for his number to be called and died for his troubles. Looks like a programmer just prior to shipping. True. This is the magic window whence you came. 
Get your head out. That's not a good thing to do. You have none. No options. <laughs> you probably want us to say something corny like Klingons in Sector 2-8, Captain. Well, you just did. What? You expect a help function for only fifty-nine ninety-five? Yes, I do. You summon the ability. Don't pick at... That would... Uh... Your utterance is... Nope. Very tidy. A trash can. That might be a perfect place to store all those vital screen-saving programs like that cool Yasser Arafat version you've downloaded from P.O.L. Pardon me, but I'm just a little nervous about this trash can thing. Didn't someone already go to court and spend wads of buckazoids over this? Gary! 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 Just read the copy, for Christ's sakes! We're not paying you to think. We just want that pretty voice of yours. All right, you friggin' union geek. Okay, people. Mr. Owens has gathered himself together, and we are ready to pick it up from that oh-so-fascinating Barney Fife meets Barry Mason segue. All right. <clears throat> Animation to speed. And roll. As if it wasn't enough that Roger talks to the narrator. Next. Now, the narrator is getting into arguments with uh, the director. That makes perfect sense. Although just a false front icon, it holds the promise of a tomorrow where true plug-and-play AM radio is no longer just a dream. That's a clock icon. Indeed it is. A darling little fan icon decorates the accessories program group. Who wrote this stuff? Look, they even plan to have screen savers. A good idea for when those lines are all tied up. Who says they aren't thinking ahead? Can we use any of the icons? <laughs> this world's a great big ball of dirt with 50... That's the uh, Mr. Soylent song, which we've already heard. Next. That's delightfully not... That wouldn't... Huh. The screensaver does not work. Similar to the mint bowl found on the desks of receptionists in those pre-super information highway days, a mint candy icon symbolically takes up valuable desktop space. Can we eat it? You virtually eat the nearly real mint. Your virtual breath is now virtually minty fresh. That is virtually a good thing. It looks strangely like a bell. And the uh, receptionist appears to be Sisini. I guess anybody who's younger than me is not actually going to get that, but anyway. That, boys and girls, is Sis Inny. She runs things around here like an Iron Maiden. With the firmness of titanium BVDs, with the control of a steel belt reinforced brazier. Good to know. Cool. That looks like the file place. Everyone knows that's the file manager. Whatever. It still blows. Even a lowly pond sucking janitor knows that. I'm sure Win 2001 will be better. Well, you hold your breath, and I'll hold what I want while waiting for it, and we'll see who's... Cheese it. Someone is listening to us, and I'm certain they didn't pay to hear this. You're right. They'd probably like to hear more of me. I am the hero. Actually, the narrator is way more interesting than you, Roger. Also, there is no win 2001, unless you want to count XP as 2001. What do you know? And ooh, let's puke card Fusion 500! Hewlett's Packard, of course. That's the refreshments folder. Don't be looking for your father's playboys in here, either. Next. Are there any refreshments? It wouldn't be prudent to do that at this junk. That's delight. I guess not. Also no periodicals. 
Numbered cyber cards hang here, chiming peacefully in the cyber breeze. What? Cut! Wait a minute! What is this chiming in the cyberspace crap? Scott, get over here! Change this! What? Freaking director. This guy would know a good line if it climbed up his... Oh, here. All right, that's better. Right again, Gary. Numbers hang here. I think I like the first version better. You saw it here first. A preview of the... Fa oh, wow. Uh-oh, looks like it could be a long wait for you, too. The spirit of DMV lives on. Well, we'll see if we can actually get a turn... Next. ...in the next video. I should have timed that so that she said next, but that would have been almost impossible. Anyway... Welcome back! Cyberspace looks suspiciously like Windows 3.1. Anyway, I guess the files are what we need. Just what do you think you're doing, sir? Well, I, uh, I didn't think you'd mind if I just looked through your files. And I thought I'd seen it all. Just step back and wait your turn. You may just have improved your chances of getting to the files with that slick little maneuver. Sometimes you do surprise me, Roger. Okay, um, let's talk to the receptionist. Does your number match the one shown by the counter? No, uh, I don't seem to have that one, but... Oh, I am sorry, sir. Strangely enough, there's no provision for butts in this system. You either have the number shown, or you do not. Now, please await the calling of your number. Thank you very much. I have important things to do. Okay. Next. Because we need a number. Unfortunately, it's a number three. And we're on ten. This is going to take ages. It's the number three card you took from the card dispenser. Well, maybe we can uh, mess up the numbers a bit. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. Uh-oh, look... Oh. It wouldn't be prudent. Don't touch that. Hmm, <clears throat> looks like you can't adjust it manually, but maybe a screwdriver would help. All right, let's see what she has to say now. Does your number match the one shown by the counter? As a matter of fact, I do possess that number. Read it and weep, pixel woman. Oh no, you can't possibly. Oh. Well, I guess you're right. You bet your palate, little 32 by 32 pixel mama. And there we go, into the files. This could take a while. Let's take a look. This floor looks pretty clean, at least by your standards. Oh. Why is there a fire extinguisher in cyberspace? Well, I guess it's no more u uh, no more uh, weird than all the other stuff uh, we've seen. A darn capable fire extinguisher stands ready to save all this paper in the event of a fire. They've spared no expense. Massive file cabinets stretch off into the distance. This should be a cinch. The ceiling has all the accoutrements any self-respecting ceiling should have. To be honest, it's not quite what you imagined when you thought of Super Highway. Oh, that doesn't look good. Apparently the ladder hasn't been relocated in some time. That might make it difficult to get to some of the higher, uh, files. Do I really have to tell you what that is? 
Yes. Do I really? Each sign denotes the range of alphabetized files in that row. Okay. Then we should go and look for the files we need. And first let's look for Nigel Rancid, which is under the R, of course. Which I guess is all the way at the end of this. Uh... Man, these filing cabinets are a mess. Even I could keep them up better than this. I doubt it. Man, these filing. And most of these you cannot actually open. That file apparently doesn't want to open. The only ones that can open are the ones that have uh, an indentation like that. And that appear to be a little bit uh, extended. Okay, we're, here we are at the end. You can see that I think this one has that little edge. That file... Oh, it does not. Oh wait, okay, sorry, I'm looking wrong. It's this one, actually. It's a bit high. Though we can open it, we can't get there. But we can conveniently use some of these other files as a staircase. Oh. Let's see. Rancid Nigel. Rand Ain. Randolph Macon, WC. Rankin Jeanette, Raspberries, Rasputin Grigori, Rats, and Rattlesnakes. Well, let's just look at Nigel's file. I don't think you can actually look at any of the others. See? That wouldn't prove. You can't. Okay, let's see what we have. Nigel Rancid and his brother Singent are hired thugs. Most recently, the Rancid brothers have been employed by Dr. Hayden Bellows and Sharpe of the Golden Lightyear's Retirement Community on Delta Berkslon 5. Cross-reference Bellows, Sharpe, and Santiago. Interesting. So, um, I guess we need to look up uh, those as well. So we need to go and get um, Bellows, Sharpe, Sharpe and Santiago. Let's go do Bellows first. We should be near the start of this uh, corridor. Um, yeah, maybe that one. Yes. There we go. Behan Brendan, Behavioral Sciences. Beiderbecker Bix, Beirut Lebanon. Blasco David, Bellows Dr. H, Belinsky Vasarian, and Bellamy Ralph. I don't know most of those names. Um, let's get the Bellows file. And read it. Dr. Hayden Bellows is the Chief Medical Administrator of the Golden Light Years Retirement Community. He has gained much notoriety over his controversial efforts to mitigate the effects of, some say to altogether eliminate, aging. Cross reference Sharpe Santiago. While judging by the state of Sharpe, I'd say he has not yet succeeded in that effort. So, Sharpe and Santiago then. San Francisco, Sanger Margaret, San Claude, or something, San Souci, Santa Claus, Santiana George, Santiago Chile, 
and Santiago. Stellar. I want the Santa Claus file. That wouldn't prove fulfilling. Yes, it would. I disagree with you there, narrator. Let's see what they have to say about Stellar. Corpsman Stellar Santiago was a member of the Starcon fleet before her departure from this world while attempting to rescue a janitor second class who was stationed aboard SCS Deep Ship 86. Cross-reference Sharpe Bellows. That does not tell us what she has to do with anything. So let's see if we can find... Uh, Sharpe's file, which I believe is in the drawer up here. We have to use these other two as a staircase again. Sherry Vomar, who is a bridge player. Sharpe, Shaw Irwin, Sheen Charlie, Sheen Martin, Sheep, Sherman Allen, and Sherman William T. Sharpe, of course, is what we need. Let's see what it says about uh, her. Now, that should be interesting. A philanthropist of the First Order, this benefactor of many good causes, is known throughout the universe simply as Sharpe. Sharpe's most recent project has been the Golden Light Years Retirement Community on Delta Bruxelon 5, where she hopes to spend her declining years. Always thinking of others, this grand lady will leave a legacy of charitable works behind her when she goes. Cross-references... Bellows, Santiago, additional cross-reference, Project Immortality. I have the feeling this is like Wikipedia and she edited the page herself. Because it sounds rather... too good for her. We have an additional cross-reference, Project Immortality, which seems to be connected to with uh, the thing that Dr. Bellows is doing. Trying to stop aging. Oh, uh, wait. Wrong corridor. We go here. To the P is, I think, where this is uh, filed here. And you could actually get this file before you knew about it. However, if you do so, the game will subtract a hundred points for cheating. Project Liability, Project Immortality, Prokofiev, Prometheus, Pronghorn, Propaganda, Propeller Heads, are they talking about the Super Mario Brothers Wii uh, power-up? Probably not. Prostate. Let's see. Project Immortality. The holy grail of narcissists everywhere. Project Immortality is the cold, hard scientific name applied to the cold, hard science that is the fountain of youth of our times. Project Immortality is funded by R. Sharpe and overseen by controversial Dr. Hayden Bellows. It promises humankind the hope of the ages, eternal life. Sure makes marriage a scary proposition though, doesn't it? Cross-reference Endgame. Uh, there is actually no Endgame file. But it seems that Sharpe and uh, Dr. Bellows are involved in some shady dealings with regards to um, this project Immortality, and somehow Stellar is involved. And probably we would have been unless Stellar, uh, except Stellar took our place. Okay, now we can't take uh, these files with us out of cyberspace, so we need to print them. The cyber printer accepts your cyber file gratefully and begins to print. 
The question is, what exactly is the output of a cyber printer? Good question. I'll have to print the rest of the files in the next video. Welcome back. We have found the files we need. In order to take them with us out of cyberspace, we have to print them. Let's just hope that comes out somewhere. And then we'll see if we can uh, confront somebody about this evidence we found. Find out what's truly going on here. And if... Well, what do you know? Maybe there is something to this superhero reputation thing after all. And after that episode with the egg beater, I thought you'd never impress me again. Episode with the egg beater? Did we miss something? Anyway, let's hope this will lead us to a way to save Stellar. Alright, back out of cyberspace. Now, fortunately, it is not necessary to take the long way around. You could if you want to, but you don't have to. Because we can use this plank to bridge the gap between the road. You smartly drop the board in place, spanning the gap between the two bridge sections. Which saves a lot of time. So, time to log out. You know, if that was supposed to be a representation of the internet, where were all the pictures of cats with funny captions? Some printouts have emerged from the doctor's printer. Aha! Uh -huh. So that's where our printouts went. You're hesitant to touch that. What with everything in here being so clean and dust-free and all. I just want to pick up the papers. Well, let's see what our good friend Dr. Bellows thinks of this, um, evidence. Surely he'll have something to say for himself. Well, Dr. Bellows, I think you've got some explaining to do. You're out of your mind, Wilco. So, what do you have to say for yourself now, Doctor? Confronted with the facts found in the files you located, he freaks and spills all. Oh, uh, my... Eloquently stated. I... I didn't think this all the way through until I'd crossed my own personal ethical line. I was already... It had already gone too far. The experiments alone... I thought I could do just this one thing and still live with myself. Love can move a person to do some strange things, Wilco. She knew how I felt and used it to her advantage. I think I know what you mean about that love thing, but, but wait a minute. Slow down. Are you saying you have the hots for... I, I mean, you are actually romantically intrigued by Sharpay? Yeah. Wow. You are serious. I'm blind, apparently. I agree that love can make you do some weird stuff. In this case, though, it made you do some stuff that was unethical and illegal, Doctor. Where is Stellar Santiago? I know she was alive, that her death was faked. What have you done with her? Great Caesar's ghost. The woman. She's still alive, but... I'm afraid not much time remains. She is. 
What do you mean not much time remains? As you must realize by now, the Golden Light Years project was merely a front for the research I'd been conducting per Sharpay's wishes. She is intensely fearful of death. You probably didn't notice that she is getting up in age a bit. No, I didn't notice at all. Yeah, who could have guessed that? In very simple terms, Janitor Wilco. That's janitor second class, pal. And don't you forget it. Excuse me, janitor second class. As I was saying, Sharpay feared dying. Enough to take the lives of others to save her own. She knew I loved her. I remember the day I met her. It was at the funeral of... Oh... I believe it was her fourth husband, and I remember never having seen her look so radiant. I fell for her, hard, and she knew it. You should have seen her in black. I'll pass, thanks. Just tell me about Stellar. Okay. The bottom line is that I have developed a way to extend Sharpay's life by transferring her mental essence into the body of another. It was to be you until your friend Stellar Santiago got in the way. We thought no one would miss you. Go figure. What I have done is to employ nanotechnology to take over the designated host body, as is happening with your friend as we speak. Stellar's body is being taken over by Sharpay? Jeez, I don't understand. Is there anything we could do to stop it? I've never really thought of it that way. Well, think about it now. We have to save Stellar. You can't let her die. You can redeem yourself at least to some degree, Doc. As much as it pains me to admit it, you're right, Roger. You're right. Okay, I think I may have a plan. We can save her. There are some interesting spin-off technological breakthroughs. I'm going to send you in to stop Sharpay. Say what? No, uh, I don't think... It's her only chance. If you seriously care for your friend, you'll do this. Oh, the only way, huh? Sounds like it. The only way. Well, okay then. I hope you're sure about this. I'm positive. Here's how we shall go about it. You will move your shuttle into Lab B. Meanwhile, I will generate new software for your shuttle's navigational system, which will help you locate the nanites, the very small robotic devices I developed for the intrusion. One of them is Sharpay. If you can stop Sharpay, well, your friend's chances of survival improve immensely. Then, then, once I have located and extracted you, I shall work to repair whatever damage may have been done to Stellar during the attempted incursion. Sounds like we have no choice to go ahead with this crazy scheme. Neat. The shuttle is nicely miniaturized by the beam deal. Hopefully, it is reversible. Perhaps you should have asked about that. There are some things you can't afford to have smaller. Hey! Don't step on us, please. This is weird.
Well, there we go. Let's hope this works out. Because I don't fancy spending the rest of my life in the bloodstream of Stellar Santiago. It's usually not good. But we made it inside. But something appears to have happened. Why? What? Where? When? This isn't where Sharpay is, by the looks of things. My, that sure looks tasty. What the hell is it? It looks like a stomach or something. Check out that membrane. Seems like we're at our stomach. Uh, maybe we should try fitting, f uh, uh, feeding in that uh, disk that Bellows gave us with navigational instructions. It's the subroutine program disk the doctor gave you to be able to navigate through Stellar's body. That seems to be a prudent thing to try. ECMA nanite detector, shuttle subroutine, designed by Dr. Hayden Bellows. Okay. Uh huh. This is the shuttle's cockpit. Oh. Two sources of nanites uh, detected, apparently, here in the stomach, which I guess is where we are, and in the head. Can we go there? That wouldn't prove. Um, no, apparently not. Launching. I guess I won't get far without fuel. Oh, so that's the problem. We're out of fuel. Hmm. But which one? Take the disc back. Well, there was a blinking light on the outside. Maybe that can uh, help us. I'm actually going to... Um, actually, I'm going to end this video here and we'll continue to venture into the innards of Stellar in the next video. Welcome back! This game has taken us to outer space, to cyberspace, and now to inner space, inside the body of one stellar Santiago, who we have to save from being taken over by Sharpe. Unfortunately, we have hit a snag in the process. Namely, um, we've run out of fuel. But, uh, since the program disk we got from Dr. Bello said there were nanites around here anyway, I guess we should take a, uh, a look around and hope that Stellar has a filling station somewhere in her body. Somehow I think that's unlikely. So let's check outside. It's pretty sticky out there. Maybe you should wear your EVA suit. Okay, let's wear our EVA suit then. You don't actually need to wear the helmet, um, but you do need to take it with you. I'm not entirely sure if they even let you wear the helmet. They do. You can take it off again. I don't feel like walking around with the helmet, so I'm gonna leave it off. Okay, uh, well, first thing to notice, of course, is this blinking light behind Roger, which appears to have something uh, 
to do with our low fuel situation. Hey, that's me. No, it's not. It's a light behind you. Your stolen miniaturized shuttle has become mired on the fundus of the stomach like a beached whale. That's a weird metaphor. And I'm trying to look at the blinking light, but it's tiny. Red light. Hmm, this is not good. Apparently some or all of the intermix element in fuel tank 3 was disgorged during your heinous, venous joyride. That's not all that was disgorged, but we'll skip the details. And I'm very thankful for that. Apparently fuel tank 3 is empty. You know, if you remember the intermix display and the elements that we entered, Fuel Tank 3 was actually the AG portion of lasagna. Therefore, it is silver. Where are we gonna find some silver inside the body of a human? Unless uh, Stellar is on a silver rich diet, I don't think we'll be in much luck. Maybe the nanites are made out of silver. That would be convenient. Um. I'm not entirely sure if you can look at that, but there's something next to the blinking light. Uh-oh! This tank's cover must have come open during Mr. Wilco's wild ride. Aha! Uh -huh. So that's why we're out of silver. It's not because we forgot to fill up. Well, points to uh, Roger then, I guess. It's not his fault this time. Uh, there's some stuff stuck on the shuttle as well. It's alveoli, but it reminds you of spaghetti. And we can take that with us. Sort of like these weird bulbous sacks. You're the first one on your block to actually possess someone else's alveoli. I guess that's likely to stay that way. But we still have the Morphin syringe uh, with us. It would be funny to give Stellar a shot of morphine from the inside. Although I guess the dosage would be really tiny. Also, you can't actually do that, so anyway. Um... Can we do anything with the alveoli? You get fingerprints all over it. Oh. I guess not, then. There's something hanging from the engine as well. I, uh, first time I played this, I actually thought this was, like, a loose cable or something that we would have to fix, but that's not actually the case. Wow, that's some interesting looking stuff you've got collected in the engine intake. Looks like a small collection of blood capillaries. They're actually capillaries. And Roger was in the way, so... Now we have capillaries, and there appear to be uh, two of them. Can we do anything with those? What, was that supposed to be clever? Not really. It's the bundle of capillaries you appropriated from Stellar. There's actually three of them. It's sort of hard to see. Um, anyway. Let's take a look at our surroundings. We appear to be uh, on top of the stomach, where apparently there is light and breathable air. That makes perfect sense. Also, the scale is a bit weird, because considering the size of the stomach, the shuttle and Roger would appear to be about a centimeter tall or, or something like that. Or Roger would appear to be a centimeter tall. The shuttle is, all, is even larger, of course. So how did they enter through the bloodstream? Oh well, it's still a Space Quest game. Best not to think about it. You're treading on the fundus, a broad expanse of tissue covering the outside of the stomach. For some reason, doing so gives you the feeling of being a one-man army. After all, an army does travel on its stomach. Yes, but an army does not travel on someone else's stomach, I think. I, I don't know what that big round thing is. I'm a janitor, damn it, not a doctor. That's why we have the narrator to tell us all about these useful anatomical facts. Yes, we're going to be learning some anatomy. 
while we're doing this. What's this thing? Oh, that looks real nice. But we won't be taught what that is. You're treading on the fundus, a broad expanse of tissue covering the outside of the stomach. For some reason, doing so gives you the fee- After all, an- Wait, I thought you got a different message if you did that twice. You're treading on the fundus, a broad exp- Okay, I've changed my mind about doing this. Is it too late? Can I still back out gracefully? But as soon as the words spring gazelle-like from your lips, you regret them. You're here to do a job. You're here to save Corman Stellar Santiago from a fate worse than death. As if having you inside her wouldn't already be considered such a thing. That's right. I'm Roger Wilco, damn it. Man of action. Savior of the galaxy. A man trapped in the body of a woman. Wait, uh, that didn't come out right. Right. That made perfect sense. And there appears to be a hole in Stellar's stomach. You recognize that festering infected crevice. As if Stellar didn't already have enough to worry about, she's got an ulcer. And it's not just an ulcer, it's puckered. It's a peptic ulcer. Is that what ulcers look like? I have no idea. You see, I know all about space and science and starships and airplanes and stuff, but uh, anatomy? Not really my thing, you know? Um, anyway, since it appears to be the only uh, place we can actually go, we'll go into the stomach via that ulcer. Hopefully we'll be able to um, find some silver and also find and take care of those nanites that the uh, program disk thingy set were supposed to be around here somewhere. Oh yeah, that's a real nice sound effect. Okay, it's the stomach. The uppermost portion of the stomach gathers together here in a purplish, puckered, flesh-draped, sphincter-like drainage outlet. That reminds me. I have to get one of those inflatable donut things if I'm going to keep driving the shuttle. My roids are flaring up again. Ooh, yeah. Too much information there, Roger. I guess this would be the entry into the uh, esophagus, or the exit, depending on how you look at it. A bit hard to reach from here though, so let's climb down. There is no message for that, so that's why I didn't look at it. Um, yikes! Man, those are some huge nanites. I thought nanites were supposed to be sub-microscopic, and these appear to be, well... If Roger is, like I said, about a centimeter tall, these would be, well, at least ten millimeters. No, wait, that is a centimeter. Okay, we'll call it two millimeters. One or two millimeters in size, which is way too big for a, um... Nanite. Anyway. The inside of Stellar's tummy is slippery, mostly because of the mucus secreted by the stomach lining. And there are a few pock marks here and there, but when push comes to shove, this is the most beautiful stomach you've ever been in. And he's been in a few. There's just this one thing. Those little robots are the nanites sent down to aid in taking over Stellar's body. They look like guard nanites. But then, for all you know, they could be ballerina nanites. Somehow, I think that's unlikely. A cluster of stomach acid shy nanites is lurking near the entrance to the duodenum. They know all the cool places to hang out. Really? The duodenum is cool? If you say so, Mr. Narrator, I guess you would know that better than me. I don't know. Um. I don't really know what they're doing here, except they are guarding that hole, and obviously we are going to have to uh, go in there. And something tells me they're not gonna let us.
My goodness, those little guys are efficient. However, based on how they left your boots behind, you might consider some odor eaters. That bad, eh? Also, one of them spit out her eyeball, so what's wrong with those? Okay. I don't really know what they're doing here otherwise. They're just gonna prevent us from going in there. That's what they're doing here. For whatever reason. There's nothing in there that they're actually s supposed to be guarding unless they happen to know that we're looking for silver and know that there's silver down there. Which you might have guessed already there is. Although, uh, we'll have to travel a wee bit further before we get there. Okay, let's look at some of the other stuff here. I guess it's a stomach acid. As do most computer game characters who find themselves in sequels of sequels, you stop the action to reflect on your past exploits. You realize you spent a lot of time looking at the contents of your own stomach. But this is the first time you've gotten such a good look at a pool of someone else's potential discharge. <laughs> the pools are deceptively still and shallow. They look harmless, but they're seething with pepsin and hydrochloric acid. A chemical brew of protein-dissolving, bacteria-destroying glop, strong enough to dissolve almost anything, especially organic life forms like yourself. I guess that means we'd better be careful not to fall in! That's pretty far to go just to do your Wizard of Oz impression. Makes you feel tingly all over, doesn't it? Well, I guess we finally have a body of water where it makes sense that you die if you get into it. Um, yes, I'm referring to uh, the habit of adventure game characters to die whenever they fall into water, regardless of whether or not it would actually be dangerous. Um, well, uh, let's not do that again, but we are going to have to find a way to get rid of those nanites. But we'll do so in the next video. Welcome back! You know, I've heard people say that the way to a woman's heart is through her stomach, but this is ridiculous! We need to get rid of those nanites, though, um, because they are guarding the entry to the Duodenum, and since they are guarding them, I guess that means we need to go in there, because that's how adventure games work, after all. Yeah, it's around here that you really start to feel this hints that are left out thing, because there are a bunch of things where you're just going to be doing things where I at least think that the only real way you could possibly discover what you're supposed to be doing by trying every possible combination of items uh, and stuff. A feather? When, rather, if you get the chance, you'll have to quiz Stella about her dietary habits. I guess she ate a live chicken or something? I don't know. Still, might be useful. And it isn't the weirdest thing we're gonna find in uh, Stella's innards, that's for sure. What's this? Hmm. Loosely woven into the stomach lining is a piece of celery string. That stuff could be used to make steel-belted radial tires stronger. Rumor has it that it was the original inspiration for dental floss. I think I saw that on one of those James Burke shows. That's interesting, I guess. What he is implying, though, is that this stuff is quite strong. And since there's a lot of it, it might make a good rope. And this appears to be a staple. How odd! A bent staple. And thus far it has resisted being dissolved by the stomach's acids. Probably because of its location and Stellar's apparent lack of oral nourishment during her captivity. The acid probably hasn't risen high enough since this item found its way in here. What in the hell was she doing eating a staple, anyway? Maybe it was some fad diet thing in the Galactic Inquirer. 
Maybe she ate the Galactic Inquirer. Because as a magazine, it would probably have staples in it. I'm assuming it's a magazine anyway. Well, Roger may be a janitor, but I'm guessing this is the first time he's ever cleaned the inside of someone's stomach. Dang, these look tasty. Boy, that micro-Prozac she inhaled slowed her systems down to a crawl. These things haven't been touched by stomach acid yet. Yep, it seems that the stomach is not very active at the moment. You acquire a candy. Which, uh, is a good thing for those nanites, because uh, their, their description said they were stomach acid shy, so I'm guessing, um, They'd be dissolved if we could get the acid to rise high enough. And normally, what uh, might cause stomach acid to rise would be food. For instance, a candy. Let's see what happens. Interesting. The acid rises, but just not quite high enough to submerge those nanites. Hmm, maybe we can try that again. You acquire a candy. You can only take one at a time, by the way. I already have one. Interesting. The acid rises, but just not quite high enough to submerge those nanites. Well, it had exactly the same effect. Being the scientist... You acquire a candy. Being the scientist that I am, I want to know if this experiment is repeatable. Interesting. The acid rises, but just not quite high enough to submerge those nanites. It is! I don't know if there's actually any point for throwing all three of them in. You don't get any extra points for it or anything, but anyway, I like doing it. Um, well, since we can't go out through here, I guess the only other way to go... would be, um, through here, into the esophagus. But how can we get there? Well, we picked up uh, some rope, which we might be able to use to climb. Okay, actually it's celery, but anyway. Sort of like rope. But how can we get the rope attached to the esophagus? Well, maybe we can use this staple as a hook. Now we have a grappling rope. That's your makeshift grappling hook. So, let's see if we can attach that. Nice shot! Nice shot! Oh, I beat you to it, Mr. Narrator. That's your main... Yes, okay. Let's climb up! I guess we could go back out through the mouth or something. I know, maybe we can climb up to her mouth and then tickle uh, her uvula. And then uh, she'll sneeze us out. You know, like a whale. In King's Quest IV. No, that's not actually what's going to happen. Hell, is that a Twinkie? A large hunk of Twinkoid cake food product is hanging just below her epiglottis. It appears to have gotten jammed on the way to her stomach for digestion. Doesn't this woman chew? Apparently not. This is the lower part of the esophagus. Just below this is the stomach. Check out the lungs on this girl. You don't get an opportunity like this every day. Well, it has got to be some kind of innuendo. 
also. I don't think Roger can actually see uh, her lungs from here. What's the matter? Haven't you ever seen an esophagus before? Not from this angle. You know what I think? I think that this uh, Twinkie would actually have a rather larger effect on the pool of stomach acid were it to be dropped in there than those um, M&Ms had. Maybe enough to rise it high enough to get rid of those nanites. Let's see if we can uh, dislodge it. I guess the answer to that is no. Roger is not heavy enough in his tiny form. Man, there are some weird things uh, behind us here. These are the trachea and bronchi. That's where the lungs hook in. Aha! Uh -huh. Those appear to be the aorta and the vena cava. Who knew this was going to be so much fun? At least I think that's what they are. I've never been much of an artery man myself. We're learning a lot today. What's the matter? Haven't you ever seen... Up we go! Oh, I don't think we can actually go any further. So that rules out the whole mouth-tickling uvula idea. This is the upper part of the esophagus. The larynx branches off from here, winding its way down to the bronchi and the lungs. Looking above, you see some sort of medical equipment blocking the way to the mouth. Looks like that's not an option for an escape route. Aha, uh -huh, that explains it. We can't go up because something is blocking the uh, mouth. Uh, too bad. She might have had some silver fillings or something. Would have been a way to get silver, maybe? Who knows, perhaps? Looks like a pill is blocking her larynx. Or stuck in her larynx, anyway. It's one of those tiny timed release pills. As I recall, these are designed to not melt down and release their medicines until they've gotten to an area past the stomach. Okay. Well, I'm sure that's very uncomfortable for Stellar, so let's try and dislodge it. And down it goes. And now it's stuck behind the Twinkie. Can we pick up the pill? That wouldn't prove fulfilling. No. Can we eat the pill? Hey, don't put your mouth on that. I didn't think so. Not really our scale, though, is it? Seems that we aren't heavy enough to dislodge the Twinkie. So I guess we need to get Stellar to do the work for us. Get her to uh, swallow or something. And you know what just might do the trick? This is one of those things that you probably only would figure out by just trying every single possible thing. Using the feather on her uh, esophagus. Actually, what happens if you just use the hands on them? It wouldn't be proof. Nothing, okay. Figured maybe they'd give you a hint if you tried it that way, but no. You have to use the feather. Uh oh, it's an earthquake, or a stellar quake, or I don't know. Yikes, is that normal? It's interesting, because actually, now that I think of it, Stellar has forehead ridges, so she's probably not human, but her anatomy seems to be exactly the same as a human. And there go the nanites! Drowned in the lake of stomach acid. Take care of those buggers! So now we can go out through the uh, duodenum. Considering where that leads though, I think the real question is, would we want to? Oh, there's a pill. It did 
not dissolve, because, well, like the narrator said, it was designed to dissolve in an area past the stomach, not in the stomach itself. Fortunately, the acid went back down, so we can actually safely go through here. It's one of those tiny timed-release pills. Can we do something with it now? An interesting idea. What are you up to, Roger? Nothing much. Just wanted to see what would happen. I guess if we want to uh, do something with that pill, we'll have to. Well, we'll have to figure out what to do with it. For one thing, at this point is a bit vague. Let's head into the Duodenum. This just keeps getting grosser and grosser, doesn't it? This is the upper area of the duodenum. Matter pre-processed from the stomach enters here through the pylorus above. It has a lovely bile-colored decor, and for a very good reason. This is the area in which raw processed ingestibles are mixed with a variety of secretions for further breakdown. Further breakdown, so just a breakdown of that pill, I guess. Maybe if we can get some of those uh, secretions, we could break that pill down further. Hmm. I guess uh, we'll have to explore this new part of the Duodenum in the next video. Welcome back! We are penetrating deeper and deeper into the body of... Stellar. Wait, that didn't come out right. Um... We are in the Duodenum. This looks like the center section of the Duodenum. It has that same lovely bile green brilliance. And there's an exit. Ah, the old ampulla of Vater, surrounded by the sphincter of Adi. Didn't you always wonder what it looked like? The bile slick seems to be a little fresher there. Okay, I think that's supposed to be a hint that that is the place to get the bile, which you might uh, need to dissolve that pill. But, well, like I said, a lot of it is very, very vague. I'm actually gonna go down first. It's also very easy to miss the fact that you can actually go down first, so if you just go in there and don't bother to hover your cursor near the bottom of the screen. This is the place where the duodenum meets the small intestine. The mixture of food, acids, bile and enzymes move on from here and pass over the villi, where nutrients are absorbed into the bloodstream. It's a fascinating place, wouldn't you say? Yes, but I'd still rather not be here. And we can climb into the uh, small intestine. Yikes! Worm Since side! Since you the tapeworm not partially digested, you'll probably give him heartburn. I hope you're proud of yourself. That was not a good idea. That's a big one. This is the very bottom of our old friend, the duodenum. You can see the beginning of the jejunum. The villi start here. They increase the surface area of the small intestine a great deal, giving more area to absorb nutrients. All in all, it just looks like a French tickler turned inside out to me. A what? Never mind, it's not important. Yes. Great Scott, that certainly is one buff parasite. I think I'm gonna spew. But who'll notice? Man, that thing is ugly. Indeed. And it looks like he's not gonna let us pass. Can we do anything with it? That has no effect. At least it appears that way. 
And you can't just go past that, and if you go too low, um, well, you saw what what happens. He'll eat you! And I've seen these babies swallow whole harvesters, so... Roger is no, uh... Challenge for them. Wait, different time for him. Um... Now, this is, again, a place where there's really not any hints of what you're supposed to do next. You are actually supposed to use the pill to take care of this thing. If there was a hint for that and I've missed it, I'd like uh, you to point it out. I will gladly admit that I'm wrong. But, in my case, I actually um, needed some hints to get past here. And otherwise, I think the uh, only real way you can find out what you're supposed to do is just by trying everything. And that would include, of course, going up here into the uh, Sphincter of Oddy, or whatever it was called. Which takes us to a fork in the road. Welcome to the heart of the Bile Belt. This is indeed Spew Central. At this location, secretions from the liver, gallbladder, and pancreas merge to form a duodenal delight. Guaranteed to break down almost anything the stomach doesn't. The common bile duct runs up from here. See, um, like I said, we can find stuff here that might help us break down that pill. That's the top part of the head of Stellar's pancreas. An odd feeling passes through you just being amongst Stellar's organs. Oh, well, it's certainly unusual, that's for sure. Let's, uh, head up. What's that? A large gallstone hangs above the entrance to the gallbladder. I'm sure that's of no importance to us whatsoever. That wouldn't be wise. Those suckers could fall and smash you flat. Better leave it alone then. Where does this go? This is the cystic duct. You are quite near where the gallbladder becomes part of the bile parade. I don't think you can actually go in there. No, no! I didn't mean to walk back down. Okay, that was pointless. Anyway, I proved my point, you can't go in there. We can, however, go further to the left. Into the gallbladder, I believe. Wow, interesting. Wow, check out all that bile. Looks like her liver's been doing just fine. That's a pool of bile any liver would be proud of. You sure can't speak highly of its aroma. If I'm not mistaken, and I seldom am, that's the mucosa, or inner lining of the gallbladder. It helps make the bile even more vile by absorbing spare water content. Very informative. Well, it seems like this would be the kind of stuff we need to, um... ...dissolve the pill. But how can we take it with us? Well, this is where the helmet comes in, which can serve as a nice container, however you can't just... As cool as it would be to interface these two items, no good would come of it. You can't just scoop it up, unfortunately. You, um, need to do something else. And this is almost as obscure as the rubber ducky clamp thing in uh, The Longer Journey. We have a hand-cranked pump we took from the trunk of the shuttle uh, before. And that is what we're gonna have to use, but that pump is pretty useless without some hose. And we can make a makeshift hose using these uh, capillaries. However, they're not much use as long as they're uh, 
in separate pieces, so we have to use that universal solution to every problem there is, duct tape, to make one big capillary. You cleverly tape the capillaries together. Very clever. Now attach our makeshift hose to the pump. Nice work. You've hooked up your makeshift hose to the pump. That's what I said. And then we can use that to pump up some of this stuff. You chuck one of the taped capillaries over the muscular ledge. It drops into the pool. Or it automatically uses his helmet. I guess if you don't have it with you, uh... You give the pump a stroke or two, and in the process, gather a nice helmet load of bile. I guess congratulations are in order. I guess so. I guess if you don't have the helmet with you, Roger will complain or something. I never actually tried that. You can't take the pump uh, with you anymore. You've got plenty of that stuff. Or did you want to take some home to Mom? We can add it to the uh, memorabilia collection in our quarters. Okay, time to head back down. Which I'm sure will... Uh-oh. That was close. The gallstone is wedged in the bile duct, and that's just a fine place for it. If you say so. I'm sure that won't cause any troubles for, uh... uh stellar? You can't change its location, alter its position, or affect its current velocity. Not only that, it won't budge. I think that's what he said. In any case, it means we won't be going back up to the gallbladder. Fortunately, we don't have to go there anymore. Nice gallstone collection. Can I take some of those? Indeed, we can. Um, now, by itself, this is actually not enough to uh, dissolve the pill. We also need to go off to the right here. This is the main pancreatic duct. It appears that there's some blockage toward the tail of the pancreas. It definitely gets a bit snug. Seems to be a buildup of cholesterol arterial plaque. Uh huh. There is some cholesterol blocking our way. Let's see if we can just squeeze through, maybe? Perhaps? Yeah. This is way too snug. This blockage needs to be cleared. Stellar is going to have to change her diet. That is, if she can face life after having you inside her. Right. Well, either Stellar has to change her diet, or Roger has, so he can fit through there. But we don't have time for that. We're in a hurry. Um, this is another one of those things. Yeah, there's a lot of them, I told you. You are supposed to uh, stick these uh, ravioli or alveoli or whatever in here. And then use the mouth icon on them to blow them up. I'd like a show of hands from the audience at this point. For those people who actually thought of that by themselves and didn't either stumble on it by accident or use a hint guide. It's been too long for me since I played this game, so I don't actually remember where I used the hint guide. 
I know I use the hint guide in this portion of the game. A couple of times. But there were also a couple of things that I just figured out by, um... Well, by trying everything. Yikes. This place looks weird. I guess this is a pancreas. And here we have the Islands of Langerhans. They're a big deal here in the pancreas. Apparently, they play an important part in introducing hormones to the blood system as well as adding an enzyme which, when joined with the bile secretion from the gallbladder, forms some kind of spew that breaks down stuff the stomach acids don't. Fats and that kind of thing. Not only that, but some cells release insulin and others release glucagon to counter the insulin. It even offers up a bicarbonate to counteract the stomach's acid. All in all, it's a pretty strange and busy organ. It just looks like a uvula warehouse to me. It kind of does, doesn't it? A nice pool of pancreatic secretions made up of insulin and glucagon fill the bottom of the islands of Langerhans. And that stuff, it appears, would uh, help us nicely in breaking down that pill. But we're out of time, so we're going to have to collect it in the next video. Welcome back. We are in the pancreas, and apparently we are going to have to use this stuff, combined with the vial we collected earlier, to break down that pill. It's interesting if you wait here, um... Roger doesn't actually start whistling like he did elsewhere. I guess they didn't animate that with him wearing the spacesuit. Anyway, let's collect some of this stuff, and since it's dripping down, it's a little bit easier to collect. You maneuver your helmet beneath the drip and manage to snag a nice little dollop of the stuff. Good. You actually just click on the pool and it will automatically uh, collect one of the drips. Um, and now we have a nice pill breaking down solution, I guess. I wonder. You get a jump on. No. Could have had a description there about eating cholesterol, but anyway. They didn't. This section of the game is comparatively sparse in uh, humorous messages. At least compared to some of the earlier places we've been, like the uh, Ascendo Pad, Lab A, Roger's Quarters. Okay, back to the stomach. It's weird to think that originally Sharpay actually wanted to do this to uh, Roger. She wanted to take over his body. Which is even weirder from Dr. Bella's point of view, because that would have meant that his lover, Sharpay, would have been in the body of a man. Not a very manly man, but a man nonetheless. I guess he's a progressive sort of guy, Dr. Bellows. Also, he's not a human, so maybe it doesn't matter to him anyway. And this worked! Isn't that nice? And now it's broken down into little capsules. The inside of a stellar... Oh. It's one of those tiny timed-release pills. And these we can take with us. You now own one of those tiny timed release pills. How nice. Apparently the reason that Sharpe thought she could get away with taking over our body is because she thought nobody would miss us. Apparently she did not count on Stellar. And I hope that Bia would have missed us at some point.
And isn't somebody gonna miss Stellar? I don't know. She's a generic evil villain in uh, a sci-fi story with no real personality, so whoever s said that, that her plans have to make sense. Okay, now we go back down to the uh, tapeworm. And see what happens if we give it one of these pills. And hopefully that will allow us to continue onwards. Let's not get too low, because he'll eat us again. Um, and hopefully we'll find some silver on the other side of the small intestine. Or, at the very least, another way to get to the brain where the rest of the nanites are, as we saw uh, by using this disc. Alright, you want something to eat? Eat this. Hmm, impressive. The tapeworm suddenly becomes much more animated. Interesting. The tapeworm is a little wired, thanks to you. He looks like he has plenty of energy. Does it still eat us now? No. It's tamed or something, I don't know. You can't actually walk over here. What you're supposed to do is use the tapeworm. Please remember to keep your arms and legs on the worm at all times. Yes, we're gonna ride it. And I forgot to bring my maker hooks. Yow! Now that's a ride you won't take in the Magic Kingdom. And I think that's a good thing. That's your vermiform friend who, with a little help from organic and pharmaceutical resources, was kind enough to give you that ride along the approximately six and a half meters or so of small intestine that lies between here and the duodenum. And that was very nice of him. It saved us a lot of walk walking, I guess. Egad's man, just how low have we sunk? All the way to the junction of the large and small intestines, that's how low. This also happens to be the home of the appendix. The appendix, as well as the entry to the large intestine. I'm not entirely sure I want to go any further than this. Because I know where this is going to end, and I don't want to go there. Unfortunately, we can't actually go any further. No, I think I've already done things above and beyond the call of duty. Hey, a guy has to draw the line somewhere, and gosh darn it, this guy's drawn the line right at the... right at... at, at the colon. You've never even met her mother. Yeah. Is that a reference to what I think it was a reference to? I hope not. I guess this is the appendix. This is the appendix. It's a strange piece of the humanoid anatomy considered by some medical types to be fairly useless. It may not be useful, but it does seem to collect some strange stuff. I'll say. A lot of junk in there. Didn't I read some research? a while back that said that the appendix might not be so useless after all. I don't remember. Anyway, let's see what we have in here. It looks like an old silver amalgam filling. Must have been bouncing around here for years. Silver! That's what we're looking for. You pull away a cracked piece of the filling. And it looks like I was right about the whole uh, filling thing, even though we didn't find one in the mouth. Of course, it helped that I actually knew that. 
What else have we got? Looks like a paperclip. It's a relatively unscathed paperclip. What the hell has she been eating? Really? You carefully, very carefully, stole the paper clip in your pocket. It seems that no matter what his dimensions, Roger still has a TARDIS in his pocket. Also, if he gets back up to normal size, will he have a giant piece of paper clip with him? I guess so. It's a fingernail, complete with paint. These have a knack for making it down here. Suddenly, you wonder when Stellar grew such long nails. Perhaps you haven't been thinking of Stellar as a woman as much as a crewmate. You feel an interesting longing. One look at your surroundings kills that feeling fast. But maybe after this is all over... Hey, what about Bia? She'd kill you if, you hurt, if she hurt uh, you think that. You snap off a shard of fingernail and gingerly introduce it into your pocket. And why not? Considering all the other stuff that's already in there. Man, a load of junk. This seems to be a sludge of rather heavy and not so digestible items. Sludge reminds you of your old nemesis. Well, you finished him off, but he still causes you to change your clothing more than the average person. Really, game? Do you really think it was a good idea to remind us of someone who was a much more effective villain than Sharpay will ever be? How does she get this stuff into her digestive system? That's a screw Stellar probably doesn't remember. I guess she was building an IKEA furniture thing. And then found at the end she was missing some screws, because after all, doesn't that always happen? I guess uh, we found out where they go now. Talk about hard currency. The Buckazoid has proven itself once again. This is even one of the old style ones. Might be worth some money. Too bad you can't carry it. Yep, you can't take the screw, the Buckazoids, or any of the other stuff. Only the silver, the fingernail, and the paperclip. Well, since we got some silver, I guess it's time for us to return to the uh, shuttle, and you know what that means, we get to ride the worm again. So you like the worm, huh? You like to ride the worm, huh? I let you ride the worm. Is there a reference that I'm missing there? I gotta say, in a game of weird stuff, this rings up there. And back we go. Yeah, I don't know what the whole static ticking, where that comes from. It only does it during the videos. Maybe that's actually in the sound. Or maybe it's my computer, or maybe it's because I'm recording, or... I don't know. It's rather annoying, anyway. Good, back up we go. And frankly, the further we can leave this whole area of the body behind us, the better. So, back out through um, the opening of the duodenum into the stomach. And back up. There we go. She really needs to get that altar looked at. Okay, now to fix our fuel situation, you actually need to click on the um, 
hole next to the light, not the light itself, which is a bit hard to spot. There we go! All filled up again. Our light is green. Even though before it was off, but anyway. She's filled up with what passes for silver in these here parts, and she's sealed up and ready to go. Good. Let's head back inside. You neatly replace the EVA suit in its proper place. Okay, I guess next stop is Stellar's Brain. But we'll have to go there in the next video. Welcome back! We've refueled the shuttle and taken care of the nanites in the stomach, which means it's time for us to move on to the other source of nanites we found, the brain, which I am guessing is where Sharpe is. So let's insert the program disk again. Why is that cracked, since we got it from the guy who actually created it? Why did he need to crack his own software? Yep, we took care of that. Leaving only that. So, let's go. Does the shuttle actually play that fanfare when you uh, press the button? It'd be cool if it did. I want a car that plays a fanfare when you turn the ignition. And there we are. Stellar's brain. So, let's uh, get back into the EVA suit. I don't need the helmet this time, but I'm going to take it with me anyway. I don't know why. Because it's the only way to close the door, I think. And I'm neat like that. I want to close the door. Oxygen tank still doing its job of making the doors hiss. Let's take a look around. This is the Meninges. It's a three-layer cover for the brain. Check out the cool blood vessels. Cool. It's the old grey matter itself, our friend, the brain. At least some of us are familiar with it. I don't remember seeing you at the meetings. For some reason, you're drawing a complete blank on information regarding the brain. Yeah, I don't think Roger ever needed it before. We're going to have to get down there, but the Menenges is in the way. It's pretty tough. It manages to resist your manly efforts. And apparently our bare hands are not going to do the job. Um, so we need something sharp. The only two options we have for that are um, the paperclip and the fingernail. And it's actually the fingernail that will do the trick here. You slice away with the nail, and amazingly enough, manage to cut a slice in the barrier. I hope that's not harmful, Stellar. I hope Dr. Bellows is able to patch up all the damage we and Sharpe uh, did to her after we're done. Okay, let's move on along. Whoa. There is a hole blocking, blocking our way. Yikes. How am I supposed to jump across this one? This is the Meninges. Oh. Don't comment about the hole. Anyway, you just jump across it by jumping across it. Not sure if there was any intention to have a puzzle here or anything, but there isn't one. Can we use the... As cool as it would... The uh, fingernails to climb up? No. Can we use the... Oh. And you were so close, too! I didn't even know you could actually fall down there. Actually, you just need to... 
repeatedly click up here until Roger crawls out. Man, that was close. Yep. Uh oh. Those nanites are huge, but, well, I've already commented on that. But they also do not look friendly. Holy Captain's Log, Batman. There are a few more of those nanites here. How am I going to handle this one? Nice mood lighting. I guess. What is this, an elevator? It's an elevator built by the nanites to help gain access to the interior of the brain. Yuck! After all we've been through, now you say yuck. I'm sure those nanites will just ignore us. Or not. So close, and yet so far away. How embarrassing to get wasted by the laurel and hardy of nanites. Okay, what can we do to deal with those guys? What you actually need to do is throw rocks at them, or gallstones, as the case may be. I don't think I can hit them from here. But not from here. You need to walk into the background and hit them from there. Hopefully, we can uh, smash them down or something. You chuck a gallstone at one of the robots, causing it to think the other one did it. Well, we can't kill them this way, but we might be able to trick them into uh, fighting each other. You chuck another gallstone, this time at the other robot, who also thinks the other one did it. You see, this is why you don't give your robots personalities. It's just a bad idea. That was quite effective. That was very impressive, Roger. I'll bet that's not something you hear every decade. Come on. Considering the number of times we've saved the universe, must have heard it a couple of times. The self-deactivated nanites now pose no threat. It all worked out for the best. So, let's uh, head down this elevator. Hmm. It's a recently constructed shaft between the hemispheres of Stellar's brain. It's a recently con Okay, let's uh, head down then. Wait, there's a sign? So this is the motor control center. I didn't know the brain came with convenient signs indicating the function of everything. More signs. This sign says this is her pleasure center. Hmm. You'd think that offers some interesting possibilities, but there's nothing you can do with it. And the other two signs, well, this isn't even really a sign, but anyway, give the same message. Another sign. Interesting. The sign says this is Stellar's cough control center. Indeed. Oh, this is her choice of men center. It looks a little odd. Well, that explains everything. Mm-hmm. This is strange looking. Used pieces of nanite hardware as well as some stuff that looks vaguely like mining equipment litter the area. A huge pile of debris is standing in front of what appears to be some sort of passage. Light pours through the opening. This is strange. 
A small opening between the brain wall and the debris pile allows a small amount of light to escape. I guess we need to go through there. Since there's no sign of sharp aid just yet. But we can't. Can we move this debris pile? Your effort to move it is futile. This would be a challenge for you even if you were full size. No. What we need to do is once again enlist Stellar's aid in moving that. But how could we uh, get her to move from here? The answer is you need to activate one of the um, areas of the brain and actually you need to do that to the cough center. I don't think you actually can do anything with the uh, the others. Not even the pleasure center. Would have been like an instant orgasm button or something. Would have been cool, but you can't do that. Well, you need to poke the paperclip into her brain to make her cough. At the cough center, which is this sign. Because that's apparently how the brain works. Who knew? Well, I certainly didn't. And that has conveniently moved this pile of debris out of the way. So now we can go through. Um, for which we need to use the hand icon for some reason. Down we go, by looks of it. Uh oh. That's sharp ace V music. Ugh. I guess we found her. Ah! Even in this suit, that hurts like a... Jeez. What's going on here? And what's with that big robot? Well, well, Mr. Wilco. I must confess to being impressed that you made it this far. You are either a very lucky man, or the classic case of how looks can be deceiving. I think the latter. From what I know of former. your history, I can't say that in this case looks are necessarily deceiving. On the other hand, I don't think luck accounts for it all either. There's definitely something different about you, Mr. Wilco. It's a pity, though. I'm afraid this is where the odds catch up with you, Roger. I do hope you don't mind me referring to you as Roger. I feel we can both be on a first-name basis now, since we will soon be sharing such intimate moments. My rebirth and your death. Not necessarily in that order. I'll attend to you in a moment. I have a few more little details to finish before I transfer my consciousness into this body. Enjoy it, Roger. It'll be among the very last of your memories. Oh, and by the way, escape attempts will prove to be futile. You will be incinerated if necessary. Jeez, what a bit... I'm sorry? What was that you were saying? Me? Uh, I was, uh, uh, I was saying, uh, what a bite! Yeah, I had a little trouble with some parasites a while ago down in the digestive tract. Uh, that's all it was. I save. Also, big mistake, Sharpay. When the hero shows up, you kill him immediately. You don't give him time to think of a plan. You ever read the uh, Evil Overlord list? It's the robot Sharpay is using, just as Dr. Bellows told you about. Welcome to the Cerebral Cortex. It looks like someone's been mining brain matter. Because that's apparently how you take over someone's brain. Also, I thought it was pronounced Cerebral, but anyway. It's a lovely pile of brain matter. A conveyor moves freshly dug brain cells to the top of the pile. Let's try and make a run for it. Yow. Guess she wasn't kidding about escape being a futile thing. Nope. Hey, 
You could hurt me doing that. That was the idea. It looks like a bundle of nerves with electrical current through them. Hmm. Electrical current? That sounds like something we might be able to use, but we'll have to do that in the next video. Welcome back. We found Sharpay, who's digging into Stellar's brain in an effort to take control of it. And, uh, oh. We need to take care of her, and this electricity coming from these exposed nerves might help. Hmm. I've got this bundle of nerves. I wonder what I can use to make this into something. What we need to use, in fact, is the uh, piece of paper clip, once again. Wow, well done. After hand it to you, Roger, that was impressive. Well, that's it. We won. We beat the game. I'm sure we'll s never see her again. Wow, that was actually a great idea. Go figure. Yeah, I kicked her butt. Just look at me. MacGyver wishes he could be me. It was bound to happen. The never-ending battle between good and evil was once again waged. And once again, good has emerged victorious. Yes. And with me on its side, how could it lose? You know you're jinxing it, Roger. Yes. Once again, I have struck a blow for good over evil. It was in a... Hey! Ah! What? But I thought I took care of you. Yuck. Well, it appears you thought wrong now, doesn't it, Roger? Wilco, I haven't survived this long without taking precautions. The robot was just hardware. My mind still exists. Oh, real wonderful. Yikes! Ooh. Tentacle rape! Ah! Hey, watch those tentacles, lady. I thought that being partially embedded in the street on polysorbate was a strange feeling. This does not bode well for our hero. My, she has a different look now. I don't know which I like better. Had her both pretty bad. Ah! Cool! A chance to check out your own digestive tract. I'd rather it stay on the inside. Okay, how do we take care of this brain monster? You're not gonna believe this. We are actually going to use that fish we've been carrying around the entire game. Because fish, that's brain food. Fish, that's brain food. That's what I said. I think it was over the best before date. All right. She actually chowed down on that rancid fish. I thought I'd never get rid of that fish. You and me both, pal. And that is actually how we finish off Sharpay. Bit of an anticlimax if you ask me, but... Well, we'll have to go with it. Hey, I can see Dr. Bellows from here. What are you up to, Roger? That's interesting. Okay. 
I guess that's one way to signal him. He's not going to do what I think he's going to do, is he? He is. Nice shot. Oh, there you are, Wilco. Now, enlarge us again, please. Boy, Stellar, with all that's happened recently, I never would have imagined that we'd be standing here together. It is a miracle, Roger. I was afraid that by the time you got my message, it would be too late. I was certain I was doomed, but you didn't let me down. What you did was incredibly brave, Roger, not to mention intensely risky. It took Dr. Bellows a lot of work to clean up after you and Sharpay. I must say, Roger, there's not a man in the universe who knows me inside the way you do. It was a strange feeling, but I went in there all business. There wasn't a moment I wasn't thinking of your welfare. Yeah, right. <laughs> oh, give me a break. Let me put my boots on. It's getting deep in here. Cheese it, pal, or I'll rip out your larynx and you won't be able to get a job doing bad voiceover work for Chinese action pictures. What did you say, Roger? Oh, um, I was just mumbling to myself. You know, Stellar, there's one thing I noticed while inside you I, I thought I might share. And what's that, Roger? You eat like a goat. You really have to change your eating habits, Stellar. I saw some things in your digestive tract I wouldn't wish on Sludge Vohal. You really have to clean up your consumption act. Smooth, Roger. Real smooth. Yes, I know, I know. Dr. Bellows said he was able to fix most everything done to me during Sharpay's invasion, as well as patching an ulcer that was playing havoc with my stomach. He told me the same things. You might also try chewing. You had a hunk of twinkoid wedged in your throat that, that would have gagged Linda Lovelace. Okay, Roger, okay, I got the message. Let's change the subject, shall we? Ask me where I'm stationed next. Why don't you just tell me? You could play along. Boy, some fun you are. Sorry, I guess I'm a little grumpy. I had a real day. I, I had to clean the captain's log entry container. Then somebody got a nice buzz in eight rear and decided to take a wormhole ride in the hollow suite. They hit a few wrong buttons, and the next thing I know, I'm cleaning Virgon Nebula sets and hors d'oeuvres off every wall and ceiling. Apparently, they truly did make the room spin. Boy, they spackled everything. Had to use the putty knife to chip loose some of the chunks of... Eh? Uh, Roger, I'm sorry you had a rough day, but can we please change the subject? I agree. Oh, sorry. Anyway, I think you're going to like your next assignment. Really? What is it? Where is it? Sorry. You're just going to have to wait to find out. And we never will. And so, Roger's latest and unfortunately, last adventure, finally complete, the deep ship warps off into the distance. As Roger and Stellar warp off into the Nebula set, many questions remain. Will Roger and Stellar become an item? How will Beatrice Wankmeister react when she hears about this new friend in Roger's life? Will Roger's voice be a few octaves higher as a result? Would they dare to make another one of these things? Only time and money will tell. 
I've been up to my lips in urinal pucks lately. I hope it's something different. And that's the end of the Space Quest series. No, I'm not kidding. That's really how it ends. Kind of disappointing, isn't it? Who wrote this crap? Oh, yeah, Scott. Yeah, well, yeah, then uh, good, good, good work. In my opinion, the ending of Space Quest 5 would have been a better way to end the series, but then again, they didn't really plan for this to be the last game of the series. So I guess we can forgive them for that. Space Quest 6 isn't the best game in the series, but it's also not really bad. It just feels like a letdown after 4 and 5. The story itself is pretty weak. It's pretty much just an excuse to get into wacky situations, and although that was also the case for some of the earlier games, it feels like a step back at this point in the history of the series. Did you hear about the animator who killed himself? Yeah, he, he couldn't draw his own breath. The game does, however, have its uh, strengths. I already said I quite like the, the graphics. The character drawings and animations are well done, and I feel they fit the comedic style of the work. Though, obviously, your mileage may vary. Some people might prefer the old uh, VGA-style graphics to uh, this. I think they both have their charms. These, by the way, are the credits. They're called credits because, well, we can't afford to really pay anybody until more people buy the game. The game uh, is perhaps the funniest entry in the series, with some of the uh, weirdest moments and also some great lines. This game seems to have humorous descriptions for nearly everything, and with Gary Owen's delivery, these turn into comedy gold. Some of the best laugh-out-loud moments of the entire series are in this game, and all the little in-jokes and references that Sierra is so fond of are also much appreciated. All in all, this Final Frontier is a very funny but slightly disappointing way to end the series. But like I said, it was never intended to be the end. Work on Space Quest 7 began in early 1997, not long after the release of Space Quest 6. All these people worked on this dumb game? Unfortunately, the project was put on halt indefinitely in December 1997. Although Space Quest 6 had sold better than Space Quest 5, it was also much more expensive to make, and it seems that this led to the decision to uh, put Space Quest 7 on halt. Though I personally suspect that the overall decline of the adventure game genre in the second half of the 90s also contributed to this. It seems that work on Space Quest 7 was restarted in early 1999, only to get axed right away again after the infamous Chainsaw Monday. On that day, February 22nd, 1999, Sierra's new owner closed down the Oakhurst facility and moved Sierra's headquarters to Bellevue, Washington, firing around 250 people in the process, including Scott Murphy. This was not just a death sentence for Space Quest 7, but it was a sad end to the golden age of adventure games. Roger Wilco would never clean another mess again. And that is it for Space Quest and Roger, but not for me, as I will be back with more Let's Plays soon. Until then! Thank you, bye-bye. 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 That's it, bye-bye. No more, bye-bye. That's it, all finished, bye-bye. 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 Farewell. Bye-bye. Yeah, bye-bye. Bye-bye. See you later. See you later. later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, okay, this is okay, it. This is the, the last, last time. time. Goodbye. 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 Good, 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 good. Bye. Bye. Thank you for playing Space Quest VI. This is Gary Owens, signing off. Welcome everyone to the Space Quest 6 demo. Yeah, I bet you thought we were done with Space Quest, but we're not. We're gonna play the demo. Um, well, there's only a few things I know about this demo. I know that it is um, different from the actual game. It doesn't follow uh, the story of the actual game, unlike many other demos. It isn't just a small portion of the actual game. It's, it's actually different. It has its own puzzles and everything. Um, I also know that it features the Bjorn, because of the Bjorn Chow replicator easter egg in uh, the actual game. But that's all I know about the demo. I've actually never played it before. So, this is going to be a completely blind 
playthrough. So, we'll see how that goes. Never done that before. I've only, I've, I've started this briefly to see if it worked. That's it. I've never seen any more of the demo. So, let's uh, hope I'll be able to solve it. And let's hope it won't take too long. I have no idea. Space Quest 6, the final front the final frontier. Interactive demo. To order, see your local retailer. Through a series of events too humiliating to explain in a mere demo, Roger Wilco once again finds himself doing those duties for which he seems to have been born and misbred, cleaning up after the rest of the universe. As we begin our demo, we find Roger floating outside the main view screen of the Deep Ship 86, the ship to which Roger is currently assigned. While afloat, squeegeeing micro gnats and comet entrails away, Deep Ship 86 is approached by a most unusual craft. As is so often the case, Roger goes unnoticed. Oh. Odd characters materialize on the bridge and convert the crew to small desert-type spheres of some sort. After watching carefully and nearly soiling his suit, he ventures inside, and not because he's so brave. He only has so much oxygen. How will he save his sorry carcass this time? And the rest is, I think, just instructions. Okay, that I didn't know that that text was timed, so I missed a little bit of the first bit. Uh, hopefully it won't be important. I guess not, because it seems to be just backstory. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that spray is working really well in, uh, in space. Wouldn't technically the liquid immediately vaporize? In a vacuum. Oh, I hate that sound. Kilbasa's cool playing with a mouse, apparently. Mechanized mouse, even. It's the attack of MC Escher, it seems. Oh no, it's the Bjorn. Well, that's something you don't see every day. I guess I'm the only crew member who hasn't been transformed into a scoop of lemon sorbet. Maybe I should look around a little more. So instead of assimilating people, apparently the Bjorn turn you into ice cream. I don't know. And... I guess we start in the shuttle bay, which does not appear to have doors anymore. I think it's been replaced by a, a compost. Demo simulation. Is that a button? No. This does nothing. Um, there's no scrolling option. Unlike in the actual game, so I guess there won't be any scrolling locations. Which makes sense, because there weren't any scrolling locations aboard Deep Ship, and I guess that we won't be leaving it. You really need to save in this demo? I think not. Okay. Fine, then we won't. This large, well-ventilated shuttle bay is probably the largest single room on the ship. Which is why you can often find Andorian Megopeds playing hacky sack in here. I guess that means... All of the descriptions are going to be basically the same. Some guy wearing a Delco air filter on his... Yes. Okay, well that saves a lot of time, I guess. Is there a hole in the wall here? This large, well-ventilated shut, which is why you can often find and Can I look at that? This large, which is why you... This large, which is... Can I do anything with it? You can feel the rumble of the ship's engines thrumming through every solid surface. It's so nice to know all those hamsters are down in engineering, running their little hearts out. <laughs> okay. Okay, I can't actually do anything with the hole. I, I don't remember if it was there in the actual game. Um... I guess I missed that message then. Did we ever look at the actual shuttle? Uh, 
Because I think in the in my actual let's play, I accidentally looked at the hatch rather than the shuttle itself. It's a standard Starcon shuttle built for speed and maneuverability. Unfortunately, with a budget of only 550,000 buckazoids, they had to leave off certain amenities, like airtight seals, decent shields, and restrooms. I guess so. I don't suppose we can go inside it. We can go inside it. Now that is interesting. Uh huh. We won't be sitting in these seats. At least, not in the demo. Okay. Simmer down, buddy. Wait for the real game. There's only part of this cockpit you can actually access in the demo. We won't be sitting in these. Simmer down. There's only part of the. Which part of the cockpit can I actually access then? Simmer down. There's only part. A DVA suit? Sorry, you can't open this closet in the demo. You'll just have to take my word for it that there's an EVA suit in there. This compartment is empty. It ordinarily contains the subspace transmission relays and tachyon emitters. No, it contains the divalium crystal, doesn't it? It's empty right now. Okay, I guess this is going nowhere. They won't let us mess with what's inside there in the demo version. Who's they? The shuttle feels flimsy. <laughs> That's good to know. Ah! Aha! Aha! We can get into the uh, glove box. A janitor never runs out of uses for duct tape. I'll just help myself to this roll. And... Surely no one will miss these pliers, since everyone around here is busy being lemon sorbet. I guess that's true. You won't need any monolith burger wrappers or empty cups. The shipwide recycling program was disposed of. Using the glove compartment as a waste bin, I see. We got stuff. Pliers and duct tape. I'm sure that will come in helpful. Let's go back outside. Okay, let's see if we can actually go to other parts of the ship. Yep, standard compost. Looks like everything else is in there. Did they actually put the entire database in there? Looks like it. No, don't worry, I'm not gonna read it again. There's one thing I wanna check, though. The beep is missing for these buttons. The Bjorn looks like the uh, description is mostly the same. Of course, one of the few things I do know about this demo is that the Bjorn Chow has to come in somehow, and that was not a code that was in the actual game. But it does appear to be here, and I need to write it down because I don't have my notes with the replicator codes from the Original Let's Play. 769... No? 7469410. Alright! Wait. No. Don't touch that. We uh, let's see. Intership Transport. Let's check out... Well, we'll start at the top. We'll go to the bridge. Confirm! Yikes, I guess that's not a good thing. This appears to be the head Bjorn. 
He's either draining energy from the pattern buffers or absorbing all the information stored in the computer by bombarding it with nucleonic radiation. I hate it when that happens. There's a curious socket of some sort just below the toaster mounted on his head. Ooh, he has a socket on his head. Does that mean we can zap him somehow, like, with uh, the thugs on Polysorbate? The main view screen is filled with stars and distant galaxies, representing untold scores of civilizations and a vast amount of untapped knowledge that could reshape the way we think of time and space. But more importantly, you're proud to notice that your new squeegee didn't leave any streaks. Uh, I guess the huge Bjorn ship isn't worth pointing out, and I guess it's pronounced Bjorn, not Bjorn, but anyway. Um, I didn't look at the Kielbasa's litter box in the actual game, so I got to do it now. It's Commander Kielbasa's kitty litter box. This is where he makes most of his best command decisions. Not to mention all of his log entries. Really? Did you have to go there? It's Commander Kilvasa. And he's melting. Melting! Oh, what a world! What a world! Right. How hideous. The science officer has been reduced to a scoop of light, lemony sorbet. Hopefully, I can restore him back to normal, if I can get that weird belt from that Bjorn invader. Ah, we want to get the belt from the Bjorn invader. We have to take him out then. There's nothing left of the communications officer but a small scoop of lemon sorbet. What a shame. But at least he died with his palate refreshed. Uh, okay. I get on the command first. Feels plush and comfy. Maybe if you get to be a captain again someday, you'll get a nice scratching post command center like this one. Yeah, and you'll be on the cover of JQ. Sure. Sure is nicer than a chair that farts. Uh, I'll just knock him out. Maybe that's not a good idea. He might want to assimilate me. Speak of the captain. I guess I shouldn't pick up the scoop of Commander Sorbet. He'll only melt faster. I guess so. Here, we'll, we'll knock you out with some pliers. As cool as it would be to interface these two items, no good would come of it. All right. I don't think we can do anything here right now. Let's see, Roger's quarters. Is there anything useful in there? That noise is starting to annoy me. Oh, it seems like all of the stuff is still on the floor. We named the game after these. You know, Space Quest Socks. Sure. I think I missed that message in the the actual Let's Play. Um... Wait, I noticed something out of place. This is your old clap master. It can turn a plug on and off with a clap of the hands. And there are a lot of plugs in this room, mostly for Space Quests 1, 2, 3, and 4. Yes, and curiously not for Space Quest 5. I guess we'll need that, because it was not there in the real game. You yank on the Clapmaster's cord till it pops out of the wall, and you shove it all into your pocket. Don't ask us how he does that, uh... We don't know. Uh huh. Feels clean for once. Yep, 
Yikes. Replicator in Roger's quarters is not in good condition. This is the screen used to display the numbers as you enter them. Your food replicator is a nightmare of pool sticky stuff, dried on gunk, dents, dings, and roach droppings. In fact, the computer's self-survival circuitry cut in days ago and turned off service to your room. Computer's self-survival circuitry. That's impressive. Don't try to get anything out of this machine. You'll only succeed in getting your fingers stuck to the replicator. Again. I guess so. Why can't I... Oh, I can click the exit button, even though it looked disabled. Eh... Uh, anything else here? Leave it alone, it's not a toy. Besides, you'd probably cut yourself. Wait, what is that? Your old Xenon army knife from Space Quest 1, in which you destroyed the powerful star generator which had fallen into the hands of the evil kleptomaniac Serians. Plug that in. Excellent guess, Kreskin. Wrong, but excellent. Hey! Uh, I guess not. Let's check elsewhere. I, I'm always afraid I'm missing stuff when I'm playing a game. Well, I've never played before, but anyway. Go to Aid Rare. There should be a replicator that works there. Well, looks like no one's here. Which I guess makes sense, considering everybody was turned into uh, lemon sorbets. Which I guess allowed them to cut down on the amount of uh, speech they needed to include with uh, the demo, because you can't actually talk to anyone. So it's only Roger and the narrator. I guess nobody was here in the first place, considering there aren't any uh, yellow balls lying around. By the way, I guess that we are going to have to plug this into the, the Bjorn guy. That's just a guess, though. Let's see, the replicator, of course. I suppose we are going to have to use that Bjorn Chow code. A big ball of dirt with 50 billion souls Who like to sit around and veg down in the dark like moles But me, I'm just the kind of girl who loves the open air And bits of unburned hydrocarbons Blowing through my hair You soil it clear at last a tear With clearly better taste Less people too, like me and you And less reprocessed waste More hearty crunch for snacks or lunch It's crystal clear to see You soil it clear the last frontier For folks like you Okay, that actually plays automatically when you look at the replicator here. Um, let's see. Seven, four, six, nine, four, one, zero. <laughs> okay. That replicator would scare the crap out of me. Mmm, a jiggling, fragrant, lumpy mass of Bjorn Chow. Well, at There's least nothing it... else like it in the universe. Thank goodness. Quite. At least it matches the uh, description in the computer. Right. I'm assuming you don't need any other codes. At least I hope not, because I don't have any of them here, and I'd have to look them up in the computer. Doesn't look like there's anything else here. Shuttle Bay Interior? Oh, that's the only other choice. We can't go to the brig or the transporter room. Oh, and I, I guess I know why they didn't use the door bits in the... Uh, um in this game, the shuttle bay door, because you need to be able to go back there. 
if you don't go into the shuttle in the beginning to get the duct tape and stuff, which I guess you need. And if the door was there, you'd need, you know, Sydney's arm to open it and stuff, it would be horrendously complicated, so they just put it like this, which makes things a lot easier. Uh, well, since we can't go anywhere else, let's see if we can go back to the bridge. Let's see if we can do anything with the stuff we just got on that Bjorn guy. Oh, great. The noise is back. Let me talk to him. No, I sure don't want to draw his attention. I'll just let him do whatever he's doing, which appears to be sucking all the data off the ship's hard drive. Including all those politically incorrect GIF files in your conveniently mislabeled Excel directory. Hey, how did you know about that? Um... I've almost got an idea there, except for a couple of problems. For instance, I need to plug the Clapmaster into a socket to get it to work. The nearest socket is too far away. Hmm. My Clapmaster isn't quite up to snuff either. Other than that, I think I've done well. If I don't tell me these things, no one will. Giving yourself compliments. Nice, Roger, nice. I guess we need to get him closer to uh, an outlet or something. Also, why is the thing not up to scratch? Well, I've got my Clapmaster, which appears intact except for a pin that's missing from the plug. When the Clapmaster is working, it's a convenient way to turn your lights on and off by clapping your hands. Or whenever a freighter warps by. Or when I cough. Hmm. There's a pin missing. This pair of Starcon pliers cost 545 buckazoids. Wow, that's expensive. That's my roll of duct tape. How can we fix that? I guess they do ply properly. It's always a good idea to make sure your equipment works. Sure. Darn. I guess pliering the broken Clapmaster isn't helping things. Duct tape! Guess that's not going to help. Maybe it's because there's a crucial piece of hardware missing. Did anybody notice a pin somewhere lying around? Because I sure didn't. I guess there must be one somewhere. Oh, by the way, there's the sockets. I guess we need to get him closer to uh, there. Let's try that first. I think you might need to use this for that. Excellent guess, Kreskin. Wrong, but excellent. Maybe we need to put it near the sockets. Excellent guess. As cool as it would be. Excellent guess. Maybe there's a pin in the Bjorn Chow. I guess there's nothing useful in there. I guess that's no surprise. That stuff is seriously gross. Hmm. Smearing that tiny bit of Bjorn Chow on the Clapmaster didn't help. It still doesn't work. Nope. Ah! Ah. Uh. Okay, well that took care of that. I guess. As cool as it would be... As cool as it would... Excellent guess. There's something not quite right about the Clapmaster. I guess I won't be able to plug it in until I fix the problem. Okay, okay, then I guess we're gonna have to backtrack to see if we can find something to fix this thing. Well, we found it in Roger's quarters. 
Maybe we can fix it in Roger's quarters. Who knows? Certainly not I. Open closet in this room. You never learned how to work these controls. That's why you keep everything that should be in the closet scattered around the room. I guess not. Okay. Wow, there's no text. No speech for this. I think this is the only time we've ever died yet in this game. Huh. It does look as if there's something in there. Maybe that's the pin we're missing. There's a single prong from the Clapmaster's plug embedded in the outlet. Soon as we can't get it by hand, let's hope these pliers are non-conductive. <laughs> well, I guess... Not. Maybe if we wrap them with duct tape. I think I'll try imitating some of the smarter maintenance engineers I've observed through the years and wrap the duct tape around the plier's handles. Man, I'm smart. Yay! We got ourselves the missing prong. I think this is one of the pins from the Clapmaster's plug. Ain't she a beaut? Yeah. Cool. Uh, I didn't think that would work. Go figure. Gosh, I guess I've proven that I have the ability to be more than just a mediocre janitor. I could also be a mediocre electrician. I guess so. Um, okay. I actually didn't expect that to work. I figured we would need something to fix it, or I don't know, glue or something. I was actually sort of expecting that would be what the duct tape was for, but... Apparently not! Okay, let's see if we can um, take care of our Bjorn friend. And I have the feeling that, that once we do that, this demo might be over. Eating. I guess he's a slow eater, because there wasn't that much of it. Let's see. Now clap! Ooh, we got toast. Guess I won't need the toast. It has no power here. <laughs> what? Toast has no power here, I'm not entirely sure. The Bjorn in his death throes has disgorged Toast. Mucho grosso. Yes! I've successfully turned off the Bjorn by plugging him into... Well, you obviously know how I did it. Obviously, because we made you do it. And I guess we need the belt or whatever he was carrying. All right. It's his super cool lemon sorbet bioconverter belt. Makes perfect sense that he would have such a thing. Let's see. As cool as it would be, you don't need to wear it. You just need to... Oh, I just need to use it. I guess. I'll just give this lemon sorbet bioconverter button on the Bjorn belt a push and see what happens. All right. The belt begins to thrum with electronic life. What? <laughs> Fortunately, you didn't turn yourself into a uh, lemon saved sorbet. I all my fellow crew members from cleansing the pallets of the Bjorn. I wonder what incredible adventures lie in store for me and the crew of the Deep Ship 86 and Space Quest 6. Computer and simulation. Okay, I guess that's it for the demo then. Wasn't too long. Also not very difficult. 
of course, how can a game be difficult if you have only five uh, five locations to uh, investigate? Is it going to restart? I'm guessing it will. Yes! We don't really need to uh, play this again, I guess. Skip. And quit! Okay! That was the demo. Which I have now played for the first time. Just keep telling yourself, it's only a demo. It's only a demo. And that means we are really out of Space Quest stuff now. So, I'll uh, see you again soon with uh, something else. And thanks for watching once again. Because without you guys, I would just be a weirdo talking to himself in front of a computer. See you!